So, hey guys. Hope you are doing great. Welcome to Just a Shinobi. 2.0. So, this is the story about what if Naruto hates everyone. Part 2. Thanks for loving first one. I am sure you will love this what if. And if you did. Please hit the subscribe button for more awesome videos like this. Check out my other videos, share with your friends and enjoy them. Check out the description. Comment down your opinion. So, without wasting any time. Let's see today's what if. Hikajusama. Hikajusama. Though an old man well into his 70s the third Hokage was still a ninja and came fully awake at the first shout. He was on his feet and ready for an attack as the door to his bedroom burst open and a pair of Anbu knelt before him. What is going on here? What has happened? He knew that for his sleep to be disturbed like this there had to be some sort of emergency. Lord Hokage. The village is under attack. I see, so Rachimaru has finally made his move. I had suspected something might occur during the exams, but it seems he chose to wait until now. Lord Hokage Urachimaru is not the one attacking the village, one of the Anbu replied. Then who? By Lord Hokage, the village is being attacked by Yuzumaki Naruto. Here is in Saratobi stood there too shocked to reply. In the distance he heard the echo of an explosion. But so. Beautiful. One of his clones was sitting atop the third Hokage's section of the monument. From here he had a perfect view of the explosions and fires that were going off all over the village. He had especially enjoyed watching a big explosion that had leveled the ninja academy. Many of his other clones had hit restaurants and stores that had denied him service. It was a petty sort of revenge, but he would take what he could get. He wouldn't go after the well-protected targets. Anbu headquarters, the Hokage mansion, or the tower. But it was okay, what he was hitting would be enough to fill the village with panic and make his point. But the smile on his lips he detonated himself. The massive stone face of the third Hokage fell, bringing down a landslide and crushing dozens of buildings and their helpless inhabitants. Wow. What do you need to ask me? Hinata asked. She was dressed in a long flannel nightgown that covered her completely, but having him in her bedroom like this made her very nervous. He was looking at her with his usual cheerful face. Will you leave the village with me? Leave the village? Naruto, what are you talking about? It's exactly what I just said Hinata-chan, I'm leaving the village tonight and I want to know if you'll come with me. Naruto, is this one of your pranks? If it is, it's not funny, especially not after what happened to you today. I was really worried about you. I was afraid something was going to happen to you. Something is happening to me, Hinata-chan, I'm leaving the village and going rogue. Naruto I, MMMM, she cut off as he placed a single finger on her lips. SHHHHH, come to the window and listen. He took her hand and brought her over. He then stood behind her and wrapped his arms about her chest. Listen close and tell me what you hear. She couldn't believe he was in her room late at night with his arms wrapped around her. It was hard for her to concentrate on anything else but that. But after a moment she made herself listen. She could make out a dull series of booms. Are those explosions? That's right Hinatachan, he whispered in her ear playfully. I'm using my explosive clones to blow up places all around the village. What? She pulled out of his embrace and faced him, horror on her face. Are you serious? Her reaction killed the smile on his face. Trust me Hinatachan. I've never been more serious in my entire life, but why? Why would you do that? Why? You seriously have to ask. Naruto please lower your voice. She whispered urgently. If anyone hears you'll be in big trouble. He laughed. Hinata didn't you hear what I just said? I am blowing up parts of the village even as we stand here. I am killing people. Do you think being caught in your bedroom worries me? If anyone comes in here I'll just kill them. Naruto. She gasped. Oh come on Hinata don't be so shocked, you know how I've been treated by the people of this place, and you know I'm a monster. Is it surprising I would finally strike back? Naruto you're not a monster. Of course I am. I'm Kaiubi. Ask anyone. Ask your father, I'm sure he'll tell you so. You're not a monster Naruto. After what happened in the exams the law about hiding what happened to you was lifted. Some of the elders told me about what happened, how the Yandame sealed the Kaiubi into you. What happened to you wasn't your fault and you are not the Kaiubi even if he is a part of you. Is that how your father feels? Flinching, she looked away. No. He sees me as a monster. No, but. But he feels you need to be monitored from now on for the safety of the village. He said your demonic chakra would be sealed up from now on and you would not be allowed to leave the village again. Anada was not aware that the Hokage had refused this second condition. So they're going to strip me of my power and make me a prisoner. Why am I not surprised? Maybe they'll build me a cage and charge people admission to see me. He shook his head in disgust. I'll never let that happen, I'd rather die. I won't let them use me. It's obvious the only way they'll ever accept me is as a monster. That's fine though. I'll gain power and come back someday. I know I'll be a monster in their eyes, but I'll make them all acknowledge me the strongest. I'll become Hokage even if every last person in this place hates me. 
He looked straight into her eyes. Even you. Naruto I could never hate you. Of course you will. He said bitterly. You can make all the stupid promises you want, but the bottom line is that while I'm away everyone will tell you I'm a monster, and sooner or later you will believe them. You'll just end up hating me like everyone else. He turned his back to her and stepped up onto the windowsill. Goodbye Hinata. Wait. Don't go. Please. She grabbed onto his sleeve with both hands desperate to hold onto him. I'm going to Hinata. I'm leaving. But I'll come back one day, I'll come back to rule this place. He looked at her. She was trembling. Tears were running down her cheeks. He held out his hand to her. Come with me. But. But. So you don't really love me, he said sadly. He lowered his hand. I do. Naruto and I have been in love with you for years. You are the most important person in the whole world to me. Then prove it, come with me Hinatachan. Come with me and I promise I'll never ever let you go. You'll always be at my side, as my girl, and someday as my wife. Why? Wife. Of course, he said with a small grin. Who else would I want but the girl who supported me through everything? The girl who proved her love for me when it really mattered. If you come with me now we will never ever be apart again, you'll be mine now and forever. But only if you come with me and do whatever I need you to. Otherwise I won't want you. You're either with me or against me, there is nothing in between. You have to choose Hinata, me or everything else. He held out his hand to her once more. Which is it? She looked at his hand. Will. Will you really marry me someday? Yes, it's a promise. I'll make you my wife, and when I come back here someday you'll be the Hokage's wife. I want to be with you Narutakin, more than anything. I. I'll come with you. Reaching out she placed her hand into his. You belong to me now, he said. Taking her hand he pulled her up easily into his arms. He leapt away from the High Uga mansion with her neatly in his arms. Wait. I'm not dressed. I don't have my gear or even my sandals. Don't worry about any of that Hinatachan, he told her as he raced toward the outer wall. His escape worked pretty much as he'd expected it to. All the available ninja on duty were called in to deal with the emergency in the village itself. Naruto was able to swiftly run up the side of the wall and leap over. As he did so he took a final look back. In the distance he could see more than a dozen fires burning. They would finally understand that he wasn't their plaything anymore, he didn't belong to them. He knew this would be his last look at Konoha for many years, but he would return one day. I'll come back someday and make every last one of you kneel to me. I swear it. And that includes you, too old man. Narutakin, where are we going? Rain country, at least for now, he said. They don't have an extradition treaty with fire, and they've been recruiting Nuke Nin for a while now. They'll accept anyone who is willing to serve as a Rain Nin. Racing through the forests north of Konoha he skidded to a sudden halt and placed Hinata on her feet. Get behind me Hinata. He stood protectively in front of her. What's wrong with Naruto? Coo, 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 laughter rang through the forest. I did say we would meet again, didn't I Narutakin? From out of the ground a very pale man emerged. As they watched four ninja leapt down to either side of him. Arachimaru, Naruto growled. So you want more of what I gave you in the forest of death? Watch your mouth punk. One of the other four ninja yelled at him. Oh it's quite alright you can. Narutakin is very special to me. After all, I've already given him a special gift. What the hell do you want? Naruto demanded. To help you, Arachimaru giggled. You have abandoned your village and done so in rather spectacular style. You are a missing nin who will be hunted down with all the resources available to the leaf village. Given who and what you are, Naritakan, they will never ever stop chasing you. They can come after me as much as they want. I'll kill every last one of them. And what about the girl? He asked pleasantly. You are Hayuga Hinata I believe. Hinata shivered as his reptilian eyes fell to her. Never mind who she is. Naruto snapped. She's with me, that's all you need to know. Do you think they'll let her go either? They will certainly want to recover her or fail to eliminate her. Anything would be better than allowing a rogue Hayuga to run wild at your side. Can you keep her safe? I'll kill anyone who threatens her, he said flatly. Even if he happens to be a Sanin. Oh I'm not the Sanin you need to worry about. If I were you I'd be much more worried about Jiraiya. He will certainly be coming after you. I on the other hand could offer you my most generous assistance and protection. And why would you do that? Because you and I want the same thing, revenge on Kanoha and on the third Hokage. With my resources and your power anything would be possible. Join me Naritakan, and I will give you all the things you hunger for, wealth, power, and recognition. In the Sound Village you will receive the sort of treatment a man of your unique talents deserves. I don't trust you, Naruto stated. Koo, koo, koo of course not, I'm not very trustworthy. But I am a man who can deliver what he promises. Come with me and I will provide you a safe haven where you can learn and grow stronger without worrying about hunter nins. I can also help you gain greater access to the power inside you. Now doesn't that sound better than constantly being on the run? Naruto slowly thought it over. If you try anything with me or Hinata I will kill you. 
and so we're clear I won't serve you the way I did the Hokage. So don't ever think you can give me orders like a regular ninja. I am sure we will be able to come to some sort of mutually acceptable arrangement. Arachimaru promised with a greasy smile. They came to an uneasy agreement, with both of them thinking they would get the better of the other. Over a hundred businesses and private residences have been attacked along with the Ninja Academy and the Hokage Monument. A masked Amber reported. Our preliminary estimates are at least 2,000 civilian casualties, along with eight ninja confirmed killed, another Anbu stated. All this might have been avoided had the boy been entrusted to me, Danzo stated. He should have been given proper discipline from the beginning, not allowed to run wild like a delinquent. Lord Hokage, I really must insist that my daughter be recovered at all costs, Hiashi demanded. Her kidnapping is an unforgivable offense against my clan. Your clan? Inuzuka Tsun growled. Get your priorities in order. The whole village has been attacked. Anyway, I wouldn't worry too much about Hinata. Knowing you she probably left of her own free will. I resent that. Hiashi shouted. You think I give a damn? Tsum shouted back. Petty arguments aren't helping. Inoichi cut in sharply. None of this would have happened had the Hokage simply taken a firmer hand with Naruto. Hiashi said angrily. The Hokage did what he thought was best, Jiraiya shot back. However it may have turned out his intentions were always good. And we all know where good intentions lead don't we? Hiashi shot back. The door to the Hokage's office opened and two new arrivals stepped into the already crowded room. Glad to see you Kakashi, Jiraiya said. As for Naruto's senses, your input could be really valuable. Sasuke, you shouldn't be here. Please go home. No, the boy replied stiffly. I heard all clan heads were being summoned here for an important meeting. As the clan head of the Ichiha my place is here. You pick an odd time to begin fulfilling your responsibilities, Hamura noted coolly. Let the boy stay by all means, Danzo said. This may prove a valuable experience for him and give him some useful insights into the world of ninja. Sasuke do you know anything, anything at all, about where he may be headed or what he may be planning? Jiraiya asked. I only know that whatever he did he must have had a good reason for it. Naruto would never do something like this without a reason. Most of the people in the room stared at him as though he had just sprouted a second head. Hearing something like that makes me honestly wonder if insanity runs in your family, Danzo said menacingly. Shut up. No one wants to hear that. Jiraiya snapped. Look kid, I admire your loyalty to a teammate, but there are limits. Yes there are. Sasuke said angrily. There are limits. Limits to how much abuse you can pile onto someone before they finally snap. I saw how people have always treated him, and today I saw the entire village turn on him. Why? What exactly was it that he did that was so terrible? He glared openly at Hiashi. Was it killing Niji after he had tried to kill Hinata? Was it killing Gara, who murdered three Rain Nin during the exams, crippled Lee, and tried to murder Naruto? Or was it all because he showed you some real power today, and you're all suddenly terrified of what the boy you've been abusing all this time might do? That's enough Sasuke. Hiashi railed. Don't presume to lecture us. What do you know about Kaiubi? What could anyone your age possibly know about that monster? I don't know much about the Kaiubi, Sasuke admitted. But I know Naruto, and I know he is not Kaiubi. I am afraid it no longer matters, a tired voice spoke. The argument halted as all eyes turned to the Hokage. He was seated behind his desk, shoulders slumped and his head lowered. He looked like a very tired old man. Naruto's reasons no longer matter. Whether he felt himself to be somehow justified no longer matters. With his actions tonight Naruto has betrayed his village and killed the very people he was sworn to protect. That is the only truth that matters now. The old Hokage looked over at Sasuke. I have no choice, he said sadly. Uzumaki Naruto is hereby stripped of his status as a leaf ninja. He is declared an outlaw and enemy of the state. He is to be killed on sight. No effort is to be made towards his capture. I hereby authorize a bounty of 100 million payable to any person who successfully kills him or provides information that leads to his death. I also order that every possible effort be made to rescue Hayuga Hinata whom he has kidnapped. Should a rescue not prove feasible, I authorize her elimination to prevent the loss of vital information that might harm this village. Every ninja in the room saved Sasuke and Kakashi nodded. Even Hiashi had no objection. Hinata's death was far preferable to her bringing any sort of disgrace to the clan. I authorize and approve the use of any and all resources necessary to fulfill this order. Jiraiya, I am taking you with this. You may use Hunter Nins, Anbu, or any other ninja you may require. You may bankrupt a treasury if need be, until Naruto is dead, this will be our one and only priority. Yeah, I got it, Jiraiya answered solemnly. How can you turn on him like this Lord Hokage? Sasuke asked. You're not even going to try and capture him. I thought you cared about him. I thought he meant something to you. My personal feelings are not important Sasuke, the old man said wearily. My duty as Hokage is to do what is best for Konoha. Naruto's potential makes him an even greater threat than Orochimaru or Itachi. 
for the village's sake I cannot allow him to grow any older. In case you haven't noticed yet, kid, try looking out the window. I'd say Naruto made his choice. The old man is just doing what he has to. Don't make it harder for him than it already is. Jiraiya said firmly. In that case I want to help go after him, Sasuke volunteered. Forget it. I'm not risking the last Ichiha like that. Besides, with the pick of the elite ninja of the village, I don't need any genin. Jiraiya's eyes shifted over to the man standing next to Sasuke. I would like your help though Kakashi. Sorry, but I'll have to say no. This is in Srank mission Kakashi, Hiyashi pointed out. You have no right to refuse. Then I guess I'll have to be arrested then, he said pleasantly. But no matter what Naruto's done I can't help kill my sensei's only son. Minato's ghost would haunt me forever. What? Are you saying? Naruto? He's Yandames. You're lying. It's impossible. It's. Shouting erupted from every corner of the room. Tsuritobi turned away, no longer caring. He had done his duty as Hokage. He could trust Jiraiya to handle the rest. Kakashi was refusing in Srank mission and had just spoken in Srank secret before more than 20 witnesses. At any other time he would have come down on him like a ton of bricks. Now though. It just didn't seem to matter. Clutched in his hands where no one could see was Naruto's Hideite. The boy had deliberately left it behind. Looking out his window he stared at the Hokage monument and at the three faces that stared back. I misjudged, he thought sadly. I made the same mistake a second time. I wouldn't let myself see what was there. I really am just an old fool. Less than 20 minutes later a truly impressive group of about 200 ninja had gathered by the gate. Every single one of them was of at least Chunin rank. The last time Kanoha had sent out such a powerful force for a single mission had been on the night the Kaiubi attacked the village. The entire hunter and force along with most of the Anbu were here, and every one of them was listening as the legendary Jiraiya spoke. By order of the Hokage I am leading all of you out after the missing nin responsible for tonight's tragedy. Our mission is simple. We find him and kill him. Oh, and we'll be rescuing the Hyuga heiress while we're at it too. There were eager nods all around. These men and women were ready to put an end once and for all to the threat that had been hanging over them for years. Break into units of four and try to have at least one hunter nin or one in Yazuka with each group. If you spot the target don't do something stupid like attack him yourselves. Every last one of you felt his chakra today. You understand how dangerous he is no matter what he looks like. Everyone slowly nodded. Even those who had not been in the stands had felt Naruto go five tails. His chakra had been like a bone fire lighting up the night, they'd had felt it even miles away. Ayuga Hiyashi, Inuzuka Tsum, Akamichi Chaoza, and Nara Shikaku, Jiraiya eyed the four of them. They were each the leaders of their clans and very skilled in what they could do. He had deliberately asked each of them for help, and they had each volunteered. You'll be with me. Once Naruto has been spotted we'll be the ones to deal with him. I'll hold back the others. I'd like to keep this from being a bloodbath. Surely you are giving him too much credit, Hiyashi said. He is still only a genin. A genin with more chakra than all five of us put together, Chaoza said in a serious tone. And one who knows forbidden techniques. Man this is going to be really troublesome, Shikaku muttered. But if it's got to be done there's no point worrying about it. This won't be easy, Jiraiya said. But together we will take him down. That is not the swarm of ninja dashed out the gate and into the night. Soon was down on all fours with her nose pressed to the ground. Jiraiya and the others were standing nearby, along with a squad of Henter Nin. Nodding to herself she got up. There's no doubt about it, she announced grimly. The scent belongs to Orochimaru and four others. They met Naruto and Hinata and then departed together heading north. Damn it, Jiraiya muttered. Though after what happened during the exams I suppose I should have expected something like this. He was never one to ever let go of anything he wanted. Chikaku let out a deep sigh. This is going to be even more troublesome isn't it? Tauza grunted and nodded his head. This changes nothing, Hiyashi said imperiously. Even if a Sanin is involved we have one as well, to say nothing of a small army. Naruto will be eliminated and my daughter rescued. Well it's not like we can turn back, Jiraiya agreed. But this is going to be a hell of a lot more difficult now. Regardless of the difficulty there can be no doubt we will succeed. Hiyashi insisted. Jiraiya didn't disagree with him, though he thought Hiyashi was seriously underestimating how much harder things would be. Still. Even Orochimaru could only do so much, and they had 200 of Kanoha's finest with them. How could they face an entire ninja army? Naruto picked up a lot of sense coming down from the wind. Even so he was caught off guard when their group halted. All at once masked ninja swarmed out of the nearby woods surrounding them. Still holding Hinata in his arms he felt her squeeze him as she looked around nervously. He grinned at her reassuringly. There's nothing to be worried about Hinatachan. I hope so. Hundreds of ninjas fell to one knee. Lord Orochimaru. What are your orders? Ku, 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 I expect we'll have visitors here tomorrow. We'll have to make them welcome. In the meantime, see to the needs of my guests. What are all these foreign ninjas doing in the middle of fire country? Naruto asked. 
They are the army of sound and they belong to me, Hirachimaru said proudly. I had brought more than a thousand of them to launch a surprise attack in Kanoha. What? Hinata cried in horror. You were going to attack the village. Hirachimaru looked at her curiously. Does that bother you? Hinata looked back into his snake-like eyes feeling dread. Naruto put her down and stepped protectively in front of her. We don't give a damn about the village. I'm sorry you didn't. What happened? You get cold feet at the last second. Hardly, Hirachimaru replied with a grin. I decided to call off the attack for your sake, Narutokan. I didn't want to risk your death before I could recruit you to join me. I also decided the risk was too great after seeing you butcher Gara. Naruto looked at him suspiciously. He was certain there was more to it than just that. Gee thanks. Hirachimaru chuckled lightly. He was not used to such blatant sarcasm from his servants. Bringing him over to his way of thinking would certainly be an interesting challenge. In the meantime he would need to handle him with care. I am sure the two of you are quite hungry and tired. We will have to leave again in a matter of hours, so I suggest you eat and get as much rest as you can. He walked away followed closely by his bodyguards. One of the nameless hordes of sound ninja approached him. We'll have food and a couple tents prepared. We only need one tent and one sleeping bag, Naruto told him. Eek. He turned around and saw Hinata blushing and pressing her fingers together furiously. Something wrong Hinata-chan. Nah. Narutakin, you. You're no. Not say. Saying we should. Sleep together, are you? Frowning at her he nodded. Well sure. Didn't I say we'd be together from now on? Her blush got even redder. Goo. But we're. We're only twelve. He bothered her hands before she sprained her fingers. I'm not saying we're going to do that yet. I just want to be able to fall asleep next to you and be close to you, that's all. He really does want to share a sleeping bag with me. The thought excited and terrified her. Goo. But we can't. What will people say? What people? Naruto asked. Hirachimaru. His bodyguards. Them. He waved an arm at the massive ninja still surrounding them. Or are you afraid your dad will find out somehow? She dropped her head. Bingo, he thought. Fuck your dad. Her head snapped up with a gasp. Naruto. Fuck your dad. He repeated. You don't belong to Kanoha or to your clan anymore, Hinatachan, you belong to me. And as if to prove his point he grabbed her about the waist and pulled her close. Before she could make a sound or think of anything she was being kissed. In front of hundreds of strangers right out in the open he was kissing her. Her mind blanked out as she realized what was happening. His kiss was a little rough, but it was passionate. It was nothing like the gentle little peck she had fantasized about. And none of her fantasies had ever involved them being so, so shameless as to do this right out in front of a crowd. Even if this wasn't the way she'd imagined her heart was racing and her knees were about ready to give. She was only just able to keep from fainting. When he ended the kiss he spoke to her in a heated whisper. You're my girl now Hinatachan and I don't care who knows it or what they think. It felt like he was taking possession of her. She liked the feeling. She wanted to be only his. Oh okay Narutakan. It was late morning the next day when Tsum delivered more bad news. An army. Jiraiya muttered. I guess we were right to be worried about an invasion after all. He looked at the Inuzuka clan head. How big? Since it looks like you swallowed a kunai I'm guessing it's not small. It's big, she said in an undertone. There were other Inuzuka among the hunter nins, so there would be no keeping this quiet. There's no way to tell exactly, but I would guess at least three, maybe four or five times as big as us. That's impossible. Hiashi snapped. There's no way such a force could have gotten this deep into fire country without our knowing. Tsum sent him a pained expression. Impossible or not they did. So what do we do about it? Shikaku asked in an easygoing tone. What do you mean? Hiashi demanded. This changes nothing. We press on obviously. An army that size won't be able to move faster than a smaller elite force. We will certainly catch them up before they can cross the border. Then what? Shikaku asked. We have an elite force, sure, but if we attack one that's expecting it and bigger. It'll be a lot more than just troublesome. It'll be a bloodbath, Tsum said with a snarl. It was hard to tell if she thought that was a good or bad thing. We could summon reinforcements from Kanoha, Chauza suggested. By the time they reach us, Naruto and my daughter will be long gone, Hiashi argued. With Orochimaru hiding them we may never find them again. We must catch them now. No matter what it costs. Shikaku asked quietly. Hiashi nodded. The Hokage's orders were clear, Jiraiya said. Naruto's got to die, no matter what. And I know how good that snake is at hiding. He looked carefully at the four of them. We'll split off from the rest of the force and let them attack the army. While they're doing that we'll go on a fox hunt. There was no element of surprise for either side as the battle began. The pursuers and the pursued both knew they would have to fight and there was no hope of ambush. So the Kanoha ninja attacked a sound force that was five times their size but nowhere near their equal in ability of training. 
As the second battle of the Valley of the End began five ninjas skirted the edge of the fighting and raced for the waterfall that marked the valley's beginning. Buchan wiped his dirty hands. All the members of the Sound Four did the same. Taya was loudly cursing as she washed hers in the fast-flowing river. They have all been placed in Arachimarasama, he stated. Marvelous, he murmured. You may withdraw now and take little Hinata as well. She stays with me, Naruto growled. Do you really want to put her in that sort of danger? Arachimaru asked, amused. Jiraiya will certainly come here, he may decide to kill her right off the bat. Allow her to go. She will be quite safe I assure you. He looked at her. He looked off to the valley a few miles away where dust and smoke were rising from the pitched battle. Looking unhappy he ultimately nodded. If anything happens to her. We'll take good care of her, you can promised with a laugh. Naruto and I don't want to go. Hinata pleaded. It's all right hinata he told her tenderly. I'll definitely be fine and come see you as soon as I can. There were a few more words of argument, but there was never a real doubt that she would do whatever he said. Arachimaru watched as they embraced before parting. Isn't love a marvelous thing? He asked as soon as they were gone. Naruto looked at him dangerously. Don't ever hurt her or I swear you regret it. I wouldn't dream of hurting dear little hinata he promised. She will be ever so much more useful to me as a tool for controlling you. Now then let me show you something very special. With a kunai he sliced open his palm and performed a summoning. Out of the ground a wooden casket arose. On its sides was written, the honored Yandame Hokage. No way, Naruto gasped. As he watched the coffin's lid slid open and a figure stepped out of it. He was dressed in a trench coat and a jonin vest. The face was one he had never seen in person but was still recognized at once. He'd seen plenty of pictures and the profile had been cut in stone above him for as long as he could remember. The man simply stood there looking out at the two huge statues and the valley below. The valley of the end, he murmured. Why am I here? Hello again Minatakin, Arachimaru greeted cheerfully. It's been a long time. The Yandane turned to stare at Arachimaru. You. You brought me here. Why? He demanded. To have you fight for me of course, he answered. Why else? The Yandane shook his head. Only you would try to perform this. You must know I would never serve you, alive or dead. You don't have a choice I fear. So long as you are here you belong to me. You really are the Yandane, Naruto said softly. Despite his own personal grudges he couldn't keep a little awe from his voice. For a long time Yandame had been his hero and his role model. Minato looked at him, noticing him for the first time. His eyes widened. Naruto. Huh? How would you know me? Then comprehension struck. Oh, yeah, we have met haven't we? Yeah, I'm Naruto, the poor unlucky bastard whose life you ruined. Ruined? He sounded pained. Don't the people of Kanoha treat you as a hero? Naruto laughed. A hero are you serious? They treat me like I'm a demon, like I'm the scum of the earth. I'm 12 and until I was able to access the Kyubi's power, I spent my life alone and abused. Alone? Abused. But what about Jiraiya? Your godfather? Hasn't he been taking care of you? Jiraiya, my godfather? Naruto stared at him as though he were crazy. What are you talking about? I only met the guy a few weeks ago and that was just so he could check on my seal. Now he's on his way to try and kill me. Kill you? Minato whispered in horror. That's not possible. He would never kill you. Oh, but he would, Arachimaru assured and approached him. You see, after a lifetime of abuse at the village's hands, Naruto has abandoned Konoha and decided to join me. To prevent losing the Kaiubi's power dear old Sarita Bisensei has sent Jiraiya out with a small army to exterminate him. Minato looked stunned and sick. It can't be. It is, Arachimaru said. When Jiraiya arrives you can ask him yourself. He slid a kunai with a special seal into the back of Yandame's head. There, now the seal is complete. What a shame I can only use it once. Oh well I still have the first and the second saved for another day. Minato stared at Naruto. I'm sorry. This was not what I wanted for you. Naruto grinned back at him coldly. Well what the hell did you expect to happen to me when you put the fox in my belly? I wanted them to acknowledge you as a hero. I wanted my sensei, Jiraiya, to care for you. My son. Son? Naruto blinked. I am your father, Minato said and held out his arms. My father? Minato nodded with his arms still held out to him. Your mother's name was Yuzumaki Kashina, she was my beloved wife. She died shortly after you were born. For the good of the village I was forced to use you to complete the Reaper Death Seal and save Konoha. But it was always my hope that you would have a good and happy life. Naruto could only stare as the word sank in. He was the son of the Yandame Hokage, one of the most beloved heroes in Konoha's history. All the time he'd been treated like dirt. He'd actually been a hero's son, a Hokage's son. But that wasn't what hurt him most. For the good of the village, those were the very same words Shizuku's mother had used to justify sacrificing her. You. You put the Kaiubi into your own son. He looked at the man as though he were the lowest form of life possible. What kind of father would do that? 
All my life I just figured I was unlucky, that I had a hard life, that I was alone all the time, that I couldn't make friends. I just always figured it was bad luck. Then when I found out the real reason for my suffering I just figured it was luck again. I mean you needed a baby and I was born that night, so it was just my bad timing. But now I find out that I was your own son and you sacrificed me on purpose. You chose to do this to me. A father supposed to protect his children. You should have protected me. Instead you condemned me. What the hell sort of father are you? I had no choice. It was to save the village. Were there any other children you could have used? Naruto demanded. Were there any other babies? There were, Minato admitted and lowered his arms. But as Hokage I felt it was my duty to sacrifice myself, and as my heir I felt it was yours to be the Kyubi's container. I had faith you would do great things one day. That's great, Naruto said bitterly. Do you expect me to thank you you knew I'd be an orphan, that no one would take care of me? Why didn't you let some other lucky baby, one with parents maybe, make the noble sacrifice? You could have done that. Then I'd still have been alone, but at least I would have gotten to have some kind of life. You chose to make me suffer, you bastard. Son. I'm not your son. He screamed. Go back to whatever hell you were roasting in. Orochimaru saw movement approaching. Touching as this family reunion is, we will have to cut it short I'm afraid. Despite desperately wanting to say more Minato was compelled to look away and look at the approaching ninja. The squad led by Jiraiya halted before them. They of course all noticed the appearance of the Yandame, but having not witnessed the summoning, assumed it to be some sort of cheap illusion. Is this what you're reduced to? Jiraiya demanded. Do you really think I'll take it easy on you just because you blew up the image of my student? Dear Yasensei, Minato said. Is it true you abandoned my son? Is it true you're here to kill him? Despite believing it to be a Jiraiya still found the words discomforting. It's a good illusion I'll give you that much. I had more important work to do than raise a kid, and yes I'm here to kill him. I'm sorry about having to do that, but after what he pulled there really is no choice now. How could you break my trust? Minato asked heartbroken. You were his godfather. Asping, he sent a startled look at Orochimaru. How did you know that? Only Minato, Kishina, and the old man and I knew. I didn't, Orochimaru said smugly. He glanced at Minato. Show them your power, yellow flash of Konoha. At his feet Jiraiya noted a half-buried kunai. There was a formula carved into it and it had three blades. Crap. Run. Jiraiya had just enough time to perform a shun shin and disappear. The others were still convinced this was only an illusion and hesitated before fleeing. Duration no jutsu. There was a momentary flash of yellow light. In the very next instant Minato was standing amid the four Konoha clan heads. Each of them had their throats cut and blood sprayed. It took a moment for them to realize that they'd just been killed. Laughing, Orochimaru saw them each stumble and then topple over. I doubt Jiraiya will have the courage to come back knowing what he would be up against, Orochimaru said. He nodded to the distant battle on the other end of the valley. Why don't you go and enjoy Naritakan? Show all of them the power they threw away. Yeah. He said savagely and let the Kyubi's power fill him to overflowing. As five tails formed he looked at the Yandame. I will do great things. I'll be one day. But I won't do it your way. I'll make them fear me, that's how the Kyubi will rule over them. He gave Minato no chance to reply even if Orochimaru would have permitted it. He launched himself over the waterfall and sped towards the battle. Powerless to do anything else Minato could only shed a tear. When Orochimaru finally tracked him down, Naruto was bent over and shaking. The Sandin could see he was pale and coated in sweat. Ku, ku, ku you shouldn't push yourself so far Narutokan, even if you have limits. Despite his exhaustion Naruto still found the strength to glare. I'm fine, he growled. Orochimaru grinned back. Of course you are. He was actually quite pleased to see that even the fearsome young was not inexhaustible. He would need to keep reminding the boy of that. I'm afraid your father has returned to the Shinigami's belly. I hope there wasn't anything else you wanted to say to him. He's not my father, Naruto said. Did any of them get away? The smile that lit up the blonde's face was savage. Not one, they tried but I wouldn't let them. I killed every last one of them. Except for Jiraiya, Orochimaru pointed out mildly. Naruto glared at him again, but nodded. That's quite all right Naritakan, no one expects you to be perfect. Looking unhappy, Naruto straightened up. Let's go back and attack the village. Screw running away, with my power. You would die, Orochimaru said pleasantly. Kanoha lost a lot of ninja today, but the village has roughly 3,000 of them. Even with your great power you would have no hope of defeating all of them. Remember, even now you have only a fraction of the Kaiubi's true strength. With my help you will eventually be able to summon and control all of it. On that day Kanoha will kneel and proclaim you Hokage. Orochimaru shrugged carelessly. Or we will darken the sky with their ashes. Naruto looked south longingly. Finally he looked back to Orochimaru. Fine, he muttered unhappily. Orochimaru was well pleased. He doubted Kanoha would dare try sending another army to attack him. 
assassins certainly, but they would never dare try and actually invade Sound now. With Naruto at his side, he would be able to openly proclaim himself Otakage in Sound, the sixth great ninja village. Kanoha wouldn't recognize him, Suna probably wouldn't either, but he was sure the other villages would. With Kaiubi's potential and his own genius, nothing would be out of reach. He smiled at the proud boy. You may distrust me now, but I will make you love me. I will stain you with my colors. One week later, the Hokage was having a private meeting with a newly appointed fifth Kazakiage. Almost as soon as she'd been selected she'd come here to loudly proclaim that Suna wanted to assist in killing both Orochimaru and Naruto. They had also been quite persistent in declaring their continued commitment to the alliance between them. Saratobi thought them a little too persistent in fact. How did Orochimaru manage to meet the previous Kazakiage all alone? Saratobi asked quietly. That would seem a rather shocking failure in security. Gio gave him an empty mouth grin. She was one of the very few ninjas still alive who could claim to be Saratobi Sr. Despite her appearance she was still quite formidable, and her mind was still as sharp as it had ever been. I agree, quite a shocking failure. But then it must have been that, what other explanation is there? That he knowingly conspired with Orochimaru and was betrayed by him. I certainly cannot think of any other possibility. The aged Kazakiage nodded politely. They both knew what the likely truth was, but for their own reasons, neither could admit to it. The entire point of the exchange had been to say it without saying it, both of them could look underneath. What they had actually said was this. I don't trust you, Saratobi had said. I know you don't, Chiyo had said. But I'll still work with you. Chiyo's nod had been her acceptance of that. So long as Orochimaru and Naruto were out there conspiring they needed each other. There was little more to be said or not said after that, and the Kazakiage soon took her leave. Before his next visitor arrived Saratobi sat there calmly smoking his pipe contemplating what might have been. It was clear now that the person who had pretended to be the Kazakiage could have been none other than Orochimaru. And given the size of the army Jurea's force had encountered, it seemed clear what his intentions had been. Orochimaru had planned to personally assassinate him and then attack the village. Why he had not done so after putting himself in that position was a mystery. He could only assume that Naruto's display of power had somehow dissuaded him. What terrible irony, Saratobi thought. He unknowingly saved us from one attack only to attack us himself. Naruto should never have become the village's enemy. It should never have come to that. For the hundredth time Saratobi wondered where he had gone wrong, what he might have done to prevent it. The second battle of the Valley of the End had been a disaster. The worst to hit the village since the Kaiubi's attack. Two hundred of Kanoha's best ninja, including four clan heads, much of the Anbu, and almost all the hunter ninjas were gone. The village was still a power, but it was no longer what it had been. Their edge had been dulled, and it would take years to sharpen it again. He would have to take some extreme steps to hurry the process along. In the ninja world any perceived weakness was dangerous. Five people stood before him. He delayed meeting them to allow time for grieving and healing, but the needs of the village were pressing. I wanted to extend to you my deepest condolences on your losses, Saratobi said sincerely. I also want you to know I have faith that each of you will do your best for your clans and for the village. That's nice of you, Nara Shikamaru mumbled. His hands were stuffed in his pockets and he looked disinterested, but his eyes were staring back angrily. Shikamaru has grown into an adult, an angry one, Saratobi noted sadly. Technically all ninja were adults as soon as they received their Hideites. In practice they matured and grew up at their own paces. It seemed Shikamaru had been forced to mature all at once. Tauji still seemed a bit stunned even a week after losing his father and was standing very close to Shikamaru. Thank you for your support Akajasama, Inuzuka Hana said. Unlike the other new clan head she was 18 and an adult in name as well as title. She was a gifted medic who specialized in veterinary medicine. Saratobi had no doubts that she would do well in her new role. Thank you Hikajusama, Hayugahanabi said formally. If she had any doubts or worries she kept them well hidden behind a calm Hayuga demeanor. Behind her stood Hayuga Enya, an elder of the main branch. As you know Hikajusama, though Hanabi has been designated heir, she is still far too young to actually lead. I and the elders will be in charge until she comes of age. And you will also be in charge of her education as well, Saratobi thought with regret. The elders of the Hayuga clan were even more hidebound and in love with tradition than Hiashi had been. Saratobi had held a secret hope that when Hinata became clan head a change in their traditions might be possible. There now seemed no chance of that. By the time Hanabi was installed as clan head, she would hold the exact same views as the elders. It was a shame, but there was nothing he could do about it. Thank you all of you, Saratobi said. I trust that you will all do your part to keep Kanoha strong. He nodded a polite dismissal. As the others turned to go, Shikamaru remained where he was. If it's not too troublesome I have a question. Yes. Saratobi asked carefully. What do you plan to do about Naruto? About what I would have expected, Saratobi thought. We will handle that as best we can. Which means you don't have any idea of what to do, Shikamaru interpreted. 
that's not good enough. He didn't raise his voice or shake his fist. As defiant as the words were, his tone and body language remained as passive as could be. You cannot speak to the Hokage like that, Hayuga Anya said sharply. Even if you are a clan head. Just what do you plan to do about Naruto? Shikamaru spoke, ignoring Anya. Just leave that bounty out there. Send a few assassination squads and pray they can somehow find him and deal with him. Saratobi did not reveal just how uncomfortably accurate that assessment was. Unfortunately there really wasn't anything more they could do for the time being. I am sorry Shikamaru, but I cannot discuss my plans with you. Shikamaru nodded just as if he'd openly agreed with his estimate. Despite his laziness the boy was sharp. I formally request to be placed in the Anbu Black Ops and given the mission of executing Yuzumaki Naruto. The others in the room except for the Hokage gasped at his audacity. Tsuritobi eyed him carefully, saying that he was absolutely serious and the Hokage did not doubt. Genin are not permitted into the Anbu, the Hokage told him. You would have to at least achieve the rank of Takubetsu Jonin. Shikamaru gave him a single sharp nod. Fine, once I reach Jonin will you assign me to the Black Ops and give me the mission of killing Naruto. If determination alone could do it, then Shikamaru might be the one for the job. Very well, when you are a Jonin or Takubetsu Jonin, I will promote you to the Anbu and assign you that mission. One year, he said. I will make Jonin in one year. He nodded to Chaoji. You too Chaoji, even if it takes you longer I'll need you to help me. You know too, though I know that'll be troublesome. Sure Shika, Chaoji replied as though it were nothing but a small favor. You know the last person to make Anbu by 13 was a Chihatachi, Hana pointed out. So what? Shikamaru replied. That just proves that it can be done. Hana grinned at him. She didn't really know him personally, but had heard plenty about him from Kiva. You do know that making Jonin in a year will require an awful lot of work don't you? Some things are worth the effort, Shikamaru answered her. Saratobi looked at the young boy. He might actually be able to do it. The remaining members of Team 7 were currently in his office. These days the three of them were about the only ones still willing to speak up for Naruto. Given the number of lives he had taken both in his escape and at the battle the whole village was now certain that he should have been murdered in his crib. What can I do for the three of you? The Hokage asked. He had expected Kakashi to answer, but instead it was Sasuke who stepped forward. We want to join the Anbu in order to capture Naruto and return him to the village. The Hokage slowly shook his head. That is impossible Sasuke. Why? He demanded. First off both you and Sakura are only Genin, and that automatically disqualifies you from joining the Anbu. If Kakashi wishes to, I will permit it, but then he would no longer be able to act as your sensei. I don't think the kids are ready for that, Kakashi said pleasantly. Besides that even if I agreed your mission would be to kill Naruto, not capture him. Are you really that eager to kill him? Sasuke demanded angrily. It is too late for anything else Sasuke, the Hokage told him wearily. Naruto is a nuke nin and an enemy by his own choice. We cannot simply ignore what he has done and welcome him back again. It's impossible. I won't accept that, Sasuke told him. None of us will. Naruto is still our teammate and our comrade, and more than that he's our friend. You still believe that after everything he's done? Saratobi asked dryly. Yes I do, Sasuke said fiercely. The last time I ever saw him he told me he would always be my friend and I believed him. Even after all that's happened I know it's not too late to redeem him and return him to the village. I'm sorry Sasuke, Saratobi told him. If I believed that I would do anything in my power to make it happen. But he killed Leaf Nin and attacked the village. There is no turning back now. Ichiha stared back definitely at the Hokage. There was clearly no give in him. I won't give up on him no matter what, neither will Sensei of Sakura. I do admire your loyalty, Sasuke, but time may eventually force you to change what you believe. Sasuke shook his head. Never, no matter what I'll save my friend. Time will tell, Saratobi thought. Three years later, the Togakur, the ninja village hidden within the sound, was in the midst of a vast celebration. This was the third anniversary of their leader proclaiming himself Otaki Jinodo the sixth great shinobi village. Kanoha and Suna had refused to recognize him, and thanks to their hostility the lands of fire and wind were closed to his sound ninja. Likewise any leaf or sand entering rice country would be killed on sight. The villages were not formally at war, but they were open enemies, and their hostilities were always just one small step short of it. Iwa, Kiri, and Kumo all recognized Odo as an equal and acknowledged Orochimaru as a cage. Lords and businessmen from the lands of Earth, Mist, Lightning, and the non-aligned countries all employed Sound Ninja. Though still in its infancy the village was thriving. Civilians and ninja from all over the continent came here in hopes of a fresh start. Missing Nin and other outcasts were welcomed and given the Otakage's protection, so long as they swore loyalty to him. Ordinary people came here to find work and start businesses. The village was enjoying an economic and building boom, as new construction could be seen everywhere. A ninja who lived and worked here brought in money and needed places to live, places to eat, places to shop, and every other kind of service. 
people were only too happy to emigrate here and fulfill those needs. There was a sense among both the ninja and civilians that the future was limitless. People had faith in the genius of the man who had founded their new home and who had turned it from empty land to a great ninja village in less than a decade. People also had faith in Lord Uzumaki and in his awe-inspiring power. With Orochimaru's genius and Lord Uzumaki's strength anything seemed possible. And if there were some dark rumors about what happened inside the Tower of Sound and in other places, so what? Every ninja village had its secrets and its darker side. The members of the Sound 7 were gathered in the courtyard of the Tower of Sound. Or at least six of them were. Their commander was inside talking with the Otakage. Trained by Rachimaru himself they were the elite bodyguard and strike force of the Otagakur. They were not only tasked with protecting their master, but with special missions that were too important or too sensitive to trust to others. As they waited Jirobo looked up at the clear blue sky. I'm looking forward to the fireworks tonight. What do you suppose Kamimura would say if he were alive right now? Get me out of this fucking box. I'm not dead. Taiya yelled miming pound on an invisible wall with her fists. Most of the others laughed, but Jirobo and one other looked at her disapprovingly. You shouldn't make light of that Taiya, he was our comrade and leader. He was a humorless prick who scared the shit out of all of us, Taiya said, not backing down a bit. And I breathed a big sigh of relief the day he croaked. I wish you wouldn't curse like that, Jirobo said for perhaps the millionth time. I agree, Haku added. Such language is not proper, especially among friends. Fuck you both, she said almost as a reflex. She turned to another member of her team. He had laughed the loudest at her little joke. How the fuck is he your student? I swear he's as different from you as night and day. Zabuza shrugged. He's been that way since the day I found him in the gutter half frozen. I'm used to it and don't care how he talks. Thank you Zabuza-sama, Haku said with a nod of his head. The two had been missing Nin from Mist and had come in about two years ago, after a couple close calls with Hunter Nins. Orochimaru had taken an interest in them, especially in Haku and his unusual. He'd given both of them some special training and eventually promoted them to the bodyguard, expanding its membership from five to seven. Seiken and his brother Yukin, Jirobo, Teaya, Kitamaru, Zabuza and Haku made up the squad, along with its leader. The large doors of the tower opened, and two very colorful figures stepped out ahead of a small procession of ninja and civilian ministers. One of them was a pale man in white and gold cage robes. The other was dressed in a bright orange jacket and black pants. He also wore black gloves on his hands, so that only his face could be seen. Lord Uzumaki Naruto, commander of the Sound 7, head of the Uzumaki clan, minister of ninja affairs, and the vice cage. He was of the Kaiubi whose power had slaughtered the leaf forces at the Valley of the End three years ago. He was the second most powerful man in Odo, answerable to no one but the Odokage himself. Koo, koo, koo a fine day for a festival, don't you think Narutokan? Orochimaru asked. Naruto laughed. You just want an excuse to have people see you wearing that. He nodded to the gold and white robes and hat that sparkled in the sun. You're like a little kid playing dress up. A ninja and the ministers walking behind them gasped. No one else would ever dare say such a thing. It was proof of Naruto's position that he could not only say it but think nothing of it. Orochimaru took no apparent offense as he chuckled lightly. Your clothing is not much less conspicuous than my own. I like oranges. Obviously. Orochimaru was quickly surrounded by his ministers and others who would walk with him along the parade route. Naruto went over to his team. We've confirmed at least two assassination squads are in the village, possibly more. If they interrupt the parade it will look bad. He gave them all a big smile. We don't want that now do we? His teammates laughed. Where Orochimaru's personality inspired fear and distrust, Naruto's naturally put people at ease. It might be just a little embarrassing, Seiken agreed. I have cage bunchons disguised in hinges all along the parade route and there are plenty of regular ninja there as well. You know the routine. They all nodded. Dealing with assassins was a regular occurrence. Then let's go. They all leapt away and vanished as the Otakage set out. They would not act as shields. There were plenty of Anbu to take care of that. They would go out and try to find the enemy before they could cause any trouble. The lone figure stood in the middle of a crowd less than half a mile from the tower. He was dressed in plain work clothes, but underneath more than 100 explosive notes were taped to his body. He was a leaf ninja, and this would be a one-way mission, but if he could trade his life for Rajimaru's, it would be well worth it. He was not worried about dying. What plagued his mind was the possibility of failure. Over the last three years countless assassins had been sent here to target Rajimaru and Naruto. All had failed miserably. The huge bounties on their heads had even inspired a few nuke nin to give it a try, though with no more success. Their bodyguards seemed very good at. The crowd stirred as a man in work clothes suddenly jerked about and fell. In the confusion no one noticed three sticking out of the back of his neck. Please excuse me. A ninja and his teen said as he leapt down and picked the man up in his arms. This man needs medical attention. The ninja then vanished with his injured patient. 
On a nearby rooftop Zabuza nodded his approval as Haku reappeared with the dead wolf assassin. Very nice, he was dead before he could even think of detonating his explosive notes. I'm glad you finally go over your silly hesitations about killing. That is due all to your training Zabuza sama Haku said. He quickly opened the man's shirt and removed the explosive tags. Dusunin in skulked in a back alley, dressed in old rags and sitting amid trash trying to look despondent. Like the other assassins sent here today they had explosive tags strapped on. Also like the others they used actual disguises rather than a hinge. Elite ninja could sense an active hinge, if they were to have any chance at all they had to get close and stay undetected for as long as possible. What do you think happened to Shinji? One of them asked in a low murmur. He got careless and he got caught, the other one answered back just as quietly. What do you think they did to him? His partner turned to him with a dark look. Don't know, but I doubt it was pleasant. Arachimaru had a particularly gruesome reputation when it came to ninja prisoners. Ninja interrogations were never gentle affairs, but the Sanin seemed to have a real genius for finding unusual and effective ways to inflict pain. The other nin nodded his agreement. You think he talked? As his partner answered he heard a flute playing from somewhere. If he did, we're all dead men, he suddenly laughed. Well actually even if he didn't we're still all dead men. But we won't achieve anything I guess. The other man was about to reply when he heard squealing coming from the trash they were sitting in. Without warning a horde of rats leapt out onto them. The two men were abruptly covered by them being bitten and scratched at. They flailed their arms about trying to beat them off without resorting to that would give them away. Odd and neither soon and in noticed as Jerobo leapt down. Slamming his meaty fists into the back of their heads he knocked them both out. The flute music abruptly stopped. They alive. Taya called down from the nearby roof. Yes, Jerobo said. He was already busy pulling off their explosive notes. Ai gave a nasty laugh. That's their shitty luck then. When Arachimaru starts using them for his experiments they'll wish they were dead. Language, he said half-heartedly. But he nodded, anything would be better than to be one of the Otakage's test subjects. From his concealed position on a roof several blocks from the parade route, Takahiro could see the procession approaching the amphitheater where Arachimaru would make his speech and then give the signal to commence the feast. The fact that it had gotten this far and he had heard no explosions meant the others had failed and were likely dead or captured. It was up to him then. He was an Anbu captain in his thirties and had been for several years one of a handful who had not been killed at the Valley of the End. By sheer luck he had been out of the village on the mission the night Naruto turned traitor. He had come home to find the heart and soul of the Anbu torn out. He'd spent the last few years working to rebuild the organization from the ground up. Given the immensity of the job the Hokage had appointed Danzo as commander, a man not fully trusted, but one of great skill and strength of will. Danzo had a remarkable job of rebuilding, and some truly talented ninja had joined the ranks. The Nara boy was a real prodigy, and so was Sasuke. Both of them were Anbu captains. And having had a Kakashi back also helped. But even with all that it would still be years before the Anbu fully recovered. The Noha remained weakened and dangerously vulnerable, and it was all the fault of those two traitors. He knew there was almost no chance of actually reaching his target, but he would try his damnedest. And if nothing else he would take some of the enemy with him. Akahiro was about to leap off when an overwhelming terror hit him. In his mind's eye he saw Kaiubi standing before him. The nine-tailed demon growled down and he could feel its hot breath. His heart was racing and he couldn't breathe. His entire body was locked up and useless. He couldn't even focus enough to detonate the explosive tags. He'd been in many fights and had felt killer intent before, but this was overpowering. It was the exact same terror he'd felt 15 years before when he'd faced a real Kaiubi. Neat trick, huh? Naruto said as he came out and stood in front of the helpless Anbu. Arachimaru taught it to me. He desperately wanted to blow himself up and kill the traitor, but no matter how he tried he couldn't focus enough to do anything. Naruto calmly took a kunai and put it to the man's throat. And now I'm going to do you the biggest favor anyone has ever done for you in your entire life. As he was unable to detonate the tags he was equally helpless to prevent his throat being cut wide open. What did you do that for? Kitamaru asked. You know how much the Otakage likes having ninjas to experiment with. Naruto grinned as he gathered up the seals. It's a holiday, everyone deserves a little good luck don't you think? Kitamaru shook his head while Seiken laughed. As they entered the amphitheater Arachimaru turned to his special guest. A short man with a bulbous nose who was dressed in white and brown robes of the Tsuchikage. I do hope your hip is not bothering you too much Tsuchikajusen. It's fine, thanks Otakajusen, the little man bit back. In truth his hip was bothering him, but he wasn't about to show any weakness. So it looks like you made it all the way home. I suppose I should congratulate you, though I still say you are a fool to do this, knowing there were assassins waiting. Arachimaru laughed. I have faith in my people to protect me, especially Naruto. In any case I am not easily killed. The small man could only nod at that. I'm glad I accepted your invitation to come here for a state visit. 
he raised an amused eyebrow. Though I hope you treat me better than you did the Kazakiage. He waved that off like a small thing. The Kazakiage tried to break an agreement with me. I trust you would never be so foolish. I haven't agreed to anything, the Tsuchikage said. Yet. Arachimaru grinned, as if he could hear that last unspoken word. Of course, come let us enjoy the festivities. As the Odakage spoke to the waiting crowd a beautiful dark-haired girl with lavender eyes stood at the rear of the stage waiting patiently. On the ring finger of her left hand she wore a gold band. Two arms grabbed her and lifted her off her feet. Eek. She instinctively activated her and ready to deliver a palm strike. This me Hinichin. Naruto asked with a laugh before giving his wife a kiss. Narutokin. I wish you wouldn't do that. I'm going to end up killing you by mistake one of these days. There was no idle threat. Hinata had become very proficient at and could deliver a lethal strike to the harder head with just one hit. Naruto pulled her closer and delivered another long searing kiss. Then I guess you'll need to revive me then. Along with being a deadly close combat specialist, she had studied medicine with Orochimaru's special agent Kabuto. She was proficient at both killing and healing. At first she had struggled, but with Naruto's constant encouragement, she had improved by leaps and bounds. Her need to be able to help him had driven her heart to improve and be as powerful as she possibly could. As he kissed his wife some more Naruto let his hands drop down her back until she could give her nice round ass a squeeze. Eek. She quickly jumped away from him and looked around at the surprised faces. Not here Narutokan. When we're alone, fine, but not here. Oh, come on Hinachan, he said, giving her his best sad puppy dog eyes. Once that would have worked like a charm, but now she crossed her arms and shook her head. Not until we go home. Seeing he was beaten he nodded. Eventually she let him put his arms around her again and hold her tight. He was holding her as the fireworks filled the night sky with color and light. It was a wonderful night. Despite the best efforts of Kanoha and Suna the celebration went off without a hitch. The citizens of Odo got to enjoy themselves and Orochimaru got to play the role of benevolent ruler to their loud and thunderous applause. Once the fireworks faded Naruto and Hinata left the celebration to return to their home. The palatial Yuzumaki estates were a fitting residence for Odo's first clan. They were modeled after the Hyuga in Kanoha and were vast with every possible convenience, including a private dojo and indoor pool. When they returned though the two of them went directly to the master bedroom. So can I grab your ass now? Naruto teased as he did just that. They began to kiss eagerly. She let out a soft moan when she felt his hands playing and teasing her breasts. Since it had been a festival she had not dressed in her usual ninja clothing. She had gone out in a pale lavender kimono with flowers stitched in the design. Carrying herself with a dignity and poise drilled into her since she could walk people had all seen her as the royal lady she was. That was just one more role she served to help her darling husband. Now that they were alone Naruto was pulling her kimono off and tossing it to the floor. She had nothing on underneath and as soon as she was naked his mouth was at her breast sucking like a newborn hungry for milk. Hey ah, Naruto. He brought her to the bed and pressed her down into it as he quickly got rid of his clothes. As he took off his orange jacket he exposed some of the seals that covered his body. The ones that could be seen now were drawn in black ink and covered him from his neck to his feet. Removing his black gloves they were on the back of his hand, his palm, and even written out in small runes and symbols on each finger. Most of his skin was covered in black ink. These were Rachimaru's handiwork and Naruto's. Over the last three years Naruto had studied the art of sealing with a special passion and could now be accurately called a seal master. The seals on his body had a myriad of purposes. Some were meant to aid him in accessing the Kyuubi's power, some were meant to suppress the Kyuubi's persona, some were defensive, aimed at preventing any sort of mind controlling or the Kyuubi's extraction. Making a repeat of the Yandames impossible. Naruto never allowed anyone but Orochimaru or Hinata to see them. They were his most closely guarded secret. Hinata had long since grown used to them and he no longer gave their appearance much thought. As soon as all his clothes were off he jumped on top of her and began to make savage passionate love. She cried out again and again begging him to grab on with arms and legs to encourage him. As he entered her, as he slid in and out of her and covered her mouth with his own, he thought about how wonderful it was to love someone and have them love you in return. When he'd first begun things with her he had just intended to use her. But as they spent time together he slowly realized that she really did love him and he began to fall in love with her as well. Being with his beloved Hinachan brought him immense joy and he wanted to always keep her safe. He loved her and she was one of a very precious handful who had never heard or betrayed him. Well that went well, don't you think? Orochimaru said back in his palace. He regretfully took off his robes. Yes Lord Orochimaru, Kabuto answered. He was one of Orochimaru's prized agents. A brilliant medic and an equally effective spy. He had been recalled from Kanoha to train Hinata and to help keep an eye on her and Naruto. Orochimaru trusted no one completely but he was as trusted as anyone in the Otakage's service. 
Barudakin and his unit were as efficient as ever, there was not even a murmur from the crowd today. No one would suspect there were four ninja out there eager to blow themselves up. Naruto is most definitely formidable, Lord Orochimaru. Kabuto said. Formidable and very independent-minded. Orochimaru grinned at his agent's subtle hints. Have you seen something that warrants my concern? Nothing blatant, Kabuto stated. He never says anything even remotely treasonous and has not committed any acts that would appear threatening. Orochimaru waited and invited him to continue. Some of his jokes are a tad disrespectful and he is very close to the members of the Sound 7. Some might question who their loyalty belongs to. That has been the case for some time now, Orochimaru said. He is unique among all of my servants. Too valuable to be killed, yet too strong willed to be fully controlled. I had hoped to make him love me. Unfortunately we are not quite that close. However the measures I have in place seem effective. He is loyal. Or at least he seems to be, Kabuto added. He has gained a great deal from serving me. He knows how much he stands to lose should he ever turn against me. He laughed softly. And I do have the heart seal as a final measure. Among the many seals on Naruto's body was one he had placed over his heart. If a specific set of hand signs and code words were spoken Naruto's heart would be shredded, killing him instantly. It could not be used to inflict pain, if activated it would kill, that was its sole function. Orochimaru alone knew of the activation, and Kabuto was the only other person to even know of the seal's existence. Orochimaru had deliberately kept the seal's real purpose a secret from Naruto. He wanted to earn Naruto's genuine affection, and knowing he'd place such a lethal thing on him would ruin that and likely set the shinobi to plotting. He preferred to rely on other more subtle methods to keep Naruto in line. The hard seal was an insurance policy against Naruto ever turning on him. Even so, what you have in mind, the mission to Akito, isn't it a risk? Kabuto asked. Ku, ku, ku of course it is, but one well worth taking. Do you think he would betray me? Given what would happen if he did? Probably not, Kabuto answered slowly. But he might be sorely tempted to. You overestimate his old loyalties, Orochimaru said. Those did not prevent him from abandoning his village. They will not matter to him now. They will matter, Kabuto. The risk is worth taking, Orochimaru said with a laugh. After all, I have not given up my interest in acquiring the Sharingan. Falling asleep in bed beside his wife Naruto entered the dreamscape. As usual he was in an empty lifeless wasteland. The blackened ruins of Konoha lay all around him. Above him all the faces on the Hokage monument had been blasted away except for Saratobi's. The night he'd left the leaf he had blown it up as a signal to the old man that they were now enemies. Now he liked having the old man's stern face looking down at what he had caused. Damn you brat, a bitter voice called out. Release me. Naruto looked over to the only other living being in this place. What his eyes saw was a plain red fox with nine bushy tails. He was crammed in a small steel cage no more than two feet high and wide. Every paw and tail had an iron shackle and heavy steel chin holding it in place. The fox's mouth was muzzled though that didn't keep him from communicating, and the cage itself was coated in paper seals. Naruto tapped his lips as though thinking it over. Uh. No. The fox growled in impotent rage. I am already bound within you. There is no need for all these additional restraints. Have you forgotten who aided you when you decided to acquire real power? I haven't forgotten who it was that had me believing I really was the Kaiubi for a while. Naruto was still embarrassed at how easily he'd been duped back then. I'm sure if I let you out of your cage you'd be eager to help me. We share the same fate. Naturally I would help. Naruto laughed. Wrong. Your fate is to be nothing but a battery. I'll take your power and your knowledge, but I won't ever listen to your lies again. You're still nothing but a child. He looked about at the ruins. You still have a child's longing for revenge. You still ache to hurt those who wounded you. Especially the old man. Shut up, Naruto said darkly. The fox merely chuckled. Oh, did I strike a nerve. Don't forget I have seen through your eyes and I know your thoughts. It's not the village's wrongs you want to avenge so much as Saratobi's betrayal. What you truly want is to hurt him. Like I care about that. Naruto snapped. Who cares what the stupid old man thinks. The fox looked up at the monument. I'd say you care quite a bit. You don't know what you're talking about. The forbidden scroll suddenly appeared before him. He had learned all of its techniques save for one. Now be quiet while I study. The fox continued to torment him as much as he could while Naruto tried to learn the secrets of the Horatian no Jutsu. A few days later in Kanoha the third Hokage stared at a handful of reports from Agent Sonodo. Among the many civilians who had rushed to the new village to find work were a dozen leaf spies. All of them were kept ignorant of the others. They were ordinary people, not ninja, and were there just to send general observations about the village. Tsuritobi knew quite well what the ordinary citizens of Odo did. What he lacked was intelligence about Orochimaru and Naruto and the plans they had in store. What he was reading right now were accounts of the celebration of Odo's founding as a great power and the proclamation of the Odokage. What made him so unhappy was that it had gone so smoothly. 
none of the reports mentioned any kind of disturbance or even a rumor of danger. The assassination squads had failed to even be a nuisance. What also worried him were mentions of the Tsuchikij walking the parade route beside Orochimaru. Iwa had been the main enemy back during the Third Great Ninja War, and the bitter feelings of that struggle still lingered. If Kanoha's old enemy drew together with her current one, he sighed and rubbed his tired eyes. I am too old for this, he muttered wearily. He had retired long ago. By all rights he should still have been retired and spending time with his grandson in painting. In an ideal world the village would be in Minato's capable hands, and Orochimaru and Naruto would be loyal leaf ninja doing their duty for the village. But the world remained anything but ideal. Minato had been dead 15 years, and Orochimaru and Naruto were the greatest possible threats to Kanoha's survival. He had been responsible for both of them, and until they were dealt with he did not feel he could honorably step down. The speaker on his desk buzzed. Lord Hokage, his secretary said. Ichiha Sasuke and Hada Kakashi are both here for their appointment. Send them in, the Hokage said. The time had finally come to make a serious effort against Odo. Operation Orange would soon begin. The door to the Hokage's office opened and two Anbu entered, one with a dog mask and one with a raven's. They both removed their masks once the door was shut and they were alone with their Hokage. Alone among all the ninja of the village Sasuke and Kakashi still pleaded Naruto's case and argued for his return. After all the death and destruction Naruto had inflicted on Konoha their arguments were less than popular. Had they not been elite ninja they likely would have been brought up on charges of light treason. In particular Shikamaru and Danzo were vehemently opposed to Naruto's return. Danzo had once believed Naruto could be harnessed as a living weapon in the service of the village. After his defection and the slaughter at the Valley of the End, Danzo felt Naruto would never be completely trustworthy. He loudly criticized a third for not having given him over to the Anbu for indoctrination from the start. He claimed that if that had been the case Naruto would now be a loyal and unquestioning servant of Konoha. As it was now he felt that any weapon that could not be safely used should be scrapped. Danzo believed the only safe course now was killing Naruto by any means necessary. Shikamaru just wanted to avenge his father, plain and simple. It was perhaps only natural that after making Jonin and being enrolled in the Anbu at age 13, that Danzo would recruit him into Root. Together they led the faction everyone but Sasuke and Kakashi really who wanted Naruto killed. Saratobi had acted in accordance with this, if he hadn't he would have been overthrown. And truthfully he felt it was the best course despite his own feelings for Naruto. But after three years of mounting failure certain elements within the village were beginning to believe killing him was impossible and that something else should be tried. Not because they had forgiven Naruto or changed their opinion about him. Almost the whole village felt what happened the night he betrayed them was the real Naruto finally coming out into the open. The fact he was the Yandame's son was now generally known, but most people vehemently refused to believe it. The ones who did simply pointed to the obvious truth that the demon inside him had overpowered whatever nobility might have been there. People who were willing to now consider a different alternative did so for the practical reason that assassination had failed. Whatever the reason this slight change had given Saratobi just enough leeway to try something. Is the mission a go? Sasuke asked eagerly. He still believed in his friend and desperately wanted to pull him out of his darkness. The Hokage slowly nodded. Over the last six months there has been a highly secretive correspondence going on between Sasuke and Naruto. Coded messages had been snuck into Odo and placed in Naruto's hands. Disguised replies had been taken out and delivered here to Konoha. Over the last half year both of them had carefully felt out the other and had at last agreed to meet in the city of Akito in four days' time. They would have a face-to-face -face meeting where Sasuke would finally get his chance to bring Naruto back. Here, the Hokage handed over a sealed envelope. Within that is a full pardon for all the crimes he has committed up to this point, it bears my signature and seal. There is also a letter of commission restoring his status as a leaf ninja and granting him the rank of Jonin. If you can convince him to return to the village of his own free will, I will do everything possible to right the past wrongs and give him a place here. Sasuke nodded and made the letter disappear. I will definitely convince him. I know if I can just talk to him I can bring him back. We will certainly do all that we can, Kakashi said. For him trying to save Naruto was a debt he owed to his former sensei. Even if he died in the effort he had to do everything he could to bring his beloved sensei's son home again. The Hokage looked like the very old man that he was. He did not know how much time was left to him, and he desperately wanted to repair the mistakes of his past. He was not sure that it was possible. You realize Sasuke that all this may be nothing but a trap. It is very likely that Naruto's only intention in agreeing to meet with you is to kill or capture you. Yes, I know that, Sasuke acknowledged. But even with the risk I have to go, and I do believe he is serious about wanting to talk to me. The night he left, the last time we saw each other, the dope told me he would always be my friend. I believe him. Some would call that being naive, Sirotobi said. Putting your faith in something he said so long ago. Naruto was always one to keep his promises, Sasuke stated. 
I have faith in him. Well you will have the chance to see if that faith is warranted, the Hokage said. You will leave tomorrow morning for Aikido. Obviously this mission has a ranking above S and must be kept absolutely secret. Should anyone learn of this the results would be disastrous. Sasuke and Kakashi both nodded. After the two of them parted ways Sasuke headed back to his apartment. When he got there his girlfriend was in the kitchen already making dinner. I'm home, he called out. Welcome back Sasuke-kun, Sakura came out to greet him with a warm kiss. In the three years since Naruto's departure Team 7 had been dissolved with Kakashi and Sasuke entering the Anbu, while Sakura remained a genin serving wherever she was needed. She had a bit of talent but was not an especially effective field operative. These days most of her missions were in a support role within the village itself. Over that time she and Sasuke had drawn closer as she was the only woman he felt he could really talk to, eventually their friendship had become something more. She had actually achieved her long-cherished dream of becoming Sasuke's girl. As with most dreams the reality was not quite what she'd expected. Given their busy schedules they did not see each other as much as they would have liked. Since becoming an Anbu captain Sasuke had been given many dangerous assignments that took him far from the village for long stretches. Sakura would always fear the worst and miss him terribly. She was always hugely relieved whenever he came back to her. She was still completely devoted to him and loved him desperately. Sasuke's feelings for her were just a little more indistinct, he definitely cared for her, and they were lovers. But he never professed to be in love with her, and while she obviously mattered to him she knew his work came first. Especially his plans to save Naruto. At the very beginning she had also been loudly supportive of the idea. He was her teammate as well, and she cared about him and respected him. She told people he had been driven out and deserved a chance to return. Unlike Kakashi and Sasuke though, she was not a special talent. She was just another genin. So when she talked in public about Naruto she was quickly slapped down by others. She soon began keeping her opinions to herself as she did not like drawing so much hostility. And while Sasuke and Kakashi had good things to say about him, she would hear the other side from everyone else. People would talk about friends and relatives lost the night he abandoned the village or at the valley of the end. She heard about the Kaiubi and about the horrors it would bring. She heard about the things he was doing in Odo, dark rumors that made her blood run cold. Bit by bit she began to think that maybe Naruto was never the good guy she had thought. She had her own memories that made her wonder, feeling the demonic from him that first time during the mission to Hikido, seeing him torture that rain in during the exams, seeing his full power at the finals as he proclaimed he was the Kaiubi. Yes, maybe he was never really the good guy to begin with. Sasuke still believed though. I'm going to meet him, he said after her welcoming kiss. Me too. He grinned. Our former teammate. She stared at him in shock. Naturally she'd been told nothing at all about the secret correspondence and so had no idea that meeting Naruto, outside of battle, was even possible. She had known that trying to convince Sasuke to give up his dreams of saving him would drive them apart, so she had deliberately kept her true feelings to herself. That made things easier and she didn't think it would ever matter. She could not imagine a mission where he would actually meet with Naruto. How? How is this even possible? I can't tell you the details, Sasuke answered. Really I shouldn't have told you even this much, but I know you want him back too. You can't say a word to anyone. This is all under Srank's secrecy. Of course, she replied with a weak smile. When are you leaving to find him? Tomorrow morning. Sasuke, she began hesitantly. Do you? Do you really think it's a good idea? What if he turns on you? Sasuke frowned at her and quickly dismissed the notion. I'm sure that won't happen, he said. I'm sure the dope will at least give me a chance to talk to him. Even if he does, what if he doesn't like what you have to say? She asked worriedly. The image of Naruto tearing apart Gara flashed through her mind. Even if there's a danger I have to try, Sasuke said. So what's for dinner? The question was clearly meant to end talk on the subject. She got the hint and did not bring it up again. As she headed home her mind was filled with panicked images of Naruto surrounded by demonic chakra and proclaiming himself Kaiubi. She knew Sasuke was the best, but just how many leaf jonin had Naruto already killed? Would Sasuke can really be safe? What scared her the most was the fact she knew that no matter how strong Sasuke might be, there was no way he could match Naruto in full demon mode. Sasuke kins safety was the only thing that really mattered to her. She would do anything to keep him safe. Even betray him. Changing direction she headed away from her home and towards another destination. I see, Narashikamaru said calmly. He took out his cigarette and flicked some ashes into a cup. He had picked up the habit from his old sensei, and it helped calm him. Well thank you for telling me this, I promise you we'll take care of things. I don't usually reveal Srank secrets, she said quickly. That was a crime punishable by imprisonment and hard labor by death. I'm only doing it now to protect Sasukakan. Nice to know some things never change, he said under his breath. You did the right thing bringing this to me, Sakura. We'll take care of Naruto, and I promise we'll try and keep Sasuke safe.
I we you mean the Anbu, right? Just what will you do? It's better if you don't know, he told her as he stamped out his cigarette and then lit a fresh one. Just have faith it will be taken care of. She nodded. So long as Asukakan is alright that's all I care about. Shika nodded but didn't actually say anything more. Treason, Danzo said darkly. It's nothing less than treason against the village. Saratobi has finally gone too far. Before you worry about that, shouldn't we make plans to deal with Naruto? Shikamaru asked. We know Sasuke is leaving tomorrow morning, but we have no idea when or where this meeting is scheduled for. I'll have him followed, go ahead and assemble your team and have them ready. You will be part of the strike force. Shikamaru nodded. Whoever follows him if they're spotted Sasuke will scrub the mission. I'm sure he'd rather do that than put his good friend at risk. Don't worry about that, I have several very experienced ninjas who are experts at trailing ninjas while remaining unobserved. Now go and prepare, there isn't much time. Shikamaru left the secret root meeting room to get Chaoji, Ino, and Asuma ready. Anzo had always been a careful man who did not take needless risks. That was the main reason he was still alive at his advanced age. He reconfirmed he was alone and unmonitored before running through a long and complex series of hand signs. At last an astral image appeared of a figure wearing a robe and with the eyes. You have news? Payne demanded. I do, Danzo replied. He had also survived to old age by knowing how to make deals to achieve his objectives. The following morning an Odo Naruto was having a last private meeting with the Odokage before setting out for Akito with the Sound 7. You know what I want Narutokin, Orochimaru said with a simpering eagerness. The time for me to take a new body is drawing near. This is the ideal chance for me to at last acquire the Sharingan. Yeah, I know. I'll definitely bring you back Sasuke, or at the very least I'll bring back his eyes. His eyes would be useful, Orochimaru admitted. I could always have them implanted. But their value is nothing compared to what having him brought here to me alive would be worth. Naruto grinned mischievously. You know, having Hinata with me would sure make things easier. Orochimaru had a sad look as she shook his head. I am terribly sorry Narutokin, but Kabuto and the hospital simply cannot spare her. Honey how the only times you can spare her for missions are when you can't spare me. You know if I didn't know any better it's almost like you're keeping her as a hostage to guarantee my good behavior. Such mistrustful words wound me deeply Narutokin, Orochimaru sighed. You know how I trust you. Naruto smiled at him cheerfully. Oh, I trust you the same way Odakaju-sama, he made a quick gesture with one finger on his jacket. Cross my heart and hope to die. Akito was a medium-sized city in Iron Country. It was one of those new industrial centers that were beginning to drive the old-fashioned guilds into extinction. Here they took the plentiful iron ore and coal deposits this land was famous for and turned them into steel. Huge brick factories with massive smokestacks hundreds of feet high pour black smoke into the air day and night. It was a dirty crowded place where everything was coated in a thin layer of dust and soot. Even the people here seemed perpetually dirty and stained. Most of them were the workers who trudged in and out of the factories, working their 10 or 12 hour shifts in stifling heat and in constant danger of being maimed or burned. No one cared if one of them had an arm torn off by a press or if they slipped and fell into a vat of molten iron. The iron country had an abundance of poor unskilled workers. Most of the people here wore the cheapest and plainest of grey wool and went through their daily lives with constant apathy and weariness. They lived hard lives and seemed to have no energy to spare for greetings or warm words. So when they saw a man in bright orange strolling down one of their crowded streets, he drew a lot of attention. His Hideite with a musical note stamped into it and the pouches and weapons he wore along his belt all screamed that he was a ninja. That was a rarity in Iron Country where samurai enforced their daimyo's will. No one in Akito could remember ever seeing one in their village before. Hi there. The blonde ninja greeted a group of weary workers trudging home with a cheerful wave. Their blank stares only made him smile even wider. Sasuke had recommended Akito because it was one of those out-of-the-way places that people never had any reason to visit. It was far enough away from both fire and rice country to give them a decent chance of maintaining secrecy at least until the meeting took place. Naruto was in a fine mood despite the grey and tainted surroundings. He was going to meet an old friend and an old sensei again. He was honestly looking forward to it. He really wanted a chance to talk honestly with Sasuke and Kakashi before the fighting started. When he entered the crowded bar called the Iron Spigot, he had no problem spotting them. Sasuke and Kakashi were alone at a table right in the middle of the place. Kakashi looked exactly the way Naruto remembered him with his jonin vest and leaf hideite over one eye. Sasuke had grown up some of course, but he also looked much the same. He had on a dark blue jacket with the Achiha fan symbol emblazoned on the back. In their coded messages they had agreed to meet out in the open, no hinges, no disguises, and no clones. As Naruto cheerfully waved to them and strolled over he wondered how much time they would have before the real show began. Sasuke and Kakashi both got to their feet. It's good to see you again Naruto, Sasuke said and held out his hand. Naruto took it and shook it without hesitation. 
It's good to see you too. And you have Kakashi sensei too. He also shook hands with his old sensei. I honestly wasn't sure you'd come to Naruto, Kakashi said as all three of them took their seats. How could I not? He asked with a grin. Sasuke looked at his former teammate intently. He was honestly surprised to see he still had the exact same goofy smile he'd had all through the academy. After what he'd done at the Valley of the End and to all the assassin squads that had gone after him, since he'd half expected to find an evil malevolent aura enveloping him. The most everyone in Konoha he, not Itachi, not Orochimaru, was the number one enemy. The civilians talked about him in hushed whispers, like he really was the devil himself. The entire village was living under the shadow of what he might do one day. Yet Naruto didn't look to have really changed any. Sure, he was older now and no longer a child, but he still had that same carefree attitude that had always marked him. How's Hinata doing? Sasuke asked. She's fine, Naruto told him. You know she and I are married now. She's a hell of a medic nin and a great woman, you should try her baked salmon sometime, it's great. You know Naruto the village and the Hayuga don't recognize that marriage as legitimate, Kakashi said carefully. So far as they're concerned she's still a prisoner being held against her will. Just because the village won't recognize something doesn't mean it's so. Naruto answered with a knowing grin. They don't admit I'm the fourth kid either, do they? No they don't, Kakashi said unhappily. Though Naruto's parentage had ceased being a secret most people vehemently refused to believe it. At least inside Konoha. Well, I can't say I'm surprised. I mean who would want to admit that their precious yellow flash produced a monster like me? You're not a monster dog, Sasu told him, sounding annoyed. You're an idiot and a dead son, but you're no monster. Ha. I bet you and Kakashi are the only ones in the village who think that. The Hokage also feels that way about Naruto, Kakashi said. We wouldn't be here now if he didn't. Naruto glanced at his sensei and did not respond. Would you do it? Sasuke asked quietly. There was no need to explain what it was. I did it because the old man betrayed me, Naruto said. All I ever wanted was to become a powerful ninja like him and make him proud. And then when I finally proved myself he decided to leash me. What would you have done? I don't know, Sasuke answered truthfully. But I would never have turned on the village. Well. Everyone always liked you. Naruto couldn't keep just the slightest twinge of jealousy out of his voice. You know I'm a lord now. Up and sound I'm recognized as head of a clan and as the second most powerful man in the whole country behind the Odakage. The village doesn't recognize your status as either a nobleman or a clan head either, Kakashi said with a sigh. Why am I not surprised? Naruto, Sasuke spoke. Do you remember promising me we would always be friends that night? Did you mean it? Naruto nodded. Sure I remember, and yeah, I meant it Sasuke. It was a promise and you know I never go back on my word. Did you know what you were going to do that night? Did you already know you were going to betray the village? Yeah, I did. Then why did you say we would always be friends? Oh come on, you already know the answer to that. You can be friends with someone even when you're enemies too. Didn't that describe us back at the start with Team 7? Sasuke gave him a slight smile. Not really, I didn't think of you as a friend back then. Naruto made a face and mimed getting stabbed. Ouch. That's pretty mean. Still smiling, Sasuke took out the Hokage's documents and laid them on the table. Here are the papers guaranteeing your pardon for all crimes committed up until now and making you a jonin of the leaf. It's just as I promised you, if you come with us right now you can return to the village and have a fresh start. A fresh start, Naruto repeated and picked the papers up to leaf through them. Everything will just be forgotten huh? Will the villagers take me back with open arms? The Hayuga and the others will pat me on the back and welcome me home. He didn't look too closely at the papers in his hands. He did note the signature and seal looked genuine. It might not be perfect, but at least you could come home again, Sasuke said. Oh I'll come home again, Naruto said. When I have nine tails and I'm ready to burn the damn place to the ground. But leisurely ease he tore the documents in his hands in half and then into quarters. Kakashi and Sasuke both stiffened in their seats, Kakashi lifted his hidei to reveal his sharingan and also placed a hand on a kunai ready to draw it. Sasuke deliberately kept both his hands on the table as a show of good faith and trust in his friend. Are you planning to betray us, Naruto? We came here in good faith. Sasuke said keeping his voice calm despite his rising anger. Come on Sasuke, who are you kidding? We both know all of this was just a game from the very start. Will I come back and serve Konoha again? After what I did. I mean I know I used to be the dead last, but even I'm not that stupid. The offer from the Hokage was the real Naruto, Kakashi insisted. Naruto gave his sensei a cold smile that had no warmth or humor in it at all. When Sasuke saw it he found it easier to believe the stories he'd heard. So you and Sasuke didn't come here to try and kill me? We didn't, Kakashi insisted. Then why are Shikamaru, Ino, and Chouji here too? Before anyone could reply a shadow raced across the dirty floor and merged with Naruto's. There were three slight puffs of smoke as the three Anbu dropped their disguises. 
Pretty good Naruto, Shikamaru's boy said from behind an Anbu mask with a deer on it. Our disguises were good enough to get past Kakashi, but not you. As Shikamaru got up from the bar stool he was on, Naruto was compelled to get up from his seat. Sasuke and Kakashi had also gotten to their feet. The regular patron suddenly got the feeling that it might be a good time to leave and began to stampede out the door. Shikamaru. What the hell are you doing here? Sasuke demanded. What does it look like? Chaoji said angrily behind his butterfly mask. We're here to deal with Naruto once and for all. Why are you bothering to pretend you're surprised? Naruto asked. I knew from the very start how this would go. Sasuke turned to Naruto. I swear to you I didn't know they would be here. Kakashi and I really were trying to bring you back home. Sure you were, Naruto said. Actually that's true, Shikamaru admitted. We only found out about this because Sakura told us. Sakura told you? Sasuke said, disbelieving. I don't believe you. She wants to save Naruto as much as I do. No, Ino spoke from behind a mask of a boar. She wanted to make you happy so she pretended to want that. The truth is she gave up on him a long time ago, Sasukakan. Sasuke looked shocked. He felt betrayed by one of the very few people he had come to trust. He really didn't know. Naruto sounded surprised. They're not the only ones. There are at least 10 more ninja in this village. I'm willing to bet they're all Anbu. I knew it was a trap before I ever stepped foot in this place. Then why did you come? Because I was going to betray you too, Naruto said. He did not sound embarrassed or ashamed. He was just relaying a fact. The Otakage wants me to deliver you to him. Your body is going to serve as his next host. You're quite a Naruto guy, and Naruto, Shikamaru said. You'd sell out to someone who really wanted to help you. Don't sound too high and mighty Shika, my safety at this meeting was supposed to be guaranteed by the old man. You and the others being here violated that the second you arrived. Even if it turns out Sasuke and Kakashi didn't know I was the one who was betrayed first. I don't want to hear anything like that from the worst traitor in the history of the Leaf Village. This is for my father and Chaoji's father and for every other ninja and civilian of Kanoha you've killed. Cage Kubi Shibari no Jutsu. The Hand of Shadow made its way up from the floor snaking its way about Naruto's body as it headed for his neck. As the hand grasped Naruto's throat it was pushed back by red chakra that began to pour out of it and the rest of Naruto's body. Shikamaru grunted as his shadow was forcibly expelled. In a heartbeat Naruto was surrounded by a red chakra cloak with three tails swirling about. His eyes had changed from blue to red with slitted pupils. He had fangs and claws and looked more than a little demonic. Deciding to show them a little something he activated his first level curse seal. Black splotches covered his face, he grunted his pain as his mouth and jaw grew out and his eyes set further back giving his face an animalistic look. His jacket and sleeves split open as his muscles expanded and became coated in thick red fur. The other ninja took a step back as he became a real monster. Oh come on, Naruto laughed in a husky not quite human voice. You didn't really think it would be that easy did you? That was when things went from bad to worse. The instant Naruto activated his seal and released some of the Kyuubi's chakra every ninja in the city of Akito knew it. Beneath the bandages that covered his face Abusa chuckled. Looks like Naruto's cutting loose, heh, good times. The other members of the Sound 7 nodded. Are we really not going to assist Naruto-sama? Haku asked. What? You think Naruto needs our fucking help to deal with those shitheads? Tei replied. We just need to take care of the other leaf nin and keep them from spoiling his fun, Seiken said. On the nearby rooftops they spotted flashes of sudden movement heading towards the bar. As one they all activated their curse seals. There was no need for subtlety now. Zabuza laughed as he felt the raw energy course through him. Black lines covered his face and hands. With such power filling him he really did feel like a demon. Time to party, he said and drew his sword. Have fun, Seiken reminded them. But remember to not let any of them get in Naruto's way. The six of them vanished to intercept their various targets. Ino ran through some hand signs and put her fingers on Shintenshin no Jutsu. She had been afraid he would move too quickly for her to catch. But fortunately he had remained in place long enough. Despite his powers her clan techniques should have allowed her to switch places with him, giving her temporary control of his body. That was what should have happened. Nothing happened. Ino cried in surprise. The monstrous thing that was now Naruto looked at her. The pointed teeth in his snout became a hideous smile. Sorry Inichin, but that won't work on me. The seals that were now hidden beneath his fur shielded him from all possession or mind-affecting techniques. By the way, did I ever tell you that you were always really, really annoying? Ino opened her mouth to reply but never got the chance. Naruto moved so fast he seemed to teleport from the middle of the common room to right in front of her. It took just a swipe of his claws to rip her head from her neck and send it flying across the room. Blood gushed up out of her torn open throat. Her body continued standing for just a moment and then collapsed at Naruto's feet. Ino. Shikamaru and Chaoji screamed. Naruto looked at them. See? She's much less annoying now. 
Thao Ji howled a wordless scream and ran at him. His arms grew to five times their normal size and hit him with a series of blows that would have shattered boulders or torn down the walls around them. Naruto stood there and allowed him to hit him. He didn't even take a step back. That all you got fatty? Naruto grinned down at him. He then delivered a punch of his own. His fist and arm went clean through Chao Ji's armor and chest and out his back, literally ripping out his heart. Shikamaru stood there horrified as his two dearest friends and teammates had just been slaughtered right before his eyes. So are you really supposed to be a genius? Naruto asked as he casually tossed aside Chao Ji's bleeding corpse. You seem like the same lazy idiot that I remember. Damn you, Shikamaru cursed. This isn't the way this was supposed to work out. We were supposed to avenge our fathers. Shika, you don't know the first thing about revenge. Naruto said. He was about to deal with him when the sound of chirping birds filled the bar. Naruto. Sasu called out. His Sharingan was active as was Kakashi's. They were on either side of him with Chitaris in their palms. I'm sorry. I didn't want it to come to this. I really did want you to come home. But I guess it's too late. It's been too late for a long time now. Naruto said. As one both Kakashi and Sasu ran at him, one aiming for the front and one for his back. They would rely on them to avoid any possible counter and deliver their attacks. The red chakra cloak that surrounded him shot out two clawed hands at each. Both Sasuke and Kakashi were startled to see that they could not show them how to avoid the Kyubi's chakra. Both ninja were caught and then slammed through the walls of the bar. Not only were they sent through the bar's walls they went flying through the street to slam into the adjacent buildings. Both were left in bloody heaps unconscious. Now then, where were we? He turned back to Shikamaru to find he was gone. Heh, I guess he has some sense after all. The members of his squad met him outside the now ruined and bloody bar. Naruto was back to his normal self. Since his clothes were ruined he worked a henge so as to appear fully dressed and to hide his seals. All the other ninja are dead, Zabuza informed him. Naruto nodded. These two are still alive, Seiken told him. Do you want us to fix that? No, Naruto said. The whole point of this was to bring Sasuke back for the Odakage. I held back on purpose. What about the other one? Seiken asked. I think I'll let Kakashisensei live, he always annoyed me with his being late, but I liked him and he was a good sensei in his own way. Naruto was sure that Shikamaru had managed to escape as well. That was fine. He could live with the pain of knowing he had caused the deaths of Ino and Chaoji while failing to get the revenge he wanted so badly. Haku. Yes Naruto-sama. I don't mind sparing Kakashi, but I don't think I'll let Kanoha keep even one Sharingan anymore. Can you take care of that for me? Haku nodded. Well not actually a medic, he was an expert on anatomy and had fine chakra control. He drew out a kunai and nodded. I will remove it, Naruto-sama. Naruto grinned. The first part of his plan had gone through without a hitch. Saratobi was in his office trying to handle the never-ending paperwork when the doors opened. He was surprised to see Danzo entering along with Aburam Shaibi, Hayuga Hanabi, Inuzuka Hana, and many of the other clan heads and leading ninja of the village. At his side was Nara Shikamaru dressed in Anbu cloak and armor. As soon as he saw them and the anger on their faces he knew. What is the meaning of this? Saratobi demanded. Perhaps if some of the clan heads were still in doubt he could intimidate them. It didn't work. We have come here to demand your immediate resignation and retirement from public life, Danzo told him flatly. If you refuse, we will arrest you on charges of high treason. Treason? That is a very serious charge, Siratobi said. I assume you have some evidence. Shikamaru stepped forward. His eyes were lifeless and his voice a shen, but he still spoke loudly and clearly. You sent Sasuke and Kakashi to the city of Akito to meet with the traitor Yuzumaki Naruto and offer him a pardon for his crimes. To invite the Kaiubi back to this village without even discussing it with the clans was treason. And you might want to know that Sasuke was captured and Kakashi is in the hospital right now recovering from his wounds. His Sharingan was removed. The angry looks on the other ninja grew darker. Only Danzo and Shikamaru remained perfectly neutral. How could you do that? Inuzuka Hana demanded hotly. She had lost her mother at the Valley of the End. Like Shikamaru she would never forgive. Because of you we've lost Sasuke and the Sharingan. What were you thinking? You would have pardoned the man who killed my father and kidnapped my older sister. Hanabi asked in that cool superior Hayuga manner. She too would never forgive. The man who inflicted such wounds on the Hayuga. To have offered him a pardon was unthinkable and unforgivable. I acted within the limits of my authority as Hokage, Saratobi told them. He knew it was pointless, but he would still defend himself. I did what I thought best for the village. By inviting the Kayubi back into our midst. Hana demanded. How was that for the best? I am forced to concur, Aburam Shaibi said in a monotone. Naruto's actions over the past three years have made it clear he views us as the enemy. I fail to see how this course of action could possibly have worked. Wouldn't it have been better to have had him as an ally rather than as an enemy? Saratobi asked. 
it would have been better to have had him as a tool, Danzo said. Had you listened to me long ago he would be serving this village and be completely trustworthy. You mean he would have been reduced to a mindless follower of yours, Suratobi said. Like so many others in route. He never would have had a chance at any sort of normal life. And so? Danzo asked coldly. Some must make sacrifices for the greater good. A ninja village cannot survive otherwise. Do not pretend to be ignorant of that fact. Our ninja choose to serve, Suratobi said solemnly. Naruto would never have been allowed to choose. I felt that the village owed at least that much to Yandame's one and only son. A slight murmur of discontent ran through the clan heads and other ninja. Some of them vehemently refused to believe Naruto was Yandame's child. Even those who did know the truth disliked being reminded of it. Anzo was unmoved. Whatever your reasons, they led to the current situation. Because of your actions the last true Uchiha has been lost. The Sharingan has been lost. Its power now belongs to Odo and Rachimaru. Another traitor who you allowed to turn on us. It is obvious you are no longer fit to lead the village. Should the truth of what happened get out however it will severely damage Konoha, both internally and in our relations with the other villages. Most ninja, both inside and outside of Konoha, still view you as a legend. Your trial and execution would destroy that and cause only harm. Therefore, for the good of the village, I ask you to write out your resignation and step down. Saratobi looked at all the faces of those present. They were all united against him. If he refused he would be arrested, that was obvious. And Danzo was right. It would only serve to harm Konoha. Very well, he said and took out a sheet of paper and a pen. Anzo looked on silently. He did not betray the joy he felt at his long-awaited moment of triumph. It had taken almost an entire lifetime, but in the end he had won. He would be the next Hokage and would save the village from the mess Iratobi had put it in. A few days later Inodo Naruto was about to set out for a very special meeting. Here you are Narutokin, Hinata handed him a tiny vial with a green liquid inside. She looked troubled. Are you? Are you sure about this? She asked him. Smiling, he took the vial from his wife and made it disappear. Trust me Hinata-chan, this is for the best. But Sasuke is a friend. Still smiling he gave her a long comforting kiss. I know, but sacrifices have to be made. You trust me, don't you, Hinata-chan? Of. Of course I do Narutokin. He kissed her again. Then trust me now. She slowly nodded. All right. He left to go to the tower and meet the Otakage. It was time for the second part of his plan. The Anbu who guarded the Tower of Sound stepped aside and bowed to him. He and Kabuto were the only ones permitted to enter Rachimaru's presence without being summoned. Naruto opened the doors to the Otakage's private office. He entered to find him sitting there scribbling his signature and stamping his personal seal onto a stack of papers. You know I wonder what all our enemies would think if they only knew the mighty Snake Sanin spent most of his time sitting behind a desk, working like some grunt clerk or accountant. Naruto sat down without bothering to wait for an invitation. Hirachimaru looked up at him with an amused expression. I can remember Saritabisensei always complaining that paperwork was the bane of every cage's existence. I admit that back then I thought he was exaggerating and that a leader could do whatever he liked. But controlling Odo includes keeping an eye on the various needs of the village. It's boring but necessary. When I run things I'll make a hundred clones and have them take care of all that in half an hour. Hirachimaru raised a single eyebrow. You mean of course when you are Hokage and running Kanoha one day. Of course, Naruto said with a grin. How else would I mean it? Hirachimaru gave a warm odd. Just as I have promised you will one day be Naruto, I will give you Kanoha as a reward for all your hard work and loyalty. That's very generous of you Hirachimaru-sama. Naruto said. Today is the day isn't it? The day you take Sasuke's body. Yes, Hirachimaru said eagerly. At long last I will have the power of the Achiha. I have waited for this day. You did very well Naruto. Kabuto tells me Sasuke is in perfect health, without even a bone broken. Once I possess his body I will be truly invincible. Since you're so pleased do you think I could ask for one slight favor? In the underground cells of the tower Kabuto was just leaving as Naruto arrived. Lord Naruto, Kabuto said in his usual cheerful manner. What are you doing here? I came to have a last word with one of my few old friends, Naruto said. Really? Does Lord Orochimaru know? Naturally, you don't think I'd try talking to such an important prisoner without the Otakage's permission, do you? Truthfully, Naruto-sama, I don't know what you might be capable of. Only the tiniest hint of suspicion tainted the words. Do you object to my having the chance to say goodbye to my friend? Naruto asked. Not if Lord Orochimaru does not, Kabuto said. Naruto walked past him before Kabuto spoke again. Is that really all you're going to do? Naruto halted and looked back over his shoulder at the young medic Nin and spy. What else could I do? He then continued down the gloomy hallway to the appropriate cell. Sasuke was bound hand and foot in heavy iron chains. The walls of the cell had been especially sealed against earth or teleportation and would have been almost impossible to escape even if he could have worked them. 
Each hand was held firmly to the stone wall, it was impossible to bring them together to form hand signs. The Budo had just given him a last medical examination and had told him that Arachimaru would be coming to see him soon. When the steel door to his cell clanked and slowly swung open, he expected to see the snake Sanin standing there. Instead he saw his old friend. The one who had betrayed him and brought him here. Naruto shut the cell door and performed a quick check to confirm they were unobserved before speaking. I Sasuke, he said in a normal tone as though they were meeting on the street. Hello Naruto, Sasuke also did his best to sound calm. I don't know if you'll believe this, but I really am very sorry that you're here now. I never wanted this for you. That's strange to hear since you're the one who brought me here. Sasuke said. I suppose I deserved it though for believing you meant it when you said we would always be friends. I mean Sasuke, then and now. I still think of you as a friend. If that's true then why did you betray me? It was necessary to achieve my goals, Naruto said. Arachimaru wanted your body and ordered me to collect you. And since I need Arachimaru. He spread out his hands in a helpless gesture. So you betrayed me because you were ordered to? Is that strange for a ninja? Naruto answered back. You were Anbu for a while, what sorts of things did you do under orders? And at least I had a reason. Why did Sakura betray you? Sasuke's eyes lowered a bit. I'd like to think she was trying to help me, he said. I don't think she really thought of it as betrayal. So if I tell you I didn't think what I was doing was a betrayal, either would that make it okay? Did you come here to ask forgiveness? Sasuke asked him. Is that why you're here? No Sasuke, I don't need forgiveness for what I've done. Not from you or anyone else. But don't you regret it? Sasuke asked him. Betraying the village and the Hokage, don't you ever wish you could go back and fix things? No, Naruto said flatly. Go back. Go back to what? To be hated. To be leashed. To have people treat me like a monster for something that wasn't even my fault. He shook his head. No thank you, I much prefer it here where people respect me and where I can be someone. Like I told you before Sasuke, it's much too late for me to go back to what I was. But you're in darkness Naruto, Sasuke said pleading. He knew he was doomed, but as long as there was any chance at all of saving his friend he wanted to try. Can't you see that? Naruto simply grinned. Sure I am, where else would a monster like me be? I let the darkness be my light. Sasuke looked at him sadly. I'm sorry I couldn't save you. It was never your job to save me Sasuke. Naruto said. But I thank you for caring enough to at least try. Sasuke wearily nodded. It had all been for nothing after all. So is that it? Is that what you came here to say? No, Naruto said. He looked about the cell carefully and moved closer to Sasuke. Despite his earlier actions, he was still wary. He put his lips to Sasuke's ear and spoke in a low whisper. You're going to die a little bit Sasuke, I'm sorry, but I can't save you. But what I can do is give you the chance to make your death mean something. What are you talking about? Taking his cue from Naruto, Sasuke also lowered his voice. I have a special slow-acting poison with me, Naruto said. It has no known cure and is almost impossible to detect even using medicine. If you were to drink it, then when your body dies it'll kill Orochimaru. Sasuke gave him a sharp look. You want to use me to assassinate Orochimaru and become Odakage. That's right. Sasuke looked directly into his friend's face. You really have become a complete bastard haven't you? You not only betray someone who was a friend to you, but you want to use me to become a cage. I am what Kanoha made me, Naruto said. What circumstances made me? No, Sasuke said. You chose this path on your own. No matter how hard things might have been, everything you've done was a choice. I wouldn't expect you to understand team, a little bitterness crept into his voice. Even though you lost your family you still had everything I always wanted. People loved and respected you, girls chazzed after you. Everyone was always frowning over your bloodline and your talent. How could you know what it was like for me? I know you had it hard Naruto, I know that. But you weren't alone, you had the old man looking out for you, you had me and Sakura and Kakashi, and you even had a girlfriend. You were making friends. You were making a place for yourself. Yeah, and then Saratobi betrayed me, he did not try to keep the bitterness from his voice now. I won the Chunin exams and showed him and everyone my power. I showed him the power I would have used to serve him. And what did he do? What was my reward? He refused to promote me and was going to have Jiraiya seal away my chakra. Naruto, you used the Kaiubi's power in front of the whole village. You deliberately killed both Niji and Gara. How could the Hokage reward you for that? What did they teach us in the academy? That we had to be ready to kill and to die. That we had to become as powerful as we possibly could. What did I do wrong? Sasu could see that Naruto really meant it. Even after all this time he could not see anything wrong with his actions that day. Enough of this, Naruto said. It doesn't matter how we got here. What matters is I am giving you this one chance to make your death mean something. Will you take it? Or do you just want to let Orochimaru have your body? Sasuke weighed the choice for a moment. I'll do it, but only if you promise to do one thing for me. You want me to kill Itachi for you? 
Naruto asked. No, Sasuke said, taking Naruto by surprise. Promise me that if I do this for you you'll spare Konoha. Spare Konoha? Hell no, I'll burn the damn place to the ground. Ask for something else. If you won't make that promise I won't do it. Naruto glared at him. Sasuke looked right back, he had nothing left to fear. I won't spare them, Naruto said. But I'll do this much. When the time comes I'll give them one chance to surrender to me. I let anyone who surrenders and pledges fealty to me live. That's as far as I'll go. That's not good enough, Sasuke said. Naruto's sharp hearing heard footsteps approaching from the hallway. He's coming. Naruto hissed and produced the vial in his hand. There's no time. Take what you can get Sasuke. He eyed the vial. Promise then, swear it, you'll spare anyone from Konoha who surrenders to you and swears to serve you. I swear it, Naruto said hastily. It's a promise of a lifetime. Then give me the poison. Naruto swiftly unstoppered the vial and put it to Sasuke's lips. He swallowed it down in a single gulp. Naruto made the vial disappear just as the cell door opened and Orochimaru entered with Kabuto right behind him. Ku, ku, ku sorry to interrupt, Orochimaru said jovially. But the time has finally arrived. That's all right, Naruto said calmly. I've said what I needed to. He gave his friend a last look. Goodbye Sasuke. Goodbye Naruto. Naruto then silently exited the cell. When he was gone Orochimaru ordered Kabuto to perform a last physical examination. The medic nin used his diagnostic to check every aspect of Sasuke's body. He pronounced him perfectly healthy. Well satisfied, Orochimaru approached him. His hands were trembling in anticipation. Do not despair Sasuke, some part of you will live on in me. As a last mercy I will grant you any wish you may desire. Sasuke eyed him with calm. In that case I wish you to die a very painful death in a very short time. Orochimaru laughed. Ku, ku, ku that I am afraid I can't grant you. Before his eyes Sasuke saw the image of a massive snake. Despite the pain of the transfer he refused to cry out. Though he died with many regrets he died as well as he could and with the hope that his death would at least accomplish some good. It began just a few hours later. Orochimaru noticed he was feeling hot and his legs and arms were sore. A couple hours later he had a fever and his body was racked with aches and pains. He was forced to his bed as Kabuto examined him and tried to figure out what had happened. The news that the Otakage was ill spread quickly and people were fearful. As night approached Orochimaru was coughing up blood and sores covered his entire body. It was obvious to anyone who looked at him that the Otakage was dying. It was then that Naruto arrived at the Otakage's palace with the members of the Sound 7 with him. His first action was to dismiss the Anbu guards and inform them that he and his squad would protect the failing Orochimaru. The guards hesitated but finally obeyed. What is the meaning of this? Kabuto demanded as he was dragged out of the palace with Zabuza holding both arms behind his back. Naruto smiled at him. You're being let go, I already have a medic nin to take your spot and to be honest, I don't think I could ever trust you. Kabuto looked at him hatefully. You poisoned Lord Orochimaru didn't you? Yeah I did, Naruto said. Goodbye Kabuto. At a nod Zabuza reached up with one hand and snapped Kabuto's neck with ease. Orochimaru looked up from his sick bed when he heard the door open. Kabuto where have you been? Do something to cure me. Oh I don't think he'll be able to do anything for you Otakajasama, Naruto said as he strolled in. He took one look at the mess that was the great snake Sanin and grinned. Does it hurt? Can I get you some aspirin? I want your final hours to be as pain free as possible. Orochimaru found the strength to summon a sliver of chakra and make a hand signal activating the death seal. Die. Naruto's eyes widened and he suddenly clenched his chest. Aya. He stumbled forward as though about to fall. Then he stopped and dropped both hands to his sides. Just kidding, he said. Orochimaru stared at him hatefully. You found the seal on your heart and countered it. Of course, I am a seal master after all. He came over to Orochimaru's bedside and smiled down at the helpless ninja. I want to thank you for all you've done for me and thank you for working so hard to create the village of Odo. I promise you that as your successor I'll make it the most powerful village in the world. I curse you, Orochimaru said. May you be damned. That only made him laugh. If I am not already damned I'd be amazed. Goodbye Otakage-sama. He walked out of Orochimaru's bedroom whistling a happy tune. I love it when a plan comes together. Three days after Orochimaru's death Odo held a spectacular memorial and funeral service. The streets were lined with flowers and a huge feast was prepared for the entire village. The service was attended not only by the entire village, shinobi and civilians, but by representatives of all the other ninja villages great and small, with the exceptions of Konoha and Suna of course. Even before the ceremony wild rumors had flown throughout the village that their beloved Otakage and his personal medic Ninkabuto had been murdered by leaf assassins. The authorities in Odo neither confirmed nor denied these rumors. The fact that members of the Sound 7 were overheard talking about leaf assassins did tend to give these rumors additional credence. As the procession snaked its way from the tower to the memorial ground, it was led by the second Otakage. 
Lord Uzumaki Naruto wore black mourning clothes like everyone else. His face held the same solemn sadness that many of the spectators felt in their own hearts. The sadness from the mourners was not feigned. To the people who lived in Odo, Orochimaru had been a great and benevolent leader. He had founded their new village, and many of them had come here and prospered thanks to his brilliant leadership. Whatever his enemies and victims might think many of the people who had come to say goodbye to him had truly loved him. At the memorial ground the oak casket was laid down with care. On its side was the inscription. Orochimaru first Odokijin founder of the ninja village hidden within the sound. Lord Uzumaki was giving his beloved sensei every possible honor and the best possible farewell. As the ceremony commenced he stood before the vast crowd and spoke a few words in honor of his mentor and sensei. The day we say goodbye to a great man and leader. A man of rare genius and vision who created all that we see here today. Though he is gone I am certain his vision will live on in every single one of us. Let us strive and work hard to make Odo the great village Urachimarasama always dreamed of. To commemorate and honor his memory I have ordered seven days of feasting and public games. I have also ordered a statue in his image to be built that shall stand 20 feet tall. His memory shall live on. But that he stepped forward and placed a white chrysanthemum before the coffin. His wife followed next with the various dignitaries doing likewise. After which the shinobi and common citizens came forward one by one to show their respects. May I say Odakaja-sama, that was very moving, the dignitary from I was said. She was a young Kanoichi with black hair, a black shirt beneath armor, black shorts and fishnet stockings. I thank you kuritsuchi san Naruto replied. Of course I know it's easy to speak well of your sensei, she said. Especially when they're gone and you know you'll never see them again. Naruto gave her a sideways glance. Was she hinting at something? A subtle message that the Tsuchikage knew the sort of man he was. He was my sensei and my cage and taught me a lot of things. I know how much I owe to him. Kuritsuchi nodded. Such is your position as Odokage. Very true, Naruto replied. He made me vice cage and his successor because he had faith in me. I can only hope to be as great a man as he was. She smiled. Not many men could hope to match a Sanin, but I suspect you just might. You praise me, he said. It's what I honestly believed and what the Tsuchikage believed as well, she looked over at him carefully. He hopes the close ties between our two villages will continue. Please tell the Tsuchikage that I want that too. Inform him the treaty he and Orochimaru signed will be honored by me. If he likes it, I will add my signature to it as well. She quickly nodded. If you do not object, the Tsuchikage would appreciate that. She carefully looked about to confirm no one else was standing too close. As an added precaution she still dropped her voice. And what of Konoha? You may inform the Tsuchikage that Konoha's fate remains unchanged. She gave another slight nod and carefully stepped away, well satisfied. Naruto stood there looking on as the endless line of mourners slid up to and past the coffin. When the last mourner had paid his respects he and the funeral party would continue onto the field where the coffin would be buried. Of course Orochimaru's body wasn't actually in there. He was going to allow Kabuto to perform one last useful task by taking his master's place in the cemetery. Naruto had plans for the body. It's good to see you again Karen, Naruto said. It was a couple days after the funeral and Naruto was no longer dressed in mourning clothes. He now wore some custom-made robes that had been based on Orochimaru's design. The only difference was that the robes were now in white and orange, as opposed to white and gold. He had summoned his head researcher to his private office where he and Hinata were meeting with her. So far everything has gone smoothly. Except for Orochimaru and Kabuto his little coup had come off seamlessly. No one else had died. He had proclaimed himself Odokage as soon as Orochimaru expired and ordered that all shinobi swear loyalty to him. The Odonin had done so without a word of complaint, there hadn't even been any defections. They saw him as Orochimaru's legitimate successor, and given his own reputation, no one had any delusions that they would challenge him for the post. The business leaders and guild leaders had been just as eager to kneel to him as soon as he told them the tax rates and regulations would all remain in place. The village's economy was running smoothly, the last thing he intended to do was interfere with that. Perrin and her staff were among the last he had called in to swear. She and the researchers she led were a bit nervous. She understood that some of the things they did might be objectionable to some. She didn't believe Naruto would be like that, especially as he had worn a curse seal. With Orochimaru's death however all the curse seals had been rendered inert. What would happen next with her research depended on what Naruto had to say to her now. Perrin fell to her knees without even waiting to be asked to. She cast her eyes to the floor and spoke. I swear my eternal and unwavering loyalty to you, Lord Uzumaki Naruto. I am but your humble and obedient servant. Command me and I shall obey. She looked up when she heard a snort of laughter from him. You humble Karen-chan. I doubt it, but thank you for swearing. It puts my mind at ease. Seeing him in a good mood set her at ease too. How can I serve you Odakaja-sama? She got back up to her feet. He casually motioned to his wife who was standing by his desk. She was not smiling. 
she had on that cool high Uga mask of indifference. The way she stood ramrod straight did come off as a bit hostile. I want you to start working closely with Hinatachan. She is a brilliant medic nin and will help you in certain areas of your research. What areas did you have in mind Odakaji-sama? She liked doing things her own way, but knew just how important it was to keep the person in charge happy. Especially when the person in charge could have you dissected if he wasn't happy with you. Hirachimaru had worked very hard to keep a sterling public reputation once he became Odakage. But where people couldn't see he was an absolute monster. It never even occurred to her that her own test subjects viewed her in the exact same way. Anada will go over that with you, he assured her. I trust you to take care of the scientific side of things while she oversees the parts required. Just follow her lead and I will be happy. As you say Odakajisama. Karen said. What about the prisoners? What about them? Naruto asked. Nothing, she said quickly with a relieved smile. She'd been worried that he might release some of the prisoners Orochimaru had taken. Whole ninja clans had been imprisoned and turned into test subjects. Letting them go would ruin years of precious experimentation and data gathering. Well then why don't you go tell your staff you'll have a new boss soon. And that I'll have them come in to swear to me shortly. Yes Odakajisama, Karen said and left his office. She was very happy. It looked like all the old policies would remain in place. Naruto swiveled in his chair a bit because he was facing his wife. She wasn't showing it much, but his nose could pick up her heavy discontent. You're not happy about this? He asked mildly. No Narutokan I'm not, she told him. I never said anything about Orochimaru's experiments while he was alive. But now that he's gone and you're in charge they should be stopped. They're an abomination. They also led him to create the curse seal, the body replacement technique as well as Ido. The resurrection technique. Think off all the wonders that remain undiscovered and the things that remain to be perfected. But some things shouldn't be learned. She blurted out. Naruto and I have accepted a lot of things since coming here as the price of being with you. I saw the things Orochimaru and Kabuto were working on and said nothing because I knew we had no choice but to stay here. Without his protection we would have been in even more danger than we already were. But things have changed now. She looked at her husband and brought her hands together to plead to him. You finally have the power now Narutokan. Can't we stop doing these horrible things and make this village something wonderful? But it is something wonderful Hinatachan, he said as he came to his feet. He slipped his arms around her hips and pulled her close to him. He pressed her soft feminine body to him and looked into her gentle eyes. Odo is a fantastic village that is only going to keep expanding and growing in power and influence. Don't you like the people who live here? Aren't they good folk? Every bit as worthy as the people who live in Kanoha. We? Well, ye. Yes, that's true. The regular people and even most of the shinobi are good people, she admitted. The way he was looking into her eyes was making her heart beat faster. She loved him so much. She had never for even one moment regretted her decision to abandon her village to come be with him. The village itself is a fantastic place. It's the things that happen in the camps and the secret bases that I want to stop. He smiled at her and stroked the side of her neck with a single gloved finger. He saw her eyes close as a small shiver ran through her. Every ninja village has its dark side Hinatachan, things that are absolutely necessary but are kept hidden. What are ninja after all? We're assassins, spies, and thieves that's what we are. You can't pretend that we're monks or innocent sheep herders. I mean do you really think the other villages don't have places like that too? Even Kanoha. You saw how they treated me. Do you think they wouldn't be just as cruel to prisoners and criminals? And what about Kanoha? She asked. What about it? He answered. He was still smiling, but the tiniest bit of unhappiness was building behind his blue eyes. You know I mean to take revenge on them for what they did to me. I never kept that secret from you. I know, but. Can't you forgive them? She placed her hands on his cheek. Can't you forgive at least some of them? If they submit to me and swear to serve only me I'll spare them, he saw she was going to argue and went on. I promise you Hinatachan, I will give you my word. If they surrender and swear fealty I'll show mercy. He hadn't told her about his last conversation with Sasu Kor about his promise. Making the same promise to her would cost nothing and would make her happy. Thank you Narutokan, she said pleased. She hadn't expected to get even that much. But what about the prisoners and the research? Can't we? He cut her off with a sudden kiss that made her toes curl. Hinatachan, he said once he came back up for air. You do trust me, don't you, Hinatachan? Of. Of course Narutokan, I trust you completely. She meant it too. Despite all the things he had done he had never hurt her. And he had kept his promise from that long ago night that if she went with him he would marry her. No matter how many terrible things he did, he was her darling Narutokan and the only one who had ever truly loved her. Trust me that I know what I'm doing now. He gave her another lingering kiss. I need you Hinatachan. There is no one else who I can trust with this. You will help me won't you? When he asked her like that she knew there was no way she could refuse him. She would do anything for him. I will do it, she said. 
she still had her doubts, but for his sake she would push them aside and do what a Narutican needed. Out in a field far from prying eyes a hundred men women and children had been staked to the ground. They were all citizens of Fire Country who had been captured in a raid for this very purpose. He could hear some of them calling to him for mercy. He could hear some of the children crying and wailing. Neither the pleas nor the tears mattered to him. They weren't people anyway. They were just a means to an end. Removing a glove he bit down on a thumb and ran through some hand signs. Kuchigus no Jutsu. There was a massive puff of black smoke that momentarily obscured the field. When it cleared a gigantic black and purple snake towered over the helpless prisoners. Riding on his snout was Naruto. Naruto. How dare you summon me? You were permitted to sign the snake summoning seal, but only the master summoner is permitted to call on me. Where is Arachimaru? The snake loudly demanded. Arachimaru sama is somewhere in hell I have no doubt, Naruto replied. That makes me a master summoner now. He waved to the prisoners. I will show you the respect that is due you Manda, 100 human sacrifices for each time I summon you. I just want you to acknowledge my new position. His forked tongue slipped out and stirred back and forth letting him taste the air. It was filled with a mouth-watering scent of human terror. Their screams were also adding to his appetite. All right, the gigantic snake crumbled. I'll acknowledge you as the master summoner and the only one permitted to summon me. Show me respect and we will get along fine, otherwise I'll devour you too. Naruto bowed respectfully. I understand Manda. Bon appétit. He disappeared in a flash of smoke and left Manda to enjoy his meal in peace. He returned to Odo well satisfied with his progress. He had all the power and knowledge of Orochimaru's hand. Everything was on track. Hirei entered the Hokage's office without his typical smirk. What do you want? He asked with a snarl. Anzo looked at him without taking any apparent offense. I know that Saratobi was your former sensei and you feel a certain loyalty to him. But I trust you still feel a greater loyalty to your village. Don't ask me too many questions about my loyalty or my opinion of you, he said. Now tell me what you want. Very well, Danzo answered. I want you to make a weapon that can kill the Nine-Tailed Fox. You want me to make a weapon to kill the Kaiubi? Jiraiya asked. Well sure, that shouldn't be too hard. Do you have any other small requests? Maybe while I'm at it I can invent a perpetual youth or turn lead into gold. I am being completely serious Jiraiya, Danzo said. I know, that's what makes it so damn funny. Naruto must die, Danzo said in a calm voice. Kanoha will never know real peace as long as he is out there. And your answer is to have me invent some magical weapon that can kill him. Shikamaru informs me that during their encounter, he was impervious to both the Nara shadow techniques as well as the Yamanaka mind possession techniques. Naruto claimed that he was shielded against all other possessions. Given the fact he is a seal master that is likely to be no idle boast. Combined with the protection of the Kaiubi's chakra and his advanced healing, he is already more or less invulnerable to physical attacks. So how else is he to be killed? Hiraya grimaced, when put that way it was a damn good question. So the solution you come up with is to have me whip up some sort of super weapon that can not only defeat his seals, but his demonic chakra and healing ability. That's something not even Yandane could make. Do you even get what you're asking? Of course, Danzo replied, still calm. I am asking you for a miracle. The same sort of miracle the Yandane provided all those years ago. Don't compare this to that. And why not? As before the village is threatened with utter annihilation due to the power of the nine-tailed demon fox. Now as then we are defenseless against that power and must turn to one of our heroes for salvation. Will you turn your back on Kanoha? As it occurred to you that we wouldn't have to worry about Naruto seeking vengeance if the village had just treated him decently like the old man and Minato wanted. That would also be the case had he been placed within the Anbu from the very beginning as I suggested. You would have made him a living weapon, Jiraiya said contemptuously. He'd have been nothing but a mindless puppet. And so? Danzo replied utterly unmoved. He would have been utterly loyal. He is Yandame's only son. You know that as well as I do, even if you won't admit to it publicly. Minato's last wish was to have the village treat him as a hero. At the very least we owed him the chance at a normal life. That was always Saratobi's argument, Danzo said. And see where that sort of thinking has led us. He was always much too soft and sentimental, a leader must be absolutely ruthless. And I find it a bit strange Jiraiya to hear this argument coming from you now. At least Saratobi acted on his convictions, misguided as they were. You never even met him until shortly before the Chunin exams. Had you been so concerned with his welfare you might have at the very least checked in on him from time to time, especially since I was the boy's godfather. Jiraiya thought. He was very glad that people didn't know about that. The shameful truth was that when Minato and Kishina both died he was too consumed by grief to do what a godfather was supposed to do. The idea of taking responsibility and becoming Naruto's father was just too much for him. And so he'd run. He'd give you the excuse of carrying out important missions for the village. He'd stayed away for years, never returning even to check in. 
He pretended to be carrying out his duty, but the sad truth was that he was doing just the opposite. Running away from his duty to Minato and Naruto. Would things have been different if I had stayed? He wondered if the villagers would have treated the boy in the same way if he'd been officially adopted by one of the Sanin. Would that have been enough to get him decent treatment? Would that have been enough to change things? He would never know, and that was his own personal torment and shame. I made mistakes, Jiraiya admitted in a small voice. As did Saratobi, Danzo replied patiently. It now falls upon me to correct those mistakes. Would you not set aside your personal feelings and help me? If not for my sake then for the good of the village. For the good of the village. Jiraiya echoed dully. Funny how the worst and bloodiest crimes are usually excused with those words. Destroying a traitor and safeguarding the village is no crime. The causes and the mistakes are all in the past now, all that is left to us is to solve the problem. Do you have some other solution? Jiraiya would have loved nothing better than to have given him one. But try as he might, he didn't have one. It was obvious that no matter the reason, there was no chance of talking to Naruto now. No chance that he would ever be anything but Kanoha's enemy. Sadly the Toad Sanin shook his head. Then you agree with me that he has to be destroyed. Yes, he hated saying it, but that was the truth of their situation they were now in. Naruto would never be a friend, and he was far too powerful to be left alone. What did that leave? Then you will do as I ask. But the defeated Sai Jiraiya nodded. All right, I'll help. They were outside a decrepit and run-down brick apartment building. Outside garbage was piled up, and a couple scrawny dogs were digging through to find whatever they could. Nearby a weary old bum sat in the middle of the sidewalk drinking from a bottle. He seemed oblivious to the world around him, more a part of the scenery than an actual person. A few people walking past avoided stepping on him, but otherwise failed to even notice. This was one of the poorest slums in Nagamo, a place you came to only when you had absolutely nowhere else to go. I've seen nicer looking prisons, Zabuza quipped. Naruto silently grinned. He liked the way Zabuza always spoke his mind. It was a refreshing change from all those who mindlessly agreed with him and always tried to tell him what he wanted to hear whether it was the truth or not. Since becoming Otakage a couple months before he'd noticed it was harder and harder to find people to tell him what they really thought. And it hadn't been that easy before when he was only the Kaiubis. Are you sure she's here? As sure as I can be, Zabuza said with a shrug. She's damn hard to track down. So I've noticed, Naruto said dryly. We are fairly certain it is her Naruto-sama, Haku said politely. As per your orders we did not attempt to contact her directly. Naruto nodded. If they had tried to confront her there would have been a fight or she would have tried to run. More likely there would have been a fight and she would have tried to run. The once proud had been reduced to a life in the shadows like some common thief. All she could do these days was run and hide from all those who were so keen on trying to find her. Is this stupid bitch even worth the trouble? Taya asked loudly. Like Zabuza she also was not afraid to speak her mind. Well she is a Sanin, Naruto said. And the last of the Senju and the world's top medical ninja and expert on medicine. That makes her pretty special. I guess they aren't paying medic nins what they used to then, Zabuza jokes. Most of the Sound 7 had a good laugh at that. Well it's hard to find work when you have to spend all your time hiding from your creditors, Naruto said. All of you wait here. He then leapt down from the roof of the building. He landed before the front door and simply walked inside. She was all alone now. She had no one left in her life anymore. Shizun had stayed by her side for a long while. She had tried to get her to change her ways without success and had stood by her much longer than she should have. But finally even she had despaired and given up. She'd said her goodbyes and returned to Kanoha to begin a new life. Tsunade didn't blame her. How long could you expect someone to put up with babysitting an old drunk like her? Eventually Shizun had been forced to give up. She tried to convince her to return with her right up until the moment she left. Alone in her room she made a rude noise and reached for a bottle. Return to Kanoha. For what? So that she could be reminded of all the things she'd lost. To return to the village that had taken her two loved ones. No. No, there was nothing in Kanoha for her anymore. In the end a tearful Shizun had left to return to Kanoha alone. That was how the 60-year-old Tsunade had found herself all alone in a cramped roach-infested, moldy apartment. She tried to drink from the bottle, but found it was disappointingly empty. She was surrounded by empty beer and sake bottles. Looking around clearly, she wondered if they were all empty. If so she wondered if she had enough money to go out and get more. If not she would have to scrounge around to find some sort of work. In spite of her age she was still immensely strong physically. She could change into a rough-looking man and find some manual labor. It didn't pay much, but it would be enough to take care of the rent here and get her more booze. Things like food and other necessities she didn't worry too much about. It was also much safer for her than trying to find work as a medic. In what had to be one of the all-time great ironies, she, the world's acknowledged top expert on medicine, could no longer practice her trade. Even with a hinge it was impossible. 
The moment word spread about some unknown medic nin got out there would be a swarm of bounty hunters and investigators looking for her. She had racked up debts totaling just under 50 million. She had borrowed money from banks, nobles, governments, and even loan sharks. Now all of them were looking for her and demanding repayment. Those to whom she owed at least a million would also be demanding she hand over her sole remaining asset to them, the shod eyes necklace. She looked at the crystal hanging by its chain about her neck. With it you could buy two gold mines and the mountains on top of them. Even now she could sell it and have enough to pay her entire debt off and still have more than enough left over for a comfortable retirement. Why don't I then? She muttered to herself. She wasn't sure she had enough to buy herself a bottle of rot gut, but she had a fortune literally in the palm of her hand. All she had to do was sell it. Despite asking the question out loud she knew she could never part with it. She was ready to die alone and in poverty first. It was all she had left of the two people she had loved the most. Nawaki, her little brother, and Dan, the one true love of her life. Selling the necklace would be like truly saying goodbye to them forever. That was foolish. They were both long dead now, but she couldn't bear to part with it just the same. It was at that instant that a polite knock sounded from the front door. She glanced at the door nervously. Rent was not due until the end of the week, and she had not ordered anything. These days unexpected visitors are always unwelcome. She glanced at the windows and began mapping out escape routes in her head. She was ready to leave with nothing but the necklace and the clothes on her back. She'd done it before. As if picking out her thoughts a voice came from the door. Please let me honor Tsunata-sama. I give you my word all I want to do is talk. You should also know I have a ninja waiting outside. If you try to run they have orders to bring you down with as much force as is necessary. I would like to avoid that. I want things to remain pleasant. Pleasant, right, just who the hell are you? Bill collectors didn't usually bother asking to chat. I am Lord Uzumaki Naruto, Otakijin holder of the Nine-Tailed Demon Fox. Uzumaki despite being constantly on the move and in hiding she still knew about the events connected to him. Sliding back a dead bolt she opened the door just a crack in order to get a look at him. He was dressed in a ridiculous orange and black outfit that included gloves. He had a hideite with a musical note stamped into it. On each cheek were three whiskers like scars and he had spiky blonde hair. But what really caught her attention were his eyes. They were the exact same shade of blue as Minato's, and looking at his face he looked just like a teenage Minato. There was no mistaking just whose son he was. He stood there and smiled at her, making no effort to force his way in. May I come in? She stood there a moment just staring. Then I finally stood aside and opened the door wide. All right, come in. Looking around at the tiny apartment Naruto felt an odd sense of nostalgia. The trash on the floor, the mold, the rickety furniture, even the dishes piled in the sink, all reminded him of his old apartment. The only real difference was that it would have been cups of instant Raymond covering every nook and cranny, instead of empty bottles of liquor. Well I was always the village pariah, she was. Is a Sanin. How the mighty have fallen. He was very careful to mask his thoughts as he entered, but there was no way Tsunade could not know they were there. She knew how this pigsty had to reflect on her. Since Shizun's departure she had stopped caring about appearances. I hope you'll excuse the mess, I wasn't expecting company. She waved to one of the chairs by the table. Will you have a seat? Sure Naruto sat and sat down at the small table covered by empty bottles. He really wasn't bothered by the mess or by the surroundings. One of the slight advantages of having grown up poor. Thank you for agreeing to talk to me. I would have sent someone to set up a meeting, but I trust you understand why I didn't think I could do that. You were probably afraid I'd vanish, Tsunade took the other seat across from him. Yes, Naruto answered blandly. He'd done his research, and Tsunade had a reputation for being almost painfully blunt. He figured she would appreciate it if he was straightforward. From the very slight approving nod she gave him he thought he guessed right. From her place across the table she surveyed the man who was causing so much worry. I knew both your parents, she said cautiously. If you'd like I could tell you about them. Hmm, well if you don't mind I'd like to find out about my mom. Tsunade could keep from lifting an eyebrow in surprise. What about your father? I don't need to hear about him, Naruto smiled as he spoke, but there was a clear chill to his words. I heard more than enough about the great Yandane back in school. All right, she leaned back in her chair, never letting her eyes leave him. Is it true you killed that snake Orochimaru? I know the official story is he died of an illness, but no one believes that. Yes I did, he answered directly. I hope that doesn't anger you, my killing your former teammate. She shrugged. We stopped being teammates or even friends a long time ago. His being dead makes the world a better place. I'm glad you think so. The two of them sat there in a momentary silence. Naruto still had the same intense and passionate nature he always had, but his time with Orochimaru had taught him the value of patience and of silence. He counted it as a small victory that Tsunade was the next one to speak. So just why are you here Yuzumaki? What does Kanoha's greatest enemy want to talk about? He gave her his friendliest smile and spread his hands. 
Isn't it obvious? I want you to join me. Akashi sensei Bakashi halted and looked up from his book. Beneath his mask he gave her a hidden smile. Hello, Sakura. Sakura stared for a moment. It was odd to look at his face and see two eyes staring back at her. The fact the eyes were mismatched added to her sense of the bizarre. One was a pale gray, while the other was a muddy brown. The fact his hideite was worn straight across his forehead now rather than at an angle also seemed odd. Hello, Sensei, she managed a weak smile and did her best to pretend her whole world had not fallen apart. If. If you have some time would you mind getting some tea with me? I was hoping I could talk to you about some things. He'd known she'd come to talk to him sooner or later. He knew just what sort of questions she would ask him too. He shut his book with a snap and put it away. He wasn't sure if she would really want to hear his answers, but he owed her at least that much. That sounds great Sakura, let's go. No, Tsunade replied instantly. Naruto continued to smile. He hadn't expected anything else for an initial reaction. No. Just like that. Aw, oh, come on, at least let me tell you what I have to offer you first. Let me guess, she said, not bothering to hide her scorn. Money, power, and anything else I want. Is that about right? You say it like it's a small thing, pointedly he looked about the room. For someone hiding out in a place like this don't you think a little money and power sounds good? I'm prepared to pay off all your debts and give you a place of honor in my right hand. Come to Odo and serve me faithfully and I'll give you total authority over the medical corps, you can shape into whatever you like. Tsunade put her head back and laughed. Serve you faithfully? You've got balls to say that to me brat. Your father could have said that and I might have listened. I'm not my father, Naruto said coldly. I know, and that's a real pity, he'd be ashamed to see you now. Would he be more or less ashamed of how Saratobi and the village treated me? She gave a slight nod. Oh from what I hear there was plenty of shame to go around. Believe me. I lost my faith in the village a long time ago. I know how Kanoha devours its ninja, what happened to you was bad, but it's not my concern. You're lucky I feel that way too, otherwise I might have attacked you. You'd have died if you had. She'd heard tough talk from people before and normally dismissed it. From the man who had slaughtered most of Kanoha's Anbu at the Valley of the End and took out Orochimaru with ease, she decided a little caution was in order. If you're so powerful, why are you bothering to recruit me? Orochimaru-sensei had a high opinion of you, Naruto replied. I only ever heard him talk that way about three people. You, Saratobi, and Ichiha Itachi. I figured anyone who could impress him was worth chasing after. What about Jiraiya? Orochimaru always thought he was an idiot and too easy to distract. Naruto chuckled sourly. I've run into him a few times too, and I can't say I was impressed either. Gureya is an idiot and a pervert to boot, Tsunade agreed. However he is as deserving of the title Sanin as me or your old teacher. What he lacks in cleverness he more than made up for in heart and guts. Sure, Naruto agreed in a voice that clearly said he didn't. Anyway, well I'm flattered by your offer, my answer is still no. So unless you were serious about wanting to hear stories about your mom I think you should go. With respect to Lady Tsunade, you still haven't heard my full offer. I still have much more I could give you. Like what? Secret a chest full of gems. My own army. She shook her head. None of that interests me. I didn't think it would, Naruto answered with a hint of smugness. If you could be satisfied so easily, someone would have done it a long time ago. What you want though is much harder to provide. You want the people you love most to come back to you. You want to see your precious little brother Nawaki and your lover Dan again. That's the real reason you still have that necklace isn't it? Because it's a reminder of them. You'd rather live in Squalor and drink yourself to death than part with that last reminder of them. Tsunade brought her hand up and slapped it down on the table. It shattered into pieces. She then reached out and grabbed Naruto by the collar hauling him to his feet. Her other hand glowed with chakra and was balled into a fist. How dare you? She screamed into his face. Who the hell do you think you are to bring them up and talk about them like they were chips on a poker table? They've been dead longer than you've been alive. The only reason I don't beat you to death right now is because I once loved your parents. Get the hell out of here before I lose my patience. Naruto made no effort to pull away from her or defend himself, at least not deliberately. The red chakra flowed out of him and formed a cloak around his body as it always did when he was in danger. His absolute defense required no conscious thought on his part. Tsunade grunted as she was forced to let go of him, as the chakra covered his front and freed him of her grip. Despite her anger she took a step back. She could feel the immense power flowing off of him. She was certain any ninja within at least a mile would be able to feel it as well. The cloak formed only a single tail. Forgive me Lady Tsunade, he said, and gave her a bow that was in no way mocking. I didn't mean to offend you. When I brought up Nawaki and Dan I wasn't trying to mock you. I can give them back to you, not exactly as they were, but close enough. I can make them return to this world with all their memories and feelings of love for you. They won't be truly alive, but it will be them in every way that matters. What the hell kind of con are you trying to pull? She demanded. 
what, you think you can create some kind of illusion, and that will be enough to make me serve you. What I'm offering is much more than something cheap. Arachimaru created a technique that could force the spirits of the dead to return to the land of the living. This hasn't been perfected yet, the effects are only temporary, but I can make them permanent eventually. I can give you back the people you love. I don't believe you, she snapped. You'd say anything to try and trick me. He nodded. I wouldn't expect you to believe something like that without proof, that's why I brought some with me. As if at a prearranged signal there was a knock at the front door. Otakage. Are you alright? Just fine Haku. He'd expected that at some point he would release some of his demonic chakra either on purpose or in self-defense. He'd left instructions of what to do when that happened. Is our special guest with you? She is Otakaji-sama, Haku replied. She is most eager to speak with Tsunada-sama. Naruto looked back at a somewhat worried Tsunade. I have someone here who can convince you that what I say is true. Will you allow her to come in? I assure you that she is no threat to you. Who is it? She asked. An old friend of yours, someone you haven't seen in a long time. He refused to say any more. She eyed the door. She had a sick feeling in the pit of her stomach. Somehow the thought of what might be behind that door scared her more than having the Kyubis not five feet away. And she come in Lady Tsunade. She doesn't have that much time. What is that supposed to mean? Naruto merely grinned at her. He may look like Minato, but he reminds me more of Arachimaru. Fine, whoever it is let her in. Naruto went to the door and opened it himself. Come in, come in, Tsunade is eager to see you again. The young woman of no more than 16 or 17 stepped tentatively into the room glancing about before spotting Tsunade. She was dressed in a green and brown jacket and dark grey trousers. Her weapons pouches and the grace of her movement proclaimed her a kinoichi. As she stepped inside and got a good look at Tsunade a wide smile of relief covered her face. Tsunade. It's so good to see you. Arms open she ran over to her without hesitation. Seeing her face Tsunade paled. Me. Mia. Hi Ugamiya. It's so good to see you. The girl exclaimed and wrapped her arms around Tsunade as she hugged her. Everything's been so confusing. I don't know what's happened to me. The last thing I remember was being in a huge battle against Hanzo and his men in Rain Country. The next thing I knew I was here. What's going on? Is Aki okay? I lost track of him during the fighting. Aki had been her fiancé and another member of the Hyuga clan. Both he and Miya had been part of the Leaf Army that had fought in the battle where Tsunade, Hirachimaru, and Jiraiya had received the title of Sanin from Hanzo himself. Hanzo had so honored them because they alone had survived. Every other Leaf Nin had died that day. Including Aki and Miya. They were both more than 20 years dead. He. He's fine, Tsunade croaked. As she did so she forced Chakra to pulse through her system, desperately hoping this was some sort of. When nothing changed she was forced to admit it was not. She hadn't thought about Mia in more than a decade, but looking in the girl's face it was like being back in time. This was Hayuga Mia, of which she was certain. Do you remember the shopping trip we took a couple weeks before the battle? You mean in that little town in grass? The one with the ivory carvings you liked? I remember you were thinking about buying that little cat carving, but didn't want to spend it. That. That's right, she answered with a sickly grin. That town had been annihilated less than three months later, with all the civilians there slaughtered. The only people who'd been present with her had been Dan, Aki, and Mia. It was impossible that Naruto could know about the little ivory cat she'd been interested in back before he was ever born. So do you believe me? Naruto asked. She looked at him past a girl who was still hugging her and nodded. Yes. Glad to hear it, he said, and made a single hand sign of negation. Ah. Mia cried out in sudden fear. What's wrong? Tsunade asked and began casting a diagnostic to find out what it was. The problem quickly became self-evident as Mia's body began to revert to ash. The girl sent her friend a last frightened look before falling at her feet. As Tsunade watched, Mia's form crumbled away to reveal the body of a stranger, a lifeless corpse of some ninja covered in ashes. Naruto explained. Like I said, this is only temporary and can be used only once per soul. Your grandfather and granduncle were already summoned by Orochimaru and can never be summoned again. He deliberately left out the fact that his father had also been summoned previously. That's why I didn't try to summon the Waki or Dan. I'll wait until I have perfected, it may take years, but I'm confident I can do it. When that time comes I'll bring them back for you. Tsunade stared at him open mouthed. the revelation of what she had just seen was starting to hit her. It really might be possible. She might really see them again. She looked back at the body at her feet. This requires a human sacrifice to work, doesn't it? That's right, Naruto replied. For a human soul to be brought back one has to be sacrificed. Of course I'll need lots of human test subjects in order to perfect it. Part of your job will be to assist me in that. I hope you don't object, every great achievement requires some cost after all. She stared down at the corpse and then at Naruto. She understood the devil's bargain he was offering her. As a medic, she had always hated war and pointless death. 
when she'd heard about Orochimaru's experiments she'd been disgusted. She thought him a monster for being able to use human beings as nothing but experimental fodder, exterminating countless lives, all for the sake of knowledge. She'd known that she could never do the same. Now if she wanted to see Dan and Nawaki again she would have to wade through human blood. Naruto wasn't trying to trick her, his offer was plain and clear. She understood that if she accepted it, she would never be able to refuse anything he commanded of her. No crime would ever be too hideous or revolting. She would walk in Orochimaru's footsteps and do it willingly. The path that would someday bring her loved ones back to her. Will you serve me Lady Tsunade? He held his hand out to her. Will you proclaim me your lord and follow me of your own free will? Perhaps if Shizune hadn't gone she would have found the strength to say no. Perhaps if she weren't all alone. Perhaps if she were still practicing medicine and helping people rather than spending all her time hiding and getting drunk. And perhaps she was just making excuses. Perhaps she would have given the same answer no matter what once she realized what he was offering was possible. I will, her voice was weak, barely above a whisper, but loud enough for him to hear her. Swear it then, he commanded. She fell slowly to her knees and lowered her face. I swear to serve you in all ways and in all things for as long as I shall live. My lord Yuzumaki Naruto. Good, he said, sounding extremely satisfied. Now up on your feet Tsunade, we have a long way back to Odo and a lot of work ahead of us. Sakura stared down into her cup of tea. So Naruto wouldn't have done anything if he hadn't been attacked by Shikamaru and the others. Her voice was empty and lifeless. That's what he said, Kakashi told her. Though he only said that after Root put in its appearance so he might have said it only to cause Sasuke and me mental anguish. I'm not sure how far I would trust anything he says. You and Sasukakin and Lord Siratobi must have believed some or you never would have gone to him in the first place. Kakashi looked about the crowded tea room to see if anyone might have overheard. Lower your voice Sakura. Some things are very dangerous to say. If the fifth Hokage heard you say that you'd be arrested immediately. Sakura gave a weary nod. As the new Hokage Danzo had gone out of his way to disguise his minor coup. The villagers and most of the ninja believed Saratobi had finally decided to retire. It was not hard to believe, the man was well into his seventies after all. Danzo had been a very powerful man in the village for over two decades. His selection as fifth Hokage had been slightly surprising only because he was as old as Saratobi. Most felt he was just a placeholder until someone younger could be chosen, but he was strong and intelligent even at his advanced age. Most people felt the village was in good hands. He would definitely not be happy with anyone connecting Siratobi with a mission sent to Naruto. So it really was my fault, she said in a tired voice. She might have started crying, except she thought she was completely out of tears. Sasuke died because of what I did. That's not necessarily true Sakura, remember Naruto had already violated our agreement by having the Sound 7 there. Kakashi said. He likely intended to betray us all along. Sasuke understood that was a real possibility the moment we agreed to go and meet with him. You can't know that though. Maybe he would have listened. If I hadn't told Shikamaru. He reached out and took her hand. Sakura, you need to be strong. Sasuke would want you to be strong. Though he was upset with her for what she had done, she was the last of his students he could still help. She pulled her hand away from him and got to her feet. Thank you for telling me the truth Kakashi sensei I think I'll go now. He saw a defeated look in her eye that set off alarm bells. Sakura, don't blame yourself and please don't do anything stupid. She gave him the palest copy of a smile. Don't worry sensei, I'm fine. A month later the Odakage was at his desk going over a request he'd received for an audience. What do you think? He handed the letter over to his newest advisor. Tsunade took it and read through it carefully. Her arrival in Odo had struck the ninja world like a bolt from the blue. In spite of her many years wandering about acquiring debts her name had remained one of the most respected in the elemental lands. She remained the last of the great Senju clan and the granddaughter of the man who had founded Konoha. She was still a Sanin and the number one medical ninja in all the world. Wealthy men from all over the continent were already busy scheduling appointments to see her for various medical bills. Leaders both great and small were impressed that she had chosen to join Odo and the village's reputation was enhanced. Likewise, these same leaders assumed there had to be something fundamentally wrong with Konoha to drive her to abandon the village her grandfather had created. Overnight the Leaf's reputation began to suffer, and there were serious questions as to how strong the village really was. Anzo and his village struck back with claims that Tsunade had to be acting under some sort of coercion, that she would never willingly betray the village. They spread stories that she was under some type of mind control or being forced to serve in order to pay off her huge debts. A smear campaign was begun to portray her as a less drunk no longer to be found sober. These efforts by Danzo were destined to fail as many important people traveled to Odo and met her. Anyone who met her in the flesh soon saw she was hale and healthy and as intelligent and willful as she had ever been. It was also clear she was acting of her own accord. That was all for public consumption. 
Behind the scenes she was greatly disturbed by the facilities and programs that had been established by Orochimaru and then kept in place by Naruto. The things she saw sickened her. Yet she would not refuse to work for him. It was just as she'd known it would be when she made her agreement with him. Now along with everything else he also had her acting as an advisor. Is this a serious request? She asked first. It's much more likely to be just another ruse. That letter was delivered to me through the ambassador from Cloud, Naruto informed her. He vouches for its authenticity. If it's real then it's likely an assassination attempt. Naruto surprised her by shaking his head. No, if they were going to try anything like that they would use back channels and insist on a meeting in a neutral location. Like what happened with Kakashi and Sasuke. If they ask for this right out in the open and agree to come here, then they'll be bound to act in good faith. If they were to try and use this to set up an attempt on my life, it would completely destroy their diplomatic credibility. Their agreements wouldn't be worth the paper they were written on. Even among ninjas there are limits. Maybe they're hoping you'll use it as an excuse for an assassination and have your reputation destroyed. Tsunade said. It wouldn't surprise me, the Otakage said. Those people still see me as either an idiot or mindless brute. You're not actually going to accept their offer are you? Naruto laughed. Are you kidding? Of course I'm accepting it. How can I say no to seeing a dear old friend again? From what I heard the last time you met a couple of dear old friends, one died and the other lost an eye, she said dryly. I hope this meeting goes a bit better. I've known him a long time, and while feelings aren't exactly good between us, I still respect him and don't want him to be killed. He and I went through a lot together before things went bad. I won't hurt him, Naruto promised. I'll treat him with even more honor than a Sanin deserves. I just want to talk to him face to face about a few things that's all. At about the same time the Otakage was making his reply, Nara Shikamaru had arrived in the ninja village of Aim and was delivered to a secluded temple where he was to meet the living god who ruled over Rain Country. The interior of the temple was hardly luxurious and did not seem very accommodating for a leader of a ninja village, never mind a god. Shikamaru was delivered to an audience chamber and told to wait there. It was not long before a figure with orange hair and multiple facial piercings entered. He was dressed in a black robe with red clouds. I understand you are here as a representative of the 5th Hokage Danzo to deliver some proposals. Shikamaru turned to face him dressed in Anbu armor and his deer mask in place. He bowed and then spoke. I am. I trust I am speaking not only to the leader of Omegakur, but to the criminal organization Akatsuki. I am indeed the leader of the Rain Ninja. As for the other, I will not deny I have connections to Akatsuki, though I do not claim the title of leader. You wouldn't be wearing that if you didn't want to stress you were part of Akatsuki, Shikamaru thought. And you are its leader whether you choose to admit to it or not. I have come bearing an offer on behalf of the Hokage. He drew a scroll from his pocket. It bears his signature and seal. Shikamaru performed a specific hand gesture to deactivate it that had been placed on it. Had anyone else but him touched it the scroll would have burst into flame. What was written on the paper with the Hokage's hand would have gotten him executed if it fell into the wrong hands, no chances could be taken with it. Shikamaru handed the document over to the leader of Akatsuki. The man broke open the wax seal with his thumb and unrolled it. He read what was written without comment or any sort of obvious reaction. At last when he was done he rolled it up again. Your Hokage requests an assassination and an extremely difficult one. The conditions he adds make it even more so, not only is the target a powerful ninja he asks that it be performed within a ninja village during a formal conference. A very difficult task. Which is why the Hokage is willing to pay such a high price. 50 million, half immediately and half payable upon completion of the task. The man looked at the rolled up scroll for a moment. Then gave just the slightest of nods and put the document away in his robe. Tell your Hokage to transfer the funds. On behalf of my organization I accept this contract. We're going to help Danzo. Conan asked, utterly bewildered. After what he did to us. How can you help him? I am not helping him, Payne answered. This act will seal his fate in Kanohas. Conan stared at him. I don't understand. He drew the scroll out and held it in his hands. Trust in me, this will aid us in our revenge, and I find it fitting to accept his blood money in payment of a service that will ruin him. When all the preparations had been made the special envoy from Kanoha arrived at the gates of Odo. As agreed he had with him only two Jonin bodyguards. He was greeted at the gate not only by Tsunade, Yuzumaki Hinata, and the Sound Seven, but by the Otakage himself. Normal protocol would call for the envoy to be escorted to the tower, where he would be granted an audience. By meeting him at the gate Naruto was granting the man a special privilege and showing him an unusual amount of honor. The envoy bowed upon meeting him face to face. I thank you for receiving me Lord Yuzumaki Naruto Otakajisama. Resplendent in his white and orange robes, Naruto easily returned the bow. Welcome to Otagakur Lord Hiruzen Saratobi, 3rd Hokage of Kanahagakur. I welcome you and promise no harm shall fall upon you. The initial formalities out of the way the two men eye each other. 
As Siratobi was now a retired leader of the village, he was no longer permitted to wear the hokage robes. He was instead dressed in black ninja gear. Naruto looked him over carefully, then gave a broad smile and noted his main impression. I remember you being a lot bigger. To a 12-year-old I am huge, Siratobi replied. That brought out a snort of laughter from Naruto. I must admit I was not sure what sort of reception I would receive. Naruto knew exactly what Siratobi was referring to. Afraid you'd have a little accident on the way here. I confess the thought had crossed my mind, Siratobi admitted. You and the Sand Nins are the ones who keep sending assassins after me. In the entire time since I left the village I haven't sent even one of my ninja after anyone inside Konoha. I've done my best to behave honorably. Does that include what you did to Sasuke and Kakashi? Siratobi asked coolly. Naruto just wagged a finger at him. Uh, old man you don't get to call me on that when I was attacked by the Anbu before I did anything. I know how much you and Konoha love to play the part of an innocent victim, but we both know that meeting was a sham from the start. The only question was whose trap would work better. Don't complain to me just because yours failed and mine didn't. The offer I made was genuine Naruto, he sounded weary and heartsick. I never would have allowed it to go forward if I had known you no longer felt a connection to your former teammates. What are you talking about? I let Kakashi live didn't I? Do you think I would have done that if I didn't still have a little bit of feeling for my old team? Then what about Sasuke? I considered Sasuke a friend, Naruto said. But I had to use him to achieve my goal. Naruto continued to smile as he said that and there was nothing in his voice or manner to suggest he was bothered by the admission. To use others to achieve your ends was a part of ninja life. Even so, Siratobi found it hard to stomach. That is not the way of the leaf, Naruto. We do not sacrifice our own so casually. Naruto tilted his head a bit as he stared at the other man. Our own? I haven't been a leaf nin in a long time. He decided to look past the two guards at the two jonin who accompanied him. One he didn't recognize, but the other was familiar. Kiba? Long time no see. I almost didn't recognize you without Akimaru. I haven't seen you since kicking your ass back in the preliminaries. The Inuzuka let out a low growl. I think you should know that the only reason I don't rip you apart is that I'm under orders not to. In an instant a perfect circle of kunai fell around him. All the other members of the Sound 7 were sending him warning looks. Naruto took no offense and laughed it off. Well I can see you haven't changed any since the academy. I assume you have some secret messages for Hinata. Hiba was able to keep any expression of fear or worry from his face, but Naruto caught the slightest whiff of it in his scent and knew he'd hit the mark. You can give them to her. I'm not going to stop you or ask to read them first. You can also tell the Hayuga that if they want to contact her, they can use the regular post. Why don't you go ahead and talk to her? I'm sure she'd love the chance to catch up with an old teammate. I would, Hinata spoke up eagerly. Hiba glanced at Siratobi, and at the third lord's light nod, he went over to speak in private with her. Why don't we head over to the tower now? Naruto asked politely. Yes, let's, Siratobi agreed. As Hinata and Kiba wandered off to talk, Naruto and Siratobi began to casually walk down the street side by side. Tsunade walked with them, looking unhappy and grim. The Sound 7 spread out wide to give them plenty of room and to keep watch over them from every angle. As they walked, Naruto's bodyguards did not try to clear a path for them. Without being ordered to the civilians and Odonin they came across automatically provided a wide berth. Siratobi was caught off guard by the lack of fear in the people they passed. Again and again, civilians and ninja alike would call out to Naruto with a friendly wave saying hello or wishing him a good morning. For his part Naruto would always respond, answering and returning the greetings. Sama. A group of young children approached them with no fear at all. A little girl of perhaps seven or eight was out in front of them calling to him. Come and play with us. Laughing, Naruto nodded. Sure you Karachin. He ran through some hand signs and a shadow clone puffed into life. The children all gave a loud cheer as the clone went off to play with them. Naruto could see the old man's amazement. They're orphans, he explained. We have the best run and best funded orphanage in the elemental lands. I play with the kids every single day and I make sure they're being well treated and well fed. I know how rough it can be so I try and make sure none of them are ever lonely. He sounded very proud. I see. I will admit to being most surprised at the way the people accept you, Siratobi replied carefully. Their affection seemed genuine. Naruto had no trouble understanding what lay underneath. You shouldn't believe your own propaganda. What were you expecting? The whole village cowering in fear. Them running away at the very side of me? Why would they? I am their cage, their leader and protector. A cage lives to guide and protect his village. Why on earth would they be afraid of me? This is how the villagers and Nin and Kanoha treated you. Did you really expect it to be different? His smile remained, but his eyes took on a bitter cast. People don't hate me here, this isn't Kanoha you know. No one here goes around thinking that Kaiubi is suddenly going to burst out of me. It is good that the people have faith in you, Naruto, Siratobi said quietly. 
but even you will admit there are reasons why I might wonder about that. His face twisted in distaste. I know something about your research facilities and the sorts of things that go on there. Those projects have nothing to do with the village or the villagers. Everything that touches a cage must affect the village to some degree. Sure, Naruto said. Now tell me that in all the years you ran the village you never once did anything you'd be ashamed to tell to the civilians. Siratobi grimaced slightly. I will not claim to have been any sort of saint. It is impossible to be the leader of a ninja village whose purpose for existence is violence and not commit certain crimes. When it was for the benefit of the village I did not hesitate to commit all sorts of cruelty. Naruto nodded, he was glad the old man was at least being honest about how things really were. Assassinations, kidnappings, arson, espionage, blackmail, the list goes on and on doesn't it? I know how it is. Every cage has to wear two faces. The one they show to the people and the one they have in private. Growing up I always saw you as a kindly grandfather the way most people did. I would never have imagined you sitting in your office going over lists deciding if a certain monk or businessman needed to be killed or needed to be threatened. The truth is a cage can't afford to be a really good person. Perhaps not, Siratobi admitted. Yet we can still hold ourselves up to a certain ethical standard. Some things are wrong and simply cannot be excused. Oh? You mean like butchering an entire clan and then allowing your loyal ninja to take the blame for it? Like letting an innocent child suffer years of abuse because it's simpler than trying to force an entire village into acting like decent human beings. Like sending assassins out after a fellow cage. I have done none of those things, but you have. It seems to me where you draw that line is all a matter of personal choice. Don't condemn me for doing what is best for my village just as you did. Siratobi appeared fearful. He glanced over at Tsunade and spoke in a low voice. How? How did you know? You mean about the Ichiha? Naruto answered in the same low voice. Don't underestimate my intelligence network. I have eyes and ears in the most interesting places. I see, when he returned to Konoha he would need to talk to Danzo about going through and investigating not only the entire government. Their security had obviously been badly compromised. What happened at that time was very difficult. I felt I had no choice but to. I'm not Sasuke, you don't need to justify anything to me, Naruto told him. My point is just that the village would be shocked to know that the kindly Hokage was the sort of man who could have women and children massacred right inside the village. Every ninja village has its dark side and its secret places. Don't try to pretend I'm somehow unique. Other villages don't use human beings for experimentation. Naruto laughed. Now we both know that's a lie. Prisoners and criminals get used for that all the time, even in Leaf. The only difference is that I'm doing it more efficiently and on a bigger scale. That is not something to be proud of Naruto. You must shut down those vile camps of yours and end whatever revolting research you are pursuing. Naruto came to a sudden stop and turned fully on Siratobi. Or what? He demanded. You'll send me to my room without supper. You'll send assassins after me. You'll declare war without actually doing anything. Don't threaten me, old man. I'm not the one who came here to beg for mercy. You are. Don't push your luck or you won't be going back. Naruto was yelling at the top of his lungs. Siratobi stood there calmly facing a furious Naruto without so much as blinking. Tsunade came over to him and very carefully touched his arm, drawing his attention away from Siratobi and on to her. Please calm down Otakage, I'm sure the old man didn't mean any offense. Naruto took a deep breath and visibly reined himself back in. When he looked back at the former Hokage his eyes were considering and judging. Naruto knew he'd made a very big mistake. The leader of a great village didn't suddenly lose his temper like that. Talking to the old man again after all this time was bringing back a lot of hard feelings. He resented like hell that lecturing tone, Saratobi was not here to act as his protector. He was here to beg, nothing else. Sorry about that third lord, he gave the man a respectful bow. Please forgive my rude outburst. It's quite alright, Saratobi murmured. They began walking again. The request Danzo sent me specifically asked for a private meeting between you and Tsunade, as well as one between us. When we get to the tower why don't I let you and her talk? That would be much appreciated Otakajasama. The rest of the way to the tower they chattered about unimportant things. The meaningful words would wait until later. Anada and Kiba were walking together down a side street. If they were being followed, Kiba couldn't pick out any particular scent. Here Hinatachan, this was written for you by your sister Hanabi. She's the head of the clan now. Thank you Kibakin, she took the sealed letter and slipped it into a pocket. Aren't you going to read it? Kiba asked in surprise. He'd expected her to tear it open in front of him. I'll read it later, Kibakin. I already know what's in it. Hanabi would be writing to me as clan head not as a sister. I'm sure she will remind me of my duties to the clan and village and tell me I should try to escape. Kiba nodded. He hadn't read the thing, but he'd been given a verbal message from Hanabi to deliver in case the letter was confiscated. Hanabi and the rest of the clan still scream at the top of their lungs that you were kidnapped and are being held here against your will. She grinned at her old teammate. 
Do you think that too, Kibikin? Are you kidding? As many times as I saw you faint. She giggled. I know you were in love with him. I am in love with Kibikin. I am his wife now, Yuzumaki Hinata, and I love him now more than ever. He killed your father Hinata, and my mother too, Kiba spoke with a snarl. How can you still love him after all the things he's done? Please don't pretend he was not forced to abandon Konoha. All Naritakan ever wanted was to be treated like any other ninja of the village. You know what it was like for him. You saw how the people were. Then after winning the Chunin selection exams the one person he trusted most betrayed him. Wow Naruto's got you well trained, how long did it take you to get all that crap memorized? Kibikin. Please don't be nasty. He killed my mother, Kiba repeated. And what would your mother, my father, and the others have done to him? They would have killed him or captured him. He did what he had to. Hinata knew the truth of what had happened that day, but Naruto had told her never to tell anyone of it. Even if she had, she knew Kiba would not believe it and just thought she was making excuses for Naruto. An Adichin, Kiba said, trying his best to sound like the easygoing boy who had been her teammate. There are more important things at stake than just your feelings. The future of Konoha is in the balance. You need to make a choice. If it's impossible for you to escape then at least give me what information you have about Naruto and about his plans. Hibikin, please don't ask me to betray my husband. Naritakin has loved me and protected me. He has made me happier than I have ever been. In spite of the things I have to do for him. I love him more now than I ever have, certainly more than I ever loved my father or sister. More than you love Konoha and all your friends. More than me, Shino and Kurinai. Yes, she answered with no hesitation. Much more. Don't ask me to choose Kibikin, because I already did, a long time ago. He looked at her with real sadness. You've changed Hinata. She nodded. Yes I have, and it's all thanks to Narutakin. Without him I would still be nothing but the shy quiet girl I was. I like that girl, Kiba told her sadly. I never did, Hinata said. She was always unhappy and crying when she was alone. I like myself now, Kiba. And I guess there's nothing for us to talk about is there? If you want to talk to me as a friend about old times and about our lives then we can. If all you want is to pour poison in my ear, then it's best for you to just go. Miserably he nodded and stopped walking with her. He stood there and watched her go. She didn't once hesitate or turn back. The Tower of Sound was as far as he could see an exact copy of the Tower of Fire. Except that it's 50 feet higher, Naruto said. I am not surprised, Sirotobi said. He always wanted to outdo everything that came before him. Naruto and Tsunade both nodded at that. In any case the floor plan is exactly the same, Naruto said. Why don't you and Tsunade use the conference room on the second floor? Whenever you're done, come up to my office and we can talk. You don't object to my being alone with Tsunade? Saratobi asked. Nope, I don't think you plan to overpower her, and I'm not afraid she'll turn on me. He sent Saratobi an amused grin. Oh, and you should know every room in the tower is monitored except for my offices. If you want real privacy you can use a seal, I don't mind. Naruto and his bodyguards headed down the corridor leaving Saratobi and Tsunade on their own. Saratobi watched him depart with sad eyes. I always suspected he would make a great leader someday. Does seeing you were right make you happy or sad? Tsunade asked. Let's go to the conference room so that we can sit down and talk. Tsunade noted that he had avoided the question, but did not press him on it. In the conference room Saratobi performed a series of hand signs to activate a ceiling that would interrupt electronic monitoring devices and block any scrying. The secretary who was looking through an ordinary peephole and listening was not affected. Tsunade took a seat across from him at the table and spoke first. I honestly don't know what you think you're playing at old man. No matter what you say my answer is going to be no. Tsunade, he lowered himself into his chair. The long journey had left him stiff and sore. I am much too old for this, he thought. Sadly there was no one else who could perform this particular task. I know that you feel the village robbed you of those you loved most, but I beg you to remember all the ordinary and decent folk of Konoha. Remember the place that was home to you and was the life's achievement of your grandfather and granduncle. I know the losses of Nawaki and Dan were tragic, but a ninja village cannot survive unless its ninja are ready to make the sacrifices necessary to protect it and its people. Nawaki and Dan were both leaf shinobi, and they understood this and were ready to make that sacrifice. Don't talk lightly of sacrificing old men, it really pisses me off. Tsunade said angrily. My grandfather, my granduncle, my little brother, the man I loved, and the whole Senju clan are gone. All for what? So that Konoha can exist and make money by killing and hurting people. What did they die for exactly? So that fire country could have its own ninja village. She shook her head violently. Some things just aren't worth the price. You did not always feel that way, Saratobi reminded her gently. There was a time when you believed in the village and what it stood for, when you fought to protect it. You mean back when I was young and naive, she shook her head. These are the same arguments you used when I first left. They didn't work then, what makes you think they would work now? 
the situation now is fundamentally different from what it was then, Saratobi told her. Back when you originally left it was to wander and escape your memories. You were turning your back not only on Kanoha, but also on the entire ninja world. That is no longer the case. By abandoning your home village and serving Odo and its Odakage you have betrayed Kanoha. She shrugged. If you want to place me on the missing nin list feel free. Just make sure any hunter nins you send after have their wills in order. Tsunade, can you at least explain to me how you can justify this decision? When you originally left it was because you rejected the philosophy of shinobi and of the villages. How can you resent Kanoha but serve Odo? Do you truly believe them to be somehow better? No, she said flatly. I am long past seeing anything noble in the work of the villages. She shut her eyes for an instant and allowed a small shudder to pass through her. I will even admit to you that serving Naruto sickens me at times. I don't know what he was like before, but he reminds me of Orochimaru. Clever, patient, and utterly ruthless about getting what he wants. Do you remember when he spoke of wearing two faces? The face you saw today with the villagers was genuine. He really does want to protect Odo and its people. But he had another face he didn't let the world see. When I look at that face I can well believe he is Kaiubi. There's a part of him that really enjoys killing and hurting people. That part of him truly is a monster. How can you serve him then? Saratobi asked. He just did not understand it. My reasons are selfish, she answered. He has promised me something I want in exchange for my services and my loyalty. If this is about his paying your debts, do you think I would get involved with this for money? She asked with a sneer. Then what is it he is offering you? Danzo assures me Kanoha will offer you anything if you return to your old home. Sadly she shook her head. I'm sorry old man, but it's not something that you have to offer up. What is it then? I'd rather not say. Tsuritobi gave a weary sigh. Tsunade, please reconsider. Even when we disagreed I never had anything but the highest respect for you and for your beliefs. You told me once that the village's goal should be to preserve life, not take it. You battled against me to create a medical corps because you wanted to make healing and saving our ninja a priority, even if it meant weakening the village's striking power. You have always believed in saving lives. You must know the sorts of things that are happening in the research facilities of rice country. If you serve Naruto then you are supporting those abominations. Can you accept being a part of that? She actually felt relief at the fact he did not know just how deeply involved she was in those experiments. As an expert medic, she had been given charge of conducting experiments using chakra and. It sickened her, but she still conducted the experiments and then neatly wrote down the results. She told herself they would have happened if she were not there anyway. She told herself she had to do it for Nawaki and Dan, that returning them to life justified any price. I know, but I can accept it. Saratobi noticed as she went through the motions of dry washing her hands. He didn't think she was even aware she was doing it. Ninja were trained to give no sign of what they were feeling. For a ninja, her ability to do such a thing was a clear sign that whatever she was doing was weighing heavily on her. Can you really accept being a part of all this? Sure, it doesn't bother me at all. She again acted as though washing her hands. What will you do if he chooses to attack us? Saratobi asked in a hushed voice. The day he abandoned the village he killed many innocent people by blowing up various buildings. He has never made any secret of the fact he longs for vengeance against not only me, but against all of Kanoha. What will you do if he decides to march out against us? Will you stand by and do nothing? Will you fight at his side and kill helpless women and children? I will do whatever he tells me to, she answered looking very unhappy. I wouldn't like it, old man, but I've decided to do anything I have to get what he's promised me. Then it would appear Naruto is not the only one who has taken after Rajimaru. He looked and sounded like a disappointed father. She squirmed in her seat and felt like a 12-year-old again. That's a low, low old man. Perhaps, but it seems accurate to me. Tiredly he pushed his seat back and stood. Thank you for talking with me Tsunade. I think I will go and talk to Naruto now. Out in the countryside of rice four figures in black robes and red clouds moved about in the darkness. One of them looked out at the land with the Sharingan and calmly wondered what he would say to his father and other relatives when he met them in the land of the dead. I thought you would like to know, the ninja in the Anbu mask said to Kakashi. He nodded his head and gave a false smile. Thank you, I do appreciate it. The Anbu waved a hand in acknowledgement and was gone. Sakura, he said beneath his breath. I ask you not to do anything stupid. Disappearing from the village definitely counts. When the door to his office opened Naruto waved Suritobi over to the chair in front of his desk. Offering the former Hokage a seat was a kind gesture on Naruto's part, but he did not rise to his feet as he would have for an equal. As soon as Saratobi had seated himself Naruto began with a smirk. This kind of brings back memories doesn't it? You and me in a cage's office. Though the roles are reversed of course. As I recall when you were in my office it was usually because you were in some sort of trouble. Naruto's smile had a little bit of cruelty to it as he replied. Or else I was there to beg for some favor. That is why you're here now isn't it? 
to beg. Go ahead. I think I'd really enjoy hearing it. I am not here to beg Naruto, Saratobi spoke with a dignified tone. I was sent here as a special envoy in hopes of establishing a dialogue with you and entering into negotiations. I know the official reason why you're here. He picked up the original message and waved it about. The fifth Hokage seeks an accommodation with the leader of Odo for a restoration of normal relations between the two villages. He spoke from memory without bothering to look at the message. That bastard Danzo doesn't even acknowledge me as a cage. I am sure the slight was made unintentionally, Saratobi replied smoothly. It was a blatant lie and they both knew it, but diplomacy often required blatant lies. I return to normal relations I assume he's referring to the fact that we're technically at war with each other. Though you'd never know it, since the Leaf doesn't have the guts to do anything beyond sending assassins after me. I decided that an actual invasion of Rice would have led to untold numbers of casualties, and that restraint was called for. Given your actions in the village and at the Valley of the End, declaring war once Odo decided to shelter you was unavoidable. You didn't attack because you knew you'd lose, Naruto told him. You still wanted me dead. You just knew you couldn't win an actual war. That was not the case Naruto, Saratobi calmly replied. Many within the clans were screaming for an invasion to destroy you and Orochimaru both. Suna would have marched with us to avenge Orochimaru's murder of their Kazakiage. Did you know that the Kazakiage and Orochimaru were planning a sneak attack on Konoha? It was to take place during the finals of the Chunin exams. Saratobi slowly nodded. If Naruto knew then there was no reason to try and keep it secret. We'd had signs that something was in the air and that it might be an attack. We did not learn of the details until much later. Did you know that Gara was the one tail the attack was supposed to start simultaneously with his transformation at the arena? Orochimaru called it off at the very last minute because I killed him and because he realized he would be up against the power of the Kaiubi. I saved Konoha because of what I did that day. He shouted at him. I saved all of you and what was my thanks? To be betrayed by the one person I trusted the most. How could you do that to me when I trusted you? His fists came down slamming into his desk. I should have been treated like a hero damn it. Saratobi was shocked as for the second time he witnessed Naruto completely losing his temper. Having survived countless attempts on his life and years as Orochimaru's apprentice, he'd expected the boy to have better emotional control. He did not allow any of these concerns to appear on his face. I did not know that at the time of Naruto, he answered easily. I never considered my actions to be any sort of betrayal of you. You must realize the effect of releasing so much of the Kaiubi's chakra in the midst of the village in the most public manner possible. That coupled with your brutal killings of both Gara and Niji convinced many people that the fox had gained control or at least influence over you and that we were all in danger. Had I not acted to curb their fears, I likely would have had the civilians and the shinobi calling for your death or imprisonment. Hearing Saratobi talk so calmly and rationally only drove the point home to Naruto that he needed to calm down. A cage didn't keep losing his temper like this. Seeing him again really wears on my nerves, it's like all the old wounds are getting reopened. He took a deep breath and forced himself to sit back and at least look relaxed. He lowered his head. I apologize for my rudeness, please forgive me. Of course. Naruto took another deep breath. You didn't know I'd saved Konoha. What you did know was that I'd won the Chunin selection exams and hadn't broken any of the rules. Gara slaughtered three Rain Nin and crippled Rock Lee. Niji tried to kill Hinata and came way too close to doing it. Neither of them were punished. But like always I was the only one who was made to suffer. You refused to promote me even though I'd earned it, and what was worse you were going to leash me. You were going to seal away most of my power to make everyone else happy. Tell me Saratobi, can you name me one other ninja who was ever punished for being too strong? If you can name me just one, maybe I'll feel a little better about things. Saratobi knew there was no such example available. From the moment a shinobi began to train he was taught to become as strong as possible and to bend every effort towards that goal. I am very sorry Naruto. The only thing I can tell you is that you were a special case. Tell me about it, he said with bitterness in his voice. What a shame special doesn't always equate to good. Naruto, I know I made mistakes. If it were possible to go back in time I would do many things differently. I can only offer you my apologies and seek to learn from those mistakes. Saratobi rose to his feet and gave the seated Naruto a formal bow. I am sorry Naruto. Do you think bending your back and speaking a few words makes any difference at all, old man? I can offer you nothing more than Naruto. How about your life? Naruto asked him. What would you do if I told you that if you cut your own throat open for me right here and now I'd make peace with Konoha? If my life would bring peace to my village, then I would gladly offer it to you. Naruto gave him a ghost of a smile. He hadn't expected any other answer. Forget it. Your scrawny neck isn't worth nearly that much. You want to know the terms I'm willing to offer Konoha? Yes, that is the reason I am here. Two words. Unconditional surrender. Is that a joke Naruto? Nope, he said, sounding utterly serious. 
have Danzo surrender unconditionally to me and offer me his place as Hokage. I'll hold the titles of both Otakage and Hokage and rule both villages from here. I'll send Sunate there to act as my regent. All Leaf Nins and all civilian residents will be required to kneel before me and publicly swear allegiance to me. All ninja who refuse will be treated as missing nin and expelled from the village. All civilians who refuse will have their property confiscated and be expelled from the village. I'll treat all those who kneel and swear the same as I treat my people here. Those terms are completely unacceptable, and I am authorized to reject them on behalf of the village. Hein then, those are the best terms you will ever get from me. If you reject them there is nothing more to discuss. This is not how you negotiate with Naruto. It is when you have all the power, he replied. Just remember I can crush the leaf like that if I want. He snapped his fingers. If you truly believe that, why have you not done so? You talked about Kanoha not waging a real war, but Odo has not done so either. Naruto shrugged. I can be patient when I need to. When the day comes that I do decide to move it won't be a war, it'll be a massacre. That's why you should accept my terms now. I'll only show mercy if you submit to me. If I have to conquer the place I'll burn it to the ground. Saratobi felt a chill fall over his heart. He did not doubt that Naruto believed what he was saying. Think about it for a few days and enjoy my hospitality, Naruto said, sounding like the cheerful fun-loving boy he had once been. Very well, he said and got to his feet. Even if there was little hope he would try to get Naruto to soften his terms to something that might at least seem reasonable enough to pass on to the Hokage. Sakura was chained down to the table, hands, feet, elbows, knees, hips and neck. Except to turn her face she would hardly be able to move. The seals were chalked into the floor and onto notes attached to her. The last time he'd seen her she'd been 12, she was 18 now and a very attractive woman. She was dressed in traditional black ninja gear, except for the hood which had been removed. Naruto noted she had let her hair grow long, he liked it. You and the guards can go. Aku bowed his head in obedience. Are you certain, Odakajisama? Well we're in Kanoha I'll be going by Hokage, and yes, I'm sure. There could be other assassins Hakajisama, you have many enemies here. That's true everywhere, Haku. It's fine, I can take care of myself. Hi, Hakajisama. Haku bowed and led the guards out of the room. Naruto was dressed in orange and black robes that went all the way down to his ankles. His hood was up, there were black gloves on his hands, and a fox anbu mask covered his face. Naruto strolled to the side of the table to allow Sakura to look up at him without needing to strain. She looked up into his mask with those green eyes of hers, her mouth was a flat line. He gave her credit for appearing calm. Her scent was nothing but terror and sorrow. Naruto still thought her eyes were pretty, back in his academy days they were what had first drawn him to her. I have to tell you sakura black is not your color. Red suits you a lot better. Her lips remain sealed. Bet you wish you could just scream baka and punch like you used to, huh? I'd do a lot worse than punch you if I could. Naruto wagged a single finger at her. Shame on you, sakura Is there any way to talk to your Hokage? You're not the Hokage. I'm pretty sure that I am sakura You don't become Hokage just because you say you are. No, Naruto agreed. You become Hokage when you conquer the village and they surrender to you. You haven't won yet. I believe in the will of fire. They'll find a way to stop you. Naruto tilted his head slightly. They? Who are they? Who do you think is going to stop me? Danzo is dead. The council is dead. The Anbu are dead. The clans are smashed. Half the leaf nins are dead. Who's left? As long as there's even one ninja who believes there'll be someone to fight you. Someone like you I suppose. She glared up at him but didn't answer. I don't want to hurt your feelings, sakura But if they're counting on you or someone like you to take me down, the village is screwed. Here, let me show you something. From one of the pockets of his robe Naruto pulled out a kunai. There was a sharp rise in the fear scent and eyes locked on the knife. Underneath his mask Naruto grinned. He held his left hand out palm up, then slashed the kunai straight down towards it. Before the tip of the blade could touch his glove that section of his hand was covered in red chakra. Naruto tried to stab himself in the forearm, the thigh, the belly, and even the chest. Each time the red chakra would pop out of his body to shield that section. I never turn off the Kyubi's chakra. I have an absolute defense. Did you honestly think you could assassinate me? Itachi, Kakashi, Jiraiya, and Pain all failed, and they were all shranked. Naruto stabbed up towards his throat as hard as he could. The red chakra again blocked it. I can't even kill Sakura. What chance would someone like you have? He threw the kunai away. Why did he even bother to still carry them? How many years had it been since he'd actually had to use one in combat? He supposed it was something done out of habit. He seemed to be doing a lot of things that didn't really have a point. Why was he bothering to call himself Hokage? It had been his dream for a long time, he'd wanted the village to acknowledge him. Well they did. He'd had all the survivors, shinobi and civilians, kneel and swear allegiance to him. His troops patrolled the streets and garrison Kanoha now. 
This village was his, and he didn't need a stupid title to make it so. For just a moment Naruto thought about Suratobi. He still didn't understand why the old man had died trying to protect him from Itachi. The third had betrayed him and died for him. Why? In the world of ninja you did not die defending your enemy. As much as he hated Suratobi, he could not remember the old man without remembering all the times the Hokage had brought food or visited to tell him a story or just listen to him whine. Those small acts of kindness that had meant everything to a lonely orphan. Naruto couldn't make himself forget the reason he had loved the old man in the first place. Naruto could never think of the old Hokage without that mix of fondness, love, and bitter resentment. As silly as it was, Naruto suspected he wanted the title of Hokage as much for Saratobi's memory as for himself. Every defense has a weakness, Sakura spoke. No one can be invulnerable all the time. The key is always to find the weak point and exploit it. Is that you talking or someone else? She snarled and tried to look fierce. Well. As fierce as a girl with pink hair can when she's chained down to a table. Your mouth moves and I swear I could hear Shikamaru's voice. Sakura did not respond. He survived the battle. Obviously, he was smart enough not to attack me when I had eight tails. My men confirmed that a jonin fitting his description was spotted afterwards. He wasn't one of the ninja who surrendered and swore though. Would you have let him live if he had? Naruto shrugged. No. Since I killed Jiraiya he's been the one leading Kanoha's efforts against me. He's not a real threat like Jiraiya was, but there's no reason to let him live. He didn't abandon the village, did he? He's still in Kanoha. I'll never tell you. You don't need to, the answer is written all over your face. You're worried about him because you know he's dangerous. Not really, I'm just Uro. You can do whatever you want to me, but I won't betray him. No matter how much pain you inflict I'll never talk. Naruto gave a throaty laugh, it didn't sound completely human. People always say that before the torture sessions start, but never after. You wouldn't be any different from Sakura, believe me. But I'm not going to. What would be the point? There's no way Shikamaru would have trusted you with his plans or location, and I don't enjoy torturing people, that was always Orochimaru's thing. I'm actually a very reasonable person. You're a monster. True, but that's beside the point. Naruto reached down with his right hand. Sakura flinched and shut her eyes. As his gloved fingers slowly went through her locks she gave a little whimper. It was hard to believe this was the same girl who had punched him through walls back in their school days. I always liked your hair, sakura Even though he couldn't feel it he let his finger run through her hair for a bit. If you want to beg me for mercy, now would be the time. Go ahead, tell me this isn't the real me, and that deep down I'm a good man. Remind me about Team 7 and the good old days. Sakura forced her eyes open and looked up into his masked face. Do you remember our first real mission? That little priestess girl, Shizuku. Naruto's eyes widened and he pulled his hand back. I remember. You cried for her when she died. It was now Naruto's turn to be silent. It was the first time I really understood what it meant to be a ninja. The first time I ever saw people killed or saw someone interrogated. I saw you use your red chakra, though Sasuke and I didn't know what it was. You ripped a man's heart out of his chest, and you threatened to kill every single person in that village. At that moment I was scared of you. I'm sure it was quite a revelation, the clumsy idiot turning out to be a monster. I didn't think you were a monster, Naruto, not then. I was shocked at how powerful and ferocious you were, but what I remember just as clearly is you crying for that little girl, when no one else would, not even her mother. I thought. I thought this is what a ninja is supposed to be. We can do terrible things when we need to, but we can still be good people. We can still care. Naruto stared down into her green eyes with his red ones. Is this where you tell me it's not too late for me to change? We both know it's much too late. You betrayed the village, you murdered Sasuke, you've performed forbidden and burned whole countries to the ground. You are drenched in blood, nothing you do could ever make you clean again. Uh, well, I won't tell you you're wrong. It isn't making me feel real merciful though. After the things you've done I wouldn't expect mercy. I just wanted to remind you of your humanity and of a time when you still cared about others. Tell me something Naruto, is there anyone who still matters to you? Yes, but it was a short list. Hinata. Sakura's eyebrows jumped. But she's already, don't, he growled. Don't say another word unless you want me to show you just how much a human body can endure. I only need you to be alive. She swallowed audibly. What are you going to do to me? It's funny how you brought up Shizuku, you're going to be a sacrifice, like she was. If it helps, at least your death will have meaning. Do you think that was a comfort to her when her mother killed her? Naruto reached down and picked up the kunai he discarded earlier. He didn't need it as a weapon these days, but it still had its uses. Maybe it did, but she wasn't a ninja. Remember the very first lesson Aruka ever taught us? Sakura nodded. Every ninja must be ready to kill or die for the sake of the village. Even though she had tried to kill him, Naruto didn't hate Sakura. Hatred had become his food. 
hatred of the villagers, of Suratobi, of Jiraiya, of Danzo, of Itachi, of Akatsuki, hatred of the whole damn world, sometimes. The constant need for revenge, to destroy the ones who betrayed him, had pushed him forward from one battle to the next. He couldn't even remember if there had been a time when he wasn't filled with unlimited hate and rage. Maybe back when he was still young and dumb enough to believe the world could be fair. Sakura had somehow avoided his list. She'd been a brat to him in the academy, but he'd gotten over it during their short time together on Team 7. She'd surrendered and sworn like most of the other survivors. Naruto had planned to leave her alone. But she'd come into the tower and tried to kill him. You couldn't let that sort of thing go, it made a bad example for people. I'll give you a clean death Sakura, no torture, and no unnecessary pain. Thank you. For the first time the fear smell died down. What was coming from her now was resignation. She must have known from the moment she set out this was the likely outcome. A quick death was the most she could hope for. I'll even grant you one last act of kindness. When Sasuke and Kakashi came to meet me in secret, you betrayed them to Shikamaru, didn't you? She nodded as much as the chains about her neck allowed. I thought I was helping Sasuke, I knew you couldn't be trusted. You've always blamed yourself for what happened haven't you? Yes, if I hand, it made no difference, Sakura. The second I agreed to the meeting I was planning to capture him. If you hadn't told Shikamaru it would have just made it easier for me. Really? Yep. She let out a breath and seemed to relax. Thank you Narutakan. You're welcome Sakurachan. The runes and inscriptions and tags were already in place. He began to do it. The inscriptions began to glow and the various tags started to shake and flap. Naruto took the knife and cut Sakura's throat, right above where the chains held her in place. The blood squirted up and the sharp coppery and salty tang stung his senses. There were no last words or tears from Sakura, just a choking gurgle as the light exited her eyes. The tags wrapped themselves around the boy. Dusted ash materialized and covered Sakura's corpse, hiding it from view. The material shaped itself into a different form. Naruto watched patiently as he worked. The ash and dust thickened into a grayish skin. The face, chest, arms, legs, all transformed. Small cracks formed along the surface. Dry as he might, Naruto couldn't make the new form perfect. There were always imperfections. This was called impure world reincarnation for a reason. Naruto was painfully aware of the limitations of this technique and that it was not possible to truly restore the dead to life. Eventually it was complete. The eyes opened and someone stared up at him in confusion. Naruto gently patted his shoulder. Welcome back, Sasuke. There was a crack that ran from just below Sasuke's left ear to his jawline. He was sure that there were other blemishes beneath the clothing Sasuke was wearing. Who are you? Sasuke's eyes darted about the room. The chains jangled as tried to free himself. I'm Naruto. The eyes snapped back and the mouth fell open. Where am I? What? You're feeling confused. That's normal, just give it a moment. Sasuke paused in his struggles. His eyes lost focus. Arachimaru, he was going to try and take over my body. Yes. So he failed. No, it didn't. What do you mean? Sasuke demanded. You died more than four years ago. Sasuke's mouth went slack and his eyes widened. Then how? I brought you back with a forbidden word called Ido. You're not truly alive anymore, Sasuke. You don't have a beating heart or blood flowing through your veins. You'll be able to remember things from your life and you have a functioning chakra system. You'll be able to use it. Is that why you brought me back? To use me as a tool. Naruto shook his head. You're here because I missed you. I just wanted my friend back. You're the one who killed me, Naruto. Orochimaru delivered the blow, but you captured me and gave me poison. Yeah, sorry about that. Sasuke glared at him. Would it help if I told you I kept the promise I made to you? We're in Konoha, inside the Tower of Fire. There were a lot of deaths when I took this place, but when they surrendered I did spare them. So you really did attack the village. That's right, Naruto growled. It was war and I ended it. The only reason I didn't burn this whole place to ash was because of the promise I made you. Are you expecting me to give you credit for that? Not really, though it would be nice. How could you do it? You grew up here. Kanoha was your home. You knew the people who lived here. Yeah, I know them, I know them better than you ever did. Trust me, it made attacking this place easy. Don't think for a second Kanoha was innocent. The village attacked me every way it could. After you attacked them first. Bullshit. I never asked to be persecuted or treated like a monster. Even Saratobi treated me that way in the end. And Jiraiya. Hinaruto abruptly cut off. He didn't want to remind himself. He what? He committed war crimes, he did things that were worse than anything I've ever done. I don't believe you. That's fine, I'm not really expecting you to. You blame me and I blame the village. In the end what does it matter? I didn't bring you here to convince you I'm right. I just want us to be friends again. You expect me to just forget everything and pretend it never happened. I could compel you to if I wanted. Hell, I could make you dance a jig if I wanted. But I won't, what would be the point? 
I already have tons of folk who kiss my ass and tell me whatever I want to hear. I want you to be you, Sasuke. There was no reason to bring you back if I didn't give you your free will. Sasuke stared up for a long while. Take that stupid mask off, I want to look at your face. You might not like what you see. I've sort of. Changed. I don't care. Hein, Naruto mumbled. Try not to get weirded out, okay? Naruto pulled down his hood and slid off the mask. Sasuke got a clear view. His eyes widened and gave a low whistle. Wow. You're even uglier than you used to be. Funny, maybe I will have you put on a show for everyone after all. Naruto's nose and mouth had stretched out into a snout. His eyes were red and slitted. The hair atop his head was still blonde and spiky, but the rest of his face and neck were covered in bright red fur. What happened to you, Dobe? I was constantly dealing with assassination attempts and ambushes. So I finally decided to just keep the Kyubi's chakra active all the time. It protects me, but as you can see, there's a price. Naruto pulled off the glove on his right hand. Each finger ended in a claw. I even grew a tail. Sometimes if I catch a rabbit scent I have an overwhelming urge to go hunt it down. I worry that someday I'll be with my man and suddenly go running off on all fours. Stop using the chakra then. Naruto gave a weary shake of his head. It's too late for that. I can't shut it off, my body has become dependent. Without Kyubi's chakra I'd die. There was a look of deep sadness on Sasuke's face. I'm sorry. The dead man pities me, is that really what I've come to? Don't be, there's nothing to be sorry about. Naruto quickly slid the glove back on. Then put the mask back and lifted his hood. Everything in life comes with a price, this is just part of it. There's more. Sasuke asked in disbelief. Naruto chuckled. A lot has happened since you died, Sasuke. Do you think you can forgive me and be friends with the most hated man in the whole world? If I say no, are you going to kill me? No. Sasuke considered it. The fact he was chained down to a table didn't appear to concern him. I want to see the village. Let me walk through Kanoha and then decide. Fine. Naruto began to free him. Kanoha had changed. Damage was scattered all across the village. There were broken windows and boarded up ones. Walls had sections of brick gouged outer holes punched through. Sasuke saw half a billboard advertising cola, the other half was completely gone. Entire blocks were nothing but rubble. You couldn't even tell where the original buildings had stood. A lot of the village didn't seem to have electricity. There were stores and apartment buildings open without a single light on. Even though it was the middle of the day the streets were nearly empty. The people who were out walked with their eyes deliberately cast down and their shoulders hunched. They walked all the way over to one side or another. They did everything they could not to draw attention to themselves. As Sasuke went he spotted a total of 11 patrols of Odonin in their black and white clothing. They had their heads up and were the only ones to use the middle of the streets. When one of their patrols went by everyone else got as far away from them as they could. Seven of the patrols approached him, but they would spot something that would cause them to stop and reconsider. As Sasuke went, a handful of people appeared to recognize him. The usual reaction was for the person to quickly look away and hurry their steps. Sasuke felt he was about as welcome as the foreign ninja. The entire time he was out he did not spot a single leaf nin. Naruto didn't like meetings. They always seemed like a waste of time to him. You sat around a table and had to listen to others drone on about things you usually didn't care about. His experience as Odakage had taught him to bear with it, they were a necessary evil at times. Fortunately he didn't expect this one to take very long. It was the initial meeting of the new council. The old one had died along with their Hokage, with one exception. Ayuga Hanabi was 14 and trying very hard to fill out her chair. Her hands were resting on her lap and her chin was jutting up at an angle. It was a good effort at trying to appear regal and indifferent. It was too bad for her that her scent had a sour smell to it, nervousness and uncertainty mixed in with a healthy dose of fear. Except for himself and Tsunade, everyone at the meeting was afraid. Naruto didn't recognize any of the representatives from the clans. All the kids who'd been in the academy with him were dead. Most of them are dead. These were cousins or distant relatives who had survived and come here to represent what was left of their clans. Hayuga, Akamichi, Aburam, Yamanaka, and Inuzuka were all in attendance. The seat for the Nara clan was empty. Apparently all the Naras who'd survived the battle had chosen to flee rather than surrender. Chances are the remaining members were already in. Thank you all for coming, Naruto got things underway. Having grown up here, I know how important the clans have always been to the village. I want them to continue to play a part in Kanoha's future. As your new I want your clans to continue to provide ninja as well as be a source of stability. Of course, there are going to need to be a few changes. The council members stirred slightly in their seats. None of them actually spoke. First off, Lady Tsunade is appointed vice cage. When I leave Kanoha she will remain here and rule in my name. Tsunade shifted in her chair and rubbed her hands together. Naruto had known her long enough to know that meant she wanted a drink. Yamanaka Tita spoke. Pardon me, Hikaju-sama. You won't be remaining with us. 
she was Ino's mother. Naruto had killed both Dita's husband and only child. Naruto realized she had every reason to hate him. But if he only accepted representatives who loved him he doubted he could fill even one seat. Naruto gave her credit for sounding civil and keeping her face empty. But her scent gave the truth away, there was a burst of fragrant eagerness. He picked up the same from all the other members, the strongest from Hanabi. Well, I can't really blame them if they hate my guts, just so long as they fear me. That's right. Once I feel the village is secure I'll be leaving for Suna. Needless to say, I expect all of you to keep the peace, Naruto gave one of his not quite human chuckles. If the village tries to rebel once I'm gone, if I have to come back here and conquer it again, I promise none of you will enjoy it. Uncomfortable looks flashed between all of them. Were they already conspiring to betray him? Let me make something really, really clear, Naruto leaned back in his chair. The village surrendered to me, and all those still living here have sworn fealty. That means anyone who rebels against my authority is automatically guilty of treason. And I'm sure you all know what the penalty for treason is. I am certain no one present would contemplate any such action, Hakaja-sama, Aburam Tenzu said. Like all the members of his clan he wore dark sunglasses and spoke in a monotone. His scent was one of worry. Naruto couldn't tell if that was because they had been plotting something or just out of general concern for what he might do. Ergato, Tenzousen, your reassurance puts my mind at ease. Naruto considered having Dita and Tenzu placed under arrest and handed over to the interrogators. There wasn't any evidence against either of them, but given what his life had been like Naruto tended to see conspiracies everywhere. He supposed that would have made him paranoid, except for the fact that so many people really were out to get him. Next, Naruto continued. As a sign of my great interest in the clans, I want each of you to provide me with five members who are too young to have begun attendance at the academy. They will be relocated to Odo, where I will allow them to live at the palace and receive instruction from me on the various ninja arts. They'll remain with me until they achieve the rank of Genin, at which point they'll be allowed to return home. My hope is that this program will help all of us to better understand one another. The stony stares told Naruto that none of them had bought a word of it. Then Yuzuka Kauda gripped his hands into fists and let a low growl exit his throat. You expect each of us to just hand over five children as hostages. I never use that word, think of them as guests. And what happens to these guests if we do something you don't like? Naruto folded his hands in front of his masked face. Who knows? I suppose it would depend on how bad the offense is. But so long as you are loyal to me there is nothing to worry about. And what would you do if we refused to give you our children? Kauda snarled and bore his teeth. Beneath his mask Naruto smiled. Usually all he ever dealt with was subterfuge and deceit. Everyone lied, everyone had hidden intentions, everyone schemed and plotted. Dealing with some good honest hatred was refreshing. Well, to start with, I'll kill you. Then I will send my ninja to your compound and they'll butcher every single person there. Ninja, civilians, servants, guests. Everyone, hell, I'll have all your dogs killed too. Then I'll send out my hunter nins to track down and eliminate any person with a drop of Inuzuka blood in their veins. No matter where they hide or how far they run, my people will find them and kill them. And when that's done, after I've killed every last person in your clan, I'll burn down your estate and piss on the ashes. Naruto never raised his voice as he spoke. The words were friendly and carefree. Inuzuka and the rest were staring back at him. Does that answer your question, Kaudasan? Inuzuka Kauda dry swallowed and answered in a whisper. Yes. Good. Next, the Hyuga cage bird seal is declared forbidden. Anyone who activates it or places it on a person is sentenced to death. Also, the cadet and main branches of the Hyuga clan are hereby dissolved. All members are to receive equal rights within the clan. Any member of the Hyuga who wishes to be emancipated from them will be allowed to leave them and to serve as a regular ninja. Anabi's jaw dropped and her mouth hung open. You cannot do that. And yet I have. What you are suggesting goes against all the traditions of my clan. Naruto gave an indifferent shrug. I've never been big on tradition. My clan has been separated since before the village was founded. Some must lead, some must serve. I agree, Naruto nodded. You will serve me by making sure my order is obeyed. Oh, and I want at least three of the guests your clan gives me to be from the former cadet branch. But, moving on. Next. Naruto laid out several more new laws, all of them aimed at stripping away some of the authority and privileges the clans had always enjoyed. Naruto intended them to be a source of ninja with unique bloodlines and a symbol of unity and strength for the villagers and those living abroad. The council members understood exactly what he was doing, but there were no more objections. Perhaps they'd hoped he'd at least want them to be advisors to influence some of his decisions. If so, Naruto made it clear that wasn't going to be their role. He would never trust any of them. The clans had all served Danzo faithfully and had fought as hard as they could up until the moment they realized their only choices were surrender or death. They weren't his partners in ruling Kanoha, they were servants, like everyone else in this village. 
When he finished giving them the new rules they would live by he dismissed the council. An Abyssin, I want you to wait a moment. She froze as she rose from her seat. The others sent her looks of concern as they departed. Hanabi was quickly alone in the room with Naruto and Tsunade. How may I serve you, Hikaju-sama? I've taken up residence on the top floor of the tower. Your sister is there. Hinata wants to see you, go and pay her a visit. Hanabi sucked in a deep breath. Naruto could see her hands tremble just a bit. I I really would rather not. I phrased it as a request to be polite, it's not. There was a long pause. What am I supposed to say to her? Tell her that you're happy to see her, that you've missed her, and that she looks wonderful. Lie. You're a ninja, surely you can manage that. Hanabi lowered her eyes and gave a single dispirited nod. Hi, Hikaju-sama. As she left, Hanabi's shoulders were slumped and her feet dragged. The moment the door closed Tsunade sprang to her feet and rounded on Naruto. Congratulations. I didn't think it was possible, but you've succeeded in making them hate you even more than they already did, so what? It's not like I could have ever made them love me. You could have tried to make a real peace with them. You could have at least started to heal all the old wounds. You're the Medignan, Grandma, not me. Naruto rose to his feet. I don't fix things, I only destroy them. What? You think I can fix this her arms waved about. I had a great reputation once, now I'm just a traitor. No one is going to listen to me. The only reason things are as peaceful as they are is because everyone is terrified of you. The moment you leave there'll be trouble. What exactly do you expect me to do? Handle it, Naruto said without an ounce of sympathy. Remind people what I'll do if I have to come back here and put down a revolt. Ruling through terror isn't the best way, Naruto. Maybe not, but we use the tools we have. How are Dan and the Waki? The question caused Tsunade to pause. Need to remind me why I'm loyal to you, Brad. I was wondering how they're adjusting to being back in the village. They don't like it, all they ever do is talk about how things were before. All that matters to them is the past. They won't change, they can't change. I know, Naruto sounded forlorn. Tsunade rubbed her hands together. I'm not complaining about it. In spite of everything, I'm still grateful to you. It's just. Well. Tsunade struggled to explain it. It's like you're starving to death and all there is to eat is moldy bread. It's not what you want and the taste sickens you, but it's better than nothing. She gave an unhappy nod. That does sort of sum it up. Do your best. If things fall apart the village will just get what they deserve. Naruto left. Damn, but I need a drink. Naruto didn't return to his quarters until evening. Ever since he'd left the Kyubi's chakra always active he'd found he didn't need to sleep anymore. Naruto tried to work for as many hours a day as possible. He even welcomed the mundane tasks like paperwork, so long as it kept his mind busy. The quiet hours of the night and early morning were the worst for him. When there was nothing to work on, nothing to distract him, he was forced to remember and think about the choices he'd made. Sometimes, when things were really quiet, he would hear Kaiubi's voice, mocking him. Reminding him of his arrogance and his assumption that he would always figure a way out. Naruto had really believed that every problem could be smashed to bits if you only had a big enough hammer. He really had been an idiot. Life didn't work that way. Every choice you made had consequences, some you never even thought about. And if you did smash a problem into shards, those broken pieces had a nasty way of coming together again later to make a whole new problem. Even after all the things he'd done, all the crimes and deaths, Naruto still saw himself as the victim. Every horrible decision had an excuse he could point to. If the villagers hadn't hated him, if Iruka had been a good sensei, if the old man hadn't betrayed him, if he hadn't been forced to get rid of Orochimaru, if Danzo hadn't kept attacking him, if Yureya hadn't used the poison cloud, if Konoha had surrendered sooner, and on and on and on. Every decision he made had a justification, something he could point to. And look where all those choices had led him. He was Hokage and everyone acknowledged him. His power was absolute. Not one, but two ninja villages were his. He had all the money, power, and fame anyone could ever hope for. It was everything he'd dreamed of as a lonely orphan. It wasn't worth it, he thought. The price was too high. The door to his bedroom opened. How was your day, Naritakan? Are you coming to bed? Her scent was of ash and dust and of Taiya's rotting corpse. There was nothing there of the real her anymore. He didn't turn around right away. He was looking out at the Hokage monument where five faces stared back. The night he abandoned the village Naruto had destroyed Siratobi's. It had been rebuilt, not by Siratobi, but on Danzo's command after the old man was gone. Danzu claimed to have restored it to honor Siratobi's memory and out of respect for the position of Hokage. Naruto wondered if his face would ever go up on the cliff. It didn't matter much to him one way or the other. I don't sleep anymore. I haven't for a long while. Oh, that's right, I keep forgetting. My sister came to see me today. I can't believe how much she's grown. She seemed very nervous though, do you know why? Sighing Naruto finally turned around. Hinata was wearing white robes with the Hyuga clan symbol. She was smiling at him, and her lavender eyes were content. 
What Naruto focused on was the crack that ran from the corner of her left eye down to her chin. I have no idea, Hinata-chan. When Danzo become the fifth Hokage he'd had a single overriding priority, to kill Yuzumaki Naruto. Danzo considered Naruto not only the worst traitor, but the greatest threat the village had ever known. The fifth sent the best of the Black Ops to try and assassinate Naruto. Even the legendary Hata Kakashi had been given the mission. They all failed. Though it was a stain on his personal and the village's reputation Danzu turned to elite assassins of other villages. He even hired killers from the criminal organization Akatsuki. Danzo drained Kanoha's treasury on assassination attempt after assassination attempt. But no matter what effort the Hokage made, Naruto refused to die. Eventually, Danzu accepted that no assassin or group of assassins would be able to eliminate Naruto. So he decided a different strategy was called for. The Hokage turned to the greatest living seal master and asked him to create a weapon of such destructive power that no one could hope to survive it. A weapon of mass destruction that could succeed where all his previous efforts had failed. Ureya was not happy with the Hokage's idea. But was forced to admit that Naruto was much too dangerous to be allowed to live. The Toad Sage could not come up with a better solution and so ultimately agreed. And so the great Jiraiya had created the Poison Cloud, an ultimate that required the caster to sacrifice his life to use it. Jiraiya snuck into Odo and activated it. The village was smothered by a thick green fog, anyone who breathed it and felt their lungs begin to burn. They were soon sprawled out gasping and choking as their airways became inflamed and closed. Some of the Otanin managed to escape, but the civilians never had a chance. The attack killed more than 40,000 people, the vast majority being ordinary villagers. It was a criminal act worse than anything Orochimaru or Naruto had ever committed. Naruto had been caught in the attack and breathed in the poison like so many others. But the Kaiubi wouldn't let him die. Even as his throat burned the red chakra healed him and allowed him to survive. He hadn't been able to save anyone else. Hinata had died gasping for breath like so many others. I hope Jureya and Danzu are both burning in the deepest pit in hell right now, Naruto thought. When he'd first realized Hinata was interested in him Naruto had planned to use her. She was supposed to be just another tool. With time though he genuinely fell in love with her. She was the only purely good thing in his life. He couldn't bear to lose her and so had brought her back. At the beginning he pretended it was enough. She understood what had happened to her and accepted it. Hinata still loved him and could still use chakra. She was still always there at his side. Naruto tried to convince himself it was enough. But when he held her hand or kissed her, her flesh was always cold. Every breath was a reminder this wasn't really Hinata anymore. She didn't sleep, she didn't eat, and as time passed she tended to forget what she was. If he reminded her she would remember, but forget again in a day or so. Naruto had stopped reminding her, it only made her sad and didn't change anything. Are you hungry, Narutokin? I could make you something. No, it's alright. Are you sure? Yes. She paused and stood there. Most nights Hinata would spend her hours wandering the halls or staring out a window at the stars. Naruto usually avoided her during the night time. When he was alone with her during those hours his instinct was to kiss her or hold her hand. The feel of her cold, lifeless skin made him ache. Sometimes he thought of ending it and letting her go. In many ways that would be the kindest thing. But if he did he wouldn't be able to summon her back again. She really would be gone forever. Hinata began pressing her index fingers together and avoiding his gaze. Naritakan. There's something I want to ask you. What is it? Will we be staying in the village now? I love Odo, but this is home. Your Hokage and everyone acknowledges you. You fulfilled your dream. Can we settle down now? I'm still at war with Suna. A lot of the Leafnan have gone there as refugees. I have to deal with them. All right. Then after Sauna. Naruto rubbed his hands together and shifted his weight from one foot to another. After I destroy Suna I doubt the other cages will feel very secure. I expect I'll have to go to war with them eventually. Then after you beat all the other ninja villages. There are still samurai and daimyos. Then after them. Even if I conquer the elemental lands I'm sure there will still be revolts and people trying to kill me. There is always someone to fight. Hinata lifted her gaze to look at him. But we'll be able to settle down and start our family someday, won't we? I want to be a mother and I know you would be a wonderful father. No matter what people say, I know you have a kind heart. They breathe deep. Of course, Hinatachan. We'll find peace and have a family. But not right now. When the time is right we will absolutely have kids. You. You'll make a great mom. So, someday. Naruto nodded. Absolutely, but it won't be any time soon. Hinata smiled at him. That's fine, Narutokan. I'll wait. She paused, but Naruto didn't say anything. Do you want to come up to the roof with me and look at the stars? I'd love to, but I have a lot of work I need to take care of. All right then. Hinata gave him a pleasant wave and left. Naruto headed to his office. He was determined to read every single report and fill out every last form. And if that wasn't enough he would review personnel files until morning. 
When Sasuke finally returned to the Ichiha district the main gate was shut. The hinges had started to rust. There were faded signs posted all along the perimeter that read, this area off limits, by order of the Hokage. Sasuke supposed he shouldn't have been too surprised. Danzo always loved to play up the history and traditions of the village. It made sense he would choose to keep the Ichiha district intact, rather than allow people to buy up the property and actually live there. Danzo had never trusted his clan while it existed. Once the Ichiha were gone he'd apparently loved them. Sasu carried a stack of folders with him. Before coming here he'd stopped by Anbu headquarters and visited the records office. He headed back to the small apartment where he'd lived. There was no electricity, but he'd kept a supply of candles. He was soon seated at his kitchen table going through the files. What he found was depressing, though not really shocking. Even before Naruto's arrival the village had really gone to hell. So the report was true, Naruto brought you back. Welcome home Sasuke. Sasuke looked up, startled. Shikamaru was standing in the doorway, leaning against the frame. Being dead has screwed up my senses. You never would have been able to surprise me like that before. Shikamaru slid out a cigarette and lit it. Don't be so sure, I can materialize any place with a big enough shadow. It's a terrific technique for spying missions or assassinations. Sasuke leaned back in his chair. What are you here for? Come to assassinate me? That would be sort of a waste, since you're already dead. Anyway, you can't be killed, only sealed. We've had a lot of experience with Edo. I know, Sasuke waved at the folders in front of him. Those files are all marked top secret. It's okay, I have the Hokage's permission. Naruto's not Hokage. You want to tell him that. Shikamaru blew out a cloud of smoke. And just what sort of reading material do you have? Personnel files and mission reports. I wanted to see how many of my friends were still alive. But it looks like everyone except you and Sakura are dead. Sakura's probably dead too. She went to try and kill Naruto right before your return. Sasuke narrowed his eyes. He'd hoped to talk to her. It was sad to think Naruto was the last living member of Team 7. Your idea? No, hers. I told her not to bother, it would have been a better use of resources to try and gain his trust and spy on him. Naruto doesn't strike me as the trusting sort. He's not, but it still would have made a lot more sense than trying to kill him. If you didn't come to kill me, why are you here, Shikamaru? You know Naruto is looking for you. Yeah, now that the Hokage is dead I'm his number one priority. I try to see it as an honor, a really, really troublesome honor. Sasuke folded his hands in front of his face. What is it you want? I give you this. Shikamaru took a scroll from one of his jacket pouches and placed it on the table. Don't worry, it's not booby-trapped or anything. Sasuke snapped the wax seal under his thumb and unrolled it. He took a minute to read the kanji, then gave Shikamaru a sharp glare. How did you get this? The fifth acquired it, I never asked him where from. It was a tool to use against Naruto, for obvious reasons we couldn't deploy it. Until now. Sasuke let the scroll roll itself back up. You expect me to betray him. You can't betray someone who you don't owe any loyalty to. I am asking you to save this village, Sasuke. Fuck, I'm asking you to save the whole damn world. You're the only one who can now. You're the last chance we have. I'm not even sure this village is worth saving. I've read some of the mission logs. What Kanoha did in Rice Country was just as bad as what Naruto did in Fire, Shika blew out another puff of smoke. So what? We were at war. We did whatever we had to, to slow him down. We're ninja Sasuke, we are not nice people. If you read the mission reports from the Third Great Ninja War one doubt they'll be much different. I'm pretty sure no one ever slaughtered 40,000 people in one go during the last war. Only because they couldn't manage it. Us, Earth and Wind all wiped out enemy towns and farming communities. It wasn't because of intent, it was just a matter of scale. Do you want to know what I'm most sorry about when it comes to what happened in Odo? What? That we didn't kill 40,000 and one. You're not much of a salesman. Hey, do you think I'm proud of what we did to the civilians in Odo and other places? I'm not. I'm not here to tell you we're the good guys in all this. I've been hip deep in blood since it started. There are no good guys here, Sasuke. But Kano has still your home. Do you really want to see it destroyed? Naruto's already won, he's not going to destroy the village. He will unless we accept him as tyrant, and we won't. Most of the shinobi would sooner see the village burn than let Naruto turn us all into slaves. Maybe that's what the village deserves. Sasuke pulled one folder out of the stack. I know the truth about what happened during the Ichiha massacre. Itachi was ordered to betray the clan. Really? Don't pretend you don't know. I didn't. Why would I? I was a kid when that happened, remember? The same age as you. There was no reason why the Hokage would have told me about it later, I had no need to know. Why should I save this village when they destroyed my clan? Especially when there's not a single person I care about still living here. Shikamaru thought about it for a moment. Hmm, I guess from your point of view maybe there isn't. I mean if you're going to blame the village as a whole for the Ichiha massacre. But what about everyone else? 
How about the village of Suna? They ever do anything to you? Naruto's not making any secret he intends to wipe them out. He's not interested in letting them surrender. And do you think it'll stop even then? Naruto has made the whole world his enemy. How many more thousands, hell, millions will he kill? You want me to kill my best friend. He betrayed and killed you, not much of a friend. Technically, Orochimaru killed me, and you and Danzu betrayed me too. If you want to kill me for that, go right ahead. But the fact is even if you don't give a damn about Konoha anymore do you at least still care about the whole world. You're the only one who can save it. Sasuke glanced at the scroll. By turning traitor. You'd only be betraying one man. To the rest of the world you'd be a hero. Isn't that how you want the last Ichiha to be remembered? Sasuke gave him a stony glare. Shikamaru finished his cigarette and dropped it on the kitchen floor. He stamped it out beneath his heel. Well, in any case, think about it. But not for too long. Naruto plans to set out for Suna soon. Shikamaru stepped back into the darkened living room and melted into the darkness. It was almost noon when Sasuke returned. He had a paper bag with him as he entered the tower. The Otanen permitted him to go straight into the Hokage's office. Naruto was seated behind his desk going through personnel files. Naruto looked up. I was starting to wonder if you were coming back. I had a lot to think about. Here. Sasuke placed the bag on the desk. Hope you haven't eaten yet. Ichirakus. Wow, it's been a while. Duchi and AM are both still working there. I know, I checked on them as soon as the village was secure. I figured it was better if I did not actually talk to them though. Naruto took the food out and stared at it. What are you waiting for? I can hear you drooling. I'd have to take my mask off. So? I don't have an appetite for you to spoil. Naruto hesitated a bit longer, but finally took off his mask and dug in. Sasuke sat across from him and watched. Hey, Sasuke said. You remember training for the finals of the Chunin exams? Kakashi brought us out so we could do some hardcore training as a team. Naruto chuckled between slurping ramen. Sure I do. Those were probably the hardest training sessions I've ever had in my life. Kakashi sensei could actually be a real taskmaster when he wanted. I remember lying on the grass, looking up at the stars, being dog-tired. Just you, me, and Sakura. She said she was happy. Just being there as part of our team made her happy. Naruto gave a slow nod and swallowed what was in his mouth. I remember. Those were good times, all of us in Team 7 working together to reach our dreams. Tell me something, Naruto. At that time, before everything that happened at the finals, were you honestly happy? Yeah, I was. But even then I knew it couldn't last. I didn't have any plans to abandon the village, but I wanted to become Hokage and to make the people suffer. Why? Because of how I was treated all those years. Saratobi was the only one I really cared about. I wanted to make him proud, but I wanted to make everyone else pay. I see. Sasuke sat there quietly until Naruto finished his food. Naruto downed the last noodles with vigor. That was good. I forgot just how much I love Ichirakus. I know, I remember you told me once that if you were going to have a last meal, you'd want it to be Ichiraku's ramen. Naruto's red eyes met Sasuke's, which were also red. The two old friends looked at one another in silence. Your hookage now, Sasuke said. Isn't that enough for you? I always thought it would be, but it's not that simple. The stronger you are the more desperate people are to bring you down. There's always one more enemy to fight, one more battle. You could stop. Naruto shook his head. I know there's no end to it, but it's not in me to quit. Naruto sagged in his chair. I'm tired Sasuke, I'm sick of it. But I can't stand to let anyone beat me. Sasuke gave a single, solemn nod. I understand. With his Sharingan active Sasuke used the clan technique Shikamaru had provided him. He reached out and suppressed all of Kyuubi's chakra. The moment that happened Naruto pitched face forward into his desk, knocking over the files. His body had come to depend on the red chakra. When it was suddenly caught off all the strength left him. Naruto couldn't even lift his head. Sasuke stood over Naruto and took out a simple kunai. He stabbed his friend's neck. Naruto felt the sharp pain and tasted hot blood in his mouth, he struggled to breathe as his own blood drowned him. He wasn't afraid. He'd beaten them, he'd made them kneel. He'd won. He wondered if the old man would. In her quarters Hinata felt a sudden weakness. She looked down and saw her hands and arms begin to crack and crumble. She remembered. Hinata closed her eyes and smiled. She remembered a young boy with a huge smile and hoped wherever she went she would be with him and that they would finally know peace. Sasuke reached down and closed his friend's eyes. As his body began to crumble he waited to go back to the place he had been before. Goodbye. Three months later, Shikamaru was in the Hokage's office half buried in paperwork and smoking like a chimney. He was Hokage now in everything but the title. Shikamaru absolutely did not want to become the sixth Hokage, but he was forced to wield authority in order to avoid total chaos within Konoha. Leaf had won the war. With Naruto's death the Otanen had fled the village, knowing there was no chance they could hold it without the Otakage's power. 
Sasuke was a great hero and seen as the embodiment of the will of fire. There was a ten-foot-tall bronze statue of him next to the memorial. The traitors, like Tsunade, who had remained behind had been dealt with. The refugees from Suna had been welcomed home, and the leaf village had started to rebuild. It should have been the beginning of a new and prosperous era. But no sooner had Naruto's corpse gone cold than the trouble started. The cadet branch Hyuga had declared themselves a separate clan and had occupied the Achiha district. The main branch had tried to bring them back to the compound by force, resulting in bloodshed and casualties on both sides. Hanabi had come to a council meeting screaming that the village forced the cadet members back. There was no support among the rest of the village for that, and Shika personally found the idea repulsive. Hanabi had then declared that if he and the rest of Kanoha didn't help her restore her clan's rights, she would lead the main branch members to Iwa. There was no way Shikamaru could allow that. He found himself seriously considering the same sort of solution for the main branch that had been used on the Achehas. Meanwhile, the reconstruction of the city was going slowly. The treasury was empty and no one was lending. The village was forced to decline a great many missions in order to keep a large reserve of ninja available for immediate deployment. Half the leafmen had died fighting Naruto. Iwa had immediately made an alliance with Odo and begun some incursions along the border. They weren't in a state of war yet. But it was coming. Mist was going through a new round of purges. Lightning had declared war on Waterfall. Suna had terminated their alliance and begun snapping up many of the jobs Leaf had been forced to turn down. Many of the Leafmen who died had been their very best. Kanoha's fighting power was a lot less than it had been. If a full-scale war with Iwa and Odo started there was no guarantee they could win. The future was dark and there was no guarantee they would see the dawn. But we won, Shikamaru said out loud to the empty office. He lit another cigarette and got back to work. Thank you so much for watching this video. I do hope you enjoy it. If you want the next part of this video. Turn on that bell notification. Like subscribe and comment down below. And also check out the others videos. I have created and enjoyed it. See you guys next video. Till that, take care.